very good morning to all our esteemed presenters as well as the principal of Snob College, uh, Lingo, David, David, all my friends. I welcome you all to this uh, presentation. And um, today we have a very interesting panel where we'll have five paper presenters who will be presenting on different aspects of the India's journey at 75. Well, this entire seminar has been a very interesting one. Yesterday also I was there in the sessions. Very interesting to hear from each and every presenter. And so also we expect that today's session will be very interesting. Now, before we start, I would just uh, request all our uh, paper presenters to please kindly stick to the time of 10 minutes. And after that, we are going to have a deliberation round. Uh, we will start off the day with a very interesting presentation by uh, Chintamani Rao sir from Nehu. He is professor and the head of the Department of Law who is going to present a very interesting paper on celebrating India at 75 post-independent journey of Indian judiciary. Sir so, Rao, you can take over. Thank you, sir. Good morning to everybody present here in the uh, seminar that of uh, webinar celebration of India at 75. And uh, at the same time, also at the outset, I extend my heartfelt thanks to the organizer, Sinod Law, uh, Sinod College, uh, Silong, and the Arts and Culture Department of Government of Meghalaya. Uh, respected chairperson, sir, and my uh, fellow panelists, uh, those who are with me at this present time, and. Uh, I am here to present my paper that uh, celebrating India at 75 and the journey of Indian judiciary. Uh, sir, uh, when we are celebrating this Indian uh, celebration of uh, Independence Day of 75 years, we have made a long journey since 1947. But as I go by to David Sibley, the chairperson, uh, chairperson of UPC and yesterday is a keynote speaker, our journey has started a long back. And if we take it that 1857, the first war of independence, as he has told rightly, and I agree with him that we have started journey since independence that 1857 we first revolted against the British mighty rule. Then uh, uh, that uh, our constituent assembly also did a great job for um, bringing this uh, uh, celebration. And uh, uh, 1947 we started the independence, and now we have completed almost 74 years. And by next year, 2022, 15 August, we will celebrate our 75th uh, Independence Day. So, uh, in this journey period, uh, uh, we have seen all uh, ups and downs, and it is not a uh, rosy journey, and we have also difficulties in the meantime. But before I proceed to my paper, and I want to uh, 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 attribute my respect and homage to all the freedom fighters who have laid down their lives for the cause of our independence and they brought all these uh, freedom, liberty, fraternity, equality that which we are cherished now. So we should not forget the galaxy of the heroes or the freedom fighters like uh, Lala Lasparai, Balganga, the Dilak, Mahatma Gandhi, Subhas Bose, and so many and so forth. And it is the right time that we should remember them and we should cherish their goals which they have aspired for us and they have dreamed for us. And we are lucky enough to born in India and we all citizens will feel, will, uh, feel proud uh, to be a citizen of India. And it is our goal and objective that we should bring all happiness, prosperity to this country. And at the same time, it is not India who has uh, uh, gone through a political uh, mileage of getting administration or democracy. At the same time, when you have been asked by the Britishers uh, to uh, pass over the independence to us, and they apprehend at that point of time that uh, you are not mature to enough uh, to uh, administer such a big country. And uh, thanks to our uh, uh, freedom fighters as well as the, the members of the Constituent Assembly, how they drafted the Constitution so nicely, and it was, came into force on 26 January 1915. And since then, we have been cherishing it. And every 26 January, we are celebrating the also the public day. 
At the same time, also, as I remember that uh, the first in the War of Independence, 1857, uh, at the same time, also, we remember that the Suraj, we started celebrating 1930 in Lahore session, the Congress way. So in this way, we have been cherishing our independence, but uh, the most important thing that we have to complete the whole world and we have to stand before them and we have to prove that we are no less than that India, that is Bharat, we are the proud of this citizen. Then uh, we started our journey with the uh, uh, judiciary, with the executive, the legislatures and the, the four pillars who now we are calling in the media. So in that way, we started our journey and independence of the judiciary is also uh, no less than the contribution like the, the legislatures, the enacted laws, executive, they have implemented these, uh, the laws, program, policies. And then uh, to my point, as a student of law, I thought that I have to bring to the notice of the whole country that the judiciary has contributed immensely for giving the justice to the whole country. And what we have not support uh, in the time of a British rule, that we do not repeat. So that's why our constitution started with a, a slogan in the preamble, the mirror of the constitution, we the people of India, having solemnly to resolve the constitution in the sovereign, into the, uh, sovereign socialist democratic republic. And in that way, we have cherished that liberty, fraternity, equality, and justice. So this justice delivery system has given uh, to the judiciary and it is independent judiciary. Judiciary has started long back uh, with this Privy Council, the highest court of the land, and then it is a federal court. And after that, Government of India Act 1935, it has brought in the year 1937. 37 to 1950, we have the highest court of land that is the uh, federal court because India is a federal in form and military in spirit. In that way, we, uh, we respected the highest court of federal court. And federal court has also come to the expectation of giving justice, uh, equality, and uh, uh, liberty to the people. Even the British administration, they want to snatch away this. So that is a uh, commendable job that this uh, federal court has uh, uh, done. And after 26th January 1950, our judiciary gave birth in 28th January 1950. And the first Chief Justice Harilal, Justice Kenya, he took over along with the seven other judges. And we started with eight judges uh, from 1950. And now we have reached to uh, 34 judges in the Supreme Court, that is the highest court of land. And that is giving justice to the whole of the country. And we are all happy and uh, giving protection. So uh, in that way, the journey has started with the judiciary. Judiciary has taken a lot of responsibility and uh, uh, has discharged with all transparency and with all integrity that we have to face for it. And our uh, right to equality, as we have cherished, it was not there. We were all discriminated in the form of caste, color, creed, religion, and sex, and religion, and what not we. So, but thanks to the, our constitution fathers, and thanks to our um, the judiciary, who has uphold the rule of law of the country, and has protected our fundamental right, our constitutional right, and our legal rights in every manner, and we feel that we are free citizens of India. And the landmark judges that the Constitution, the Supreme Court has laid down that we, we have been indicted and we have been obliged since then because after the Constitution of India, even the government also has not uh, ready to uh, give that full scope for liberty which uh, we find in a, uh, that A.K. Uh, Gopalan case versus uh, State of Madras that uh, in the name of the Preventive Detention Act, Gopalan, a communist leader was uh, arrested and he was put to jail and every time he was in, uh, 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 followed by the police and thereby once he was arrested and he was put to jail and he went to the Supreme Court directly under Article 32 on the previous purpose that reached and he applied for the Supreme Court on the he was divided and chief uh, into one judges and the father only who was given the judgment and that uh, not agreeing with the uh, three judges that uh, they did not agree that Article 14, which gives equality, 19, which gives freedom, Article 22, which gives the protection of the arrest of the uh, persons, uh, arbitrary arrest, that they did not agree. But luckily, after 1950 years, 1978, when Menka Gandhi came, uh, case came, and fortunately, and uh, we overruled that case, and we gave a lot of scope to the Article 21, which gives the right to life and liberty uh, for our country, for people. 
and thereby the article 21 has expanded to large extent giving free air uh, at unpolluted air that environment right we have got we have got the right to life liberty including that uh, we should not be arrested arbitrarily we need to be arrested we have to put into the senior magistrate within uh, 24 hours and uh, we cannot be arrested with uh, this uh, put into the dinghy cells and so many uh, this uh, involvement has come to this article 21 and the right to work the right to education also has come which is directive principles then a ko palan case that champak of dorajan case was the most important where the supreme court did not agree of giving uh, that full scope for to implementation of the directive principles where all the 16 articles have been enumerated giving a scope to the indian government to make policies to further for the improvement and the standard of the life but that time the supreme court also unfortunately did not agree in champakam to rajan cases they upheld that a fundamental right is enforceable and the government the people can challenge under it but the directive principle is a policy matter and the government will do it whenever they feel that was the saddest part but unfortunately fortunately again it is started its journey out the long remarkable way and finally the supreme court also upheld that uh, article uh, you see article 45 which uh, once upon a time was uh, the there that uh, uh, the student or the child of age 6 to uh, uh, um, 14 so you have education but now it becomes a uh, matter of fundamental right we have added to article 21 here and in this way our journey was uh, very uh, bright book and finally you see the supreme court has given lot of landmark judges uh, judgments uh, particularly you see article 377 which was once upon a homosexuality was the offense in our country now they have uh, removed it is uh, not a victim uh, the, um, criminalization then article 497 which was talking about adultery and a woman was treated as a goose and possession now that has been removed and no more it is a criminal offense and in this way also the Sabramali, uh, Sabramati case was the very most important Sabrimala case in Kerala where the women were not allowed to enter into the temple and particularly the age of 10 to 50 and thanks to, uh, to all these judges they have agreed that age that, uh, yes, the women has not be discriminated on the, uh, the, 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 um, the point of uh, that uh, gender. So that achievement we have got also feel again we got the other uh, disputes so which was settled very amicably in the court uh, though not was possible in the uh, uh, this, uh, arbitration and conciliation way but uh, it was uh, finally was uh, resolved. So in this way our journey was very good and Indian judiciary has upheld our liberty and uh, we stand here to speak and transparency and thanks to the Indian judiciary whereby that RTI Act, Right to Information Act 2005 also, they have voluntarily agreed it. so they are also uh, accountable, they are also um, responsible and their uh, activities are to be tra uh, transformed and it should be transparent. So in this way, uh, in many ways, that the Indian judiciary has achieved a lot of uh, 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 things for us and we should be lifted at the same time, though it is in a federal in form of government, but it is not like in the Montesquieu theory of separation, completely it is watertight, but uh, both uh, organs, all the organs of the democracy, that is the judiciary, executive, legislature, they are working harmoniously. So that's why we feel pride that we will achieve a lot. And today also, despite a lot of uh, sir, uh, wonder, little uh, shortcomings are there also at the same time when we are celebrating the 75 year of our independence and it is here we have to introspect also and uh, some things we have to achieve also and uh, which we have not achieved we have to focus also this uh, people have uh, without a roof on their house and homeless people are there and unemployment is also there illiteracy is there malnutrition is there and a lot of health care is there now uh, we have been suffering so that has to be given more stress and importance that by we can be equal in the uh, uh, in the footage of uh, the equality with all the international countries though article 50 uh, uh, one says that uh, we are peace loving country and we have a harmonious yeah, relation sir. with other states of the country that we have been upending our foreign policy is a very good and we are never hostile to our uh, uh, this neighboring countries that we have 
uh, uh, operating uh, as a spirit of uh, brotherhood to all the uh, fellow countries of the uh, citizens of the fellow countries. At the same time, also yeah, India has achieved a lot. Once yeah. upon a time, India was depending yeah. upon the food yeah. from the yeah. other countries. Now we are self-reliant. At the same time, we are also supplying food to other countries. And thanks to our scientists at this moment yeah. also, yeah. and yeah. these uh, this warriors, yeah. doctors yeah. also, but we they saved the, our lives of the people. And thanks to the scientists and medical scientists, particularly, they have invented two, three uh, vaccines earlier in case of a plague, in case of a cholera, in case of a smallpox. We have taken years together to bring a vaccine or, or some sort of a, uh, uh, preventive measures. But this is, in this one year time, in the span of one year time, Sir, you have vaccine, ten minutes. and like the America, the Russia, or other uh, developed countries of the world, and we are no less than uh, any, any other country in any other aspects. Economically, we are self-sufficient and food, we are self-sufficient. Education, we have achieved also a lot. Of, uh, when we got independence that time, our uh, uh, Indian university, hardly 20,000, uh, 20 universities we have got. Now we have 100 universities. Literacy has gone to 72%. So in this way, we can uh, cherish our independence. And finally, yeah, uh, uh, my time Robert. that I have to uh, submit, but my yes, presentation will be end up by a prayer uh, uh, to the, uh, the Almighty to share uh, his love and affection and shower all the love to the Indian country and we will feel proud and we will continue our journey. And thanks to the organizers once again and the Sinatra uh, College who has given this opportunity to me. From my core of heart, I extend my thanks to them. Thank you. Sir. Thanks, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I kindly request everyone? Uh, the next few presenters, please stick to the time. Uh, well, it was a very interesting presentation by Professor Chintamani Rao on the journey of the judiciary till the 75th year of independence. We can have more discussions about it in our uh, next session. But for the timing, we may invite Ms. Bamedabet Nowlight, who is Assistant Professor, Department of Political Science in Sunat College. Bame, if you can hear me. Yes, yes. Okay. Okay, that's very important because in this technical world we have to follow certain you know, rules. Fine, thank you. I think everyone has muted it right now. So, Bame, you can take over. Uh, all right. Uh, ca can you hear me, sir? Yes, yes, you are. You are. Okay. Uh, a very good morning to the esteemed chairperson, uh, the principal, vice principal, uh, the members of the organizing committee of the seminar, the other paper presenters, as well as uh, everybody else present here. My name is Bermuda Patnila Nonglan, and the name of my paper is. Um, and please don't mind, I've made a few changes. The name of my paper is The Contributions of Gandhi Vis-a-Vis -vis Directive Principles. Uh, I, I hope that uh, the esteemed chairperson can allow me to present uh, PPT. Yes, yes. Please. Can I do that? Yes, yes, please, please. Please. All right, so before we uh, get down to business as it is, um, I would just like to say a few words that um, the preamble of the Indian Constitution, right? Now, it has uh, put out many, uh, has laid down many uh, uh, functions as well as roles that the state is supposed to embody and is supposed to perform. But I would just like to point out that the preamble clearly says that justice, liberty, equality, and fraternity to all citizens of the country are the most important objectives of independent, uh, independent India. And I feel like that it, is within this line of logic that the directive principles was included in part four of the Indian constitution. Now, as we look into, uh, I've uh, looked into a brief history of the directive principles of state policy. Now, as early as 1935, there was mention. Uh, now, B.R. Ambedkar, when he was defending the draft constitution on 5th November 1948, he said that we, what are called directive principles is merely another name for the instrument of instruction. Now, the instrument of instructions was given by the Government of India Act. It was a supplementary document um, attached along with the Government of India Act of 
1935. And uh, the instruments of instructions were given to, <clears throat> excuse me, the instruments of instruction was given to uh, the governor general as well as, um, uh, was given to the governor general as well as the governors of British India with the implementation of this particular act. Uh, if you read in the full paper, there is uh, much more uh, details given. And also in 1946 with the uh, SAPRU report, we have found that uh, the SAPRU report has also talked about the division of the fundamental rights into justiciable and non-justiciable rights, and also to provide a suitable machinery for the, for the enforcement of these rights. Then another uh, uh, significant phenomena was that Sir Bian Rao had also talked about uh, these uh, about justiciable as well as non-justiciable rights. Um, he had published a paper as early as 1946, but uh, sadly I could not find it. And uh, um, I finally got it in uh, a book edited by BN, uh, by uh, Sir Rao. And um, he had already talked about the distinction between two broad classes of rights. Now, Serbian, uh, why I'm talking about Serbian Rao is because he was the constitutional advisor to the Constituent Assembly, and he was a very instrumental figure in drafting the Constitution and um, uh, uh, with the help of B.R. Ambedkar, they had uh, presented the, this draft constitution to the Constituent Assembly and it was accepted. Um, so therefore, uh, when we talk about the directive principles, uh, I felt that uh, because uh, also that one of the uh, goals of this particular seminar is that we should focus on the achievements or at least the contributions of some of the uh, uh, the achievements that the Indian constitution, that the Indian polity has so far um, been able to achieve. So I felt that talking about the directive principles in this manner would, uh, would fall in line with the goals of the seminar. Um, so there has the constitution of India has not classified the principles as such, but for the sake of convenience, many, many uh, documents, many books has shown that we have uh, divided the constitutional, uh, the directive principles into three broad, broad areas. One is the socialist directive principles, the liberal directive principles, as well as the Gandhian principles. Now, I would like to talk more about excuse me, about the Gandhian principles. So in drafting the constitution uh, and including part four, some of the directive principles of state policy resonated with the ideals and with the philosophy of, of Gandhi. Now, Gandhi, uh, as we all know, had uh, was very famous for his ideals of ahimsa, non-violence, satyagraha, trusteeship, secularism, fraternity, etc. Uh, fraternity, etc. And all of these um, basic, all of these ideals that Gandhi had talked about really attracted people to join the national movement and also to join in his cause. Um, so uh, when we look at the different articles, uh, articles 40, 43, 46, 47, and 48 are considered by most as Gandhian principles of state policy. Now, since uh, there are many articles, I have focused only on article 40 as well as article 46. Now, with article 40, uh, article 40 basically talks about village panchayats and it talks about um, uh, local self-government. Now, with the, uh, there have been many, uh, uh, sorry, uh, we had uh, the government of India in 1952 had implemented the community development schemes, but because of uh, there were certain problems in the initial years, eventually by 1992, the Parliament of India had um, enacted and passed the 73rd Constitutional Amendment Act, which gave necessary powers and functions to the panchayati system to effectively function as institutions of grassroots democracy. Now, the aim of this act is to bring about accountability, transparency, transparency as well as all round development at uh, the village level and also the goal of this particular act was to effectuate democracy using a bottom up approach at the grassroots levels of administration now when we look into the workings of the panchayati raj there were four areas four key areas in which uh, i have uh, stressed here which is panchayati raj and women empowerment uh, in a document given by Antiwari, she said that in terms of the empowerment at the grassroots of women panchayati 
Bharati Raj institutions is the greatest experiment in democracy ever undertaken anywhere in the world or at any time in history. So we have come a long way since the implementation of the Panchayati Raj institutions and uh, because the Panchayati Raj institutions as well as the 73rd uh, Amendment Act had also provided um, reservation of seats for women, what has uh, the, the the statistics say today that um, uh, many people and especially women have taken uh, ha have joined the Panchayati Raj institutions and so therefore this is a step forward for women empowerment in India. Then another uh, key area is the influence and the also the relationship between Panchayati Raj institutions and education. So there is the linking of various governmental schemes like the Inti uh, Integrated Child Development Services Scheme as well as the Sarba Shiksha Aviyan to village administration via the Pachayati Raj for effective implementation. The, there's also the uh, relationship between the uh, PRIs as well as the rural health sector. And so for the effective implementation of the National Health Mission, the ASHA, who is the accredited social health activist, is selected by the Gram Sabha. The Gram Sabha is at the village level. It's the third, uh, the, 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 the first tier in the uh, Pachayati Raj institutions and uh, so therefore the uh, the asha along with the gram sabha promote immunization deliver first contact health care and provide information on health nutrition hygiene as well as create awareness on such issues furthermore the village health sanitation and nutrition committee vhsnc also acts as a subcommittee of the gram panchayat another key area where we find the influence as also the relationship, uh, you know, the key working relationship is the Panchayati Raj institutions and rural employment. The Panchayati Raj institutions at all level, village, uh, intermediate, district, you are given. Two minutes. Pardon, sir? You have two minutes. You have two minutes. Uh, okay. Uh, so. Um, Now, uh, with the implementation of the uh, directive principles, uh, also we have seen uh, the key areas or key amendments being made uh, with Article 46, the welfare of the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes. There have been many uh, commissions set up. There have been uh, like the National uh, Commission for the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes, which came out uh, because of the amendment of the 89 Constitutional Amendment Act. There have been uh, other constitutional provisions for the welfare of the scheduled cars and the scheduled tribes but most importantly now we still need to make progress regarding the welfare and also the uh, the safeguarding the interests of the scheduled cars and the scheduled tribes uh, essentially now through the years the state has always made conscious efforts to realize the various provisions embedded in this particular article uh, in part four sorry of the constitution and the judiciary has also cited some of these provisions in which uh, dr chintamani raut has also stressed um, just now but the hope is that as we traverse through time and that we make history we would achieve more tangible results and achievements with regard to the directive principles of state policy um, and more more than ever uh, we need to anchor our ideals to the to the philosophy of Gandhi because his teachings has effectuates uh, you know uh, he has envisioned India as a nation that preaches and embraces peace secularism and democracy uh, with just these few words thank you very much thank you Bame. thank you Bame. and uh, thank you for sticking to the time also uh, we may now call on the next presenter of the day, uh, that is Mr. Mangalaisan Kharlukhi, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Political Science, St. Andrews College, Extension Campus, Kundihati. He's going to take up a very interesting topic, which many people don't dare to touch. It's about the review on India's reservation policy after 75 years of independence. Uh, Mangalaisan? Yes. So you can take over, Mr. Mangalaisan. Okay, uh, Mr. Chairperson, sir, um, who is who has also been my guide, my teacher, my mentor for the last ten years now, I'm both humbled and honoured. And greetings to all my uh, fellow paper presenters and everyone who are present here. Now, when we talk about the reservation policy in India, uh, we tend to think that it was introduced after independence. But actually, it dates back to the 19th century when William Hunter and Jyoti Rao Kule in 1882, they originally conceived the idea of a caste-based reservation system. And 
the reservation system that exists today is in its true sense was introduced in 1933 when British Prime Minister uh, Ramsay MacDonald presented the communal award. Now the award made provision for separate electorates for Muslims, Sikhs, uh, Indian Christians, Anglo-Indians, Europeans, and the Dalits. After long negotiations, Gandhi and Ambedkar signed the Pune Pact. Now I'm, I'm just going very briefly without going much into discussion uh, because of time constraint. Now, when, when Gandhi and Ambedkar signed the Pune Pact, uh, it was decided that there would be a single Hindu electorate with certain reservations in it. And after independence, Initially, reservations were provided only for SCs and STs. OBCs were included in the ambit of reservation in 1991 on the recommendations of the, uh, of the Mondal Commission. Now, before I proceed ahead, please allow me to share a very short story from the life of uh, B.R. Ambedkar, the father of the Indian constitution himself, before I build my case. Now, when B.R. Ambedkar was nine years old, his father who worked in Gargaon asked him to come visit him during the summer holidays. Now, together with his elder brother and another relative, Ambedkar boarded a train from Satara. The boys had gotten new uh, English-style tailored shirts. Uh, they wore silk-bordered dhotis, shiny new caps, and this was their first real journey, and they were very thrilled. Now, when they reached their destination, though, no one had arrived to receive them. His father had not received the letter with their date of arrival. The station master, who had mistaken them to be boys of an upper caste, initially due to their new clothes, perhaps turned them down, turned them out of the waiting room after learning that they were belonging to a lower caste. Or they tried to hire a bullet cart, but no one agreed to take them along. Finally, one of the bullet cart owners agreed to give them a ride, but he refused to sit. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> he refused to sit in the cart and chose to walk beside it. Now, sitting with the Dalits, he believed that it would pollute him. It was a long and it was a long ride, and no one would give them water on the way. So finally, they reached Gorgaon the next morning, and the experiences during this journey left Ambedkar totally jolted. Now remember, this happened in 1901. Today, after more than a whole century later, the same reality still continues in rural India. Uh, perhaps not to the same extent, but this idea that another human being's touch could pollute you exists even today. So, despite this appalling situation in our society, we often hear about the need to do away with reservations. Now, I hope that I can do justice to my paper to present it in a very unbiased and impartial manner. I understand where that is coming from. In a country like India, Whatever laws you make, particularly those concerned with having certain privileges, they are bound to be misused. And that is a fact. But in the case of reservation for the lower castes or the Dalits, we have to weigh between the use and the misuse. To underestimate the problem of reservation uh, has to be reviewed very carefully. This community for a millennia has been discriminated against. If we do not bring them up with some privileges so that they can reach the same level as the rest of us someday, it would be unfair. Those who underestimate the enormity of this problem should expose themselves to the rural society and see how horribly discriminatory it can get. Now, Dalits cannot enter your house from the main door. They cannot drink tea in the local tea shop 
Dalit children cannot sit with non-Dalits. And I'm not just talking about the Hindu community. Even those who have converted to Christianity or to Muslims also, even in their crematoriums, in the cemeteries, they have uh, separate places to bury those uh, belong to a lower caste and separate places to bury for the higher caste, even in other faiths and denominations also. So just because somebody is getting a reservation and some others think it is not fair because they do not get into a college or a course, it does not nullify this huge problem we face as a society. We need to understand that such issues arise because for whatever infrastructure or education or facilities we try to create, we have too large population. But after 75 years of independence, it is time to review. Considering the level of development that the, the different castes in this country are at today, I strongly feel that they still need reservation. Not for all, but perhaps this is a good time to review our reservation policy. Now, in a democracy, everything revolves around an election that has to be won. So nobody dares to talk about change, whether positive or negative, especially if it is anything that concerns a particular community, because it then becomes a volatile election, winning or uh, winning or losing an election is all about winning or election losing matter. But we should not delay this process further. Now, uh, if I may say that a distinction could be made between urban Dalits and rural Dalits. Now, I teach in Bindihati uh, and I stay in Kleriat, which is the headquarter of East Gent Hills District. Just a distance of 90 kilometers away from Shillong, the mindset of the people in rural, the rural parts of Megala is so different from the uh, mindset of the tribal people living in Shillong itself. So the distinction could be made between these rural population and urban population because the maximum discrimination and disadvantages happens in rural India. Rural Dalits must be given far more advantage than those who are already living in urban societies. Perhaps the first generation to get out of that social pit that has unfortunately been dug for them must be given reservation. For the second generation, it must drop down a little bit. And by the third generation, they should be able to get out of it. So two generations who have come out of it should voluntarily share a reservation with those who have not come out of it. And this can only uh, come... Mania, sir, you just have one minute. Okay, sir. So, uh, I would say that we should stop looking at people at this community or this caste or this religion because all of us in India have only one vote. That means, by law, we are all equal. This equality has to manifest itself socially. That was Ambedkar's vision for the nation and for the world as well. He champions social democracy, not merely political democracy. If you have one vote, I have one vote, that means both of us are at equal at the same level. Uh, and unfortunately, although Dalits in our country have equal rights by law, they are yet to achieve it socially. This generation of people must make it happen at least because the very idea of India as a republic will fail if we do not fix this. And I would conclude with this line. A nation that invests in prejudice, that manifests in oppression of its own citizenry, cannot be a successful democracy. With those words, thank you very much. Well, that has been a very wonderful take on your part. Uh, We'll have some more discussions about your paper, but in the meantime, we will move on to our next presenter, that is Miss Yashashwi Agarwal. Agarwal, she is a fourth semester student of political science from Scottish Church College in Calcutta, and her paper is going to be a very broad based paper. It says the evolution of Indian political system from 1947 to 2021. Miss Agarwal, if you are then please kindly stick to your time limit yes. of 10 minutes. Sure, sir, sure. You can take it. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, 
So I will be presenting my paper on evolution of Indian political system from 1947 to 2021. So at 75 today, India has come a long way from the country the British exited in 1947 and which they believed would not survive its in its then form. India has since evolved into a vibrant constitutional democracy and made rapid strides in several domains, although a lot of work is still left to be done. Now, the contemporary party system in India developed originally in the context of the struggle for freedom and since 1950 within the framework of parliamentary government. The post-independence political system has been through five major phases to reach the sixth phase, uh, phase which is the present-day political situation of the country. And uh, in the discussion of Indian politics, political parties and party system, well, it is extremely significant. Uh, both are extremely significant significant and Indian politics cannot be understood without comprehending the major trends of the Indian political system. So therefore the dynamics of the party system follow certain trends which in case of India can be divided into five phases and after that we come to the current phase. So the first phase began in 1947 and it lasted till 1967 and it was the era of the Congress system. Now this term the Congress system was coined by late Indian political scientist Rajini Kothari and by this term, we understand a political system characterized by dominance of one political party and coexisting with competition, but without a trace of any alteration. So it means that from 1947 to 1967, the Congress party ruled at the center as well as the states, and it had no opposition which could challenge its power or electoral base. So Rajini Kothari described Congress as the party of consensus and the opposition as the party of pressure. During this time, Congress played a vital role in shaping the nation. And since the 1950s, the rise of leftist political parties created a new era of competition. As a matter of course, the parties which emerged in this period of Congress dominance were basically influenced by Marxism, Socialism, Gandhism, Liberalism and Communism. So therefore, the rise of communist parties became a very significant development in this period. But uh, it is still important to mention that uh, during this time, the Congress was successful in creating a period of dominant party system or a hegemony of its own. Now we come to the second phase, which is uh, 1967 to 1977, which was the rise of oppositional parties. Now the era of 1967 to 1977 was extremely significant in the political history of India, as the Congress dominance was now challenged by the rise of oppositional parties in 1967. Uh, the Congress party had lost its power in eight states and this had not only shaken the dominance of Congress but had also led to the rise of federalization of Indian political system in which the center and the state governments were different in terms of ideas and ideologies and their political affiliations. Another important development during this period was the rise of the institutionalization of the Congress party which was marked by the uh, conflict of leadership between the syndicate and Indira Gandhi. And this also had an impact on political uh, party politics of India at that point, the point of time. So uh, after that, we move on to the next phase, which was 1977 to 1979, which was the era of Janta government. Now, the rise of Janta government created a new history in Indian politics because uh, though the government did not sustain its power due to conflicting interests and crisis in leadership, but even then, this was extremely important because for the first time, a non-Congress government came to power at the center, consequently challenging the Congress hegemony. Though this was not a very conscious choice by the people, but it was a blow to the Congress hegemony and it basically showed that India was capable of having a successful or diverse party system in itself. So after that, coming to the next phase was 1980 to 1989, which was the era of bargaining politics. So in 1980s, the Congress again returned to power, but by this time, the political landscape of the country had totally transformed. It was marked by two important features. The Indian voters became more aggressive and vocal, and also the decay of Indian political institutions. Now, these two developments could not create another era of Congress system for the Congress party. Rather, since 1980s, Congress was returned to power, but it was a political party without any dominance or hegemony. The fourth phase of the party system witnessed the rise of the state and regional parties as well as the rise of militant nationalism. In this phase, the center-state relations became very problematic and the Congress party was not at all in a state to handle these multiple conflicting interests. So it would be more appropriate to mention that the era of Rajiv Gandhi had witnessed the era of bargaining and negotiation. And in this phase, the politics of India entered a multi-party system which allowed free competition and challenged the notion of Congress system. Uh, so after that, uh, we come to the fifth phase, which is 1989 to 1999, which is the beginning of the era of coalition politics. If the 1980s was a decade that witnessed the breakdown of Indian National Congress, both at the center and the state, the 1990s was a decade which initiated a new type of party system in India. 
This transition from Congress system to region-based multi-party system was related to three major developments which started taking place uh, in the 1980s itself. Now, the first one was the parties like BJP and the left started reformulating their ideological formulations. And especially the rise of BJP was very significant due to these ideological commitments for Hindu Rashtra and Hindutva. The second one was was another important uh, was the rise of regional and state parties based on caste, community, religion, and ethnic ethnicity issues. And the third development was the fall of socialism and secularism, and the decay of Congress Party had further led to the institution institutionalization of Indian political institutions. Now these developments created a very peculiar time for Indian politics and uh, party system because the question of social justice, secularism, and economic development was replaced by the question of caste, communalism and community issues. Therefore, these developments created the space for coalition politics in India. In 1989, Congress's vote share came down to 40% from almost 50% in 1984. So this time also witnessed various types of corruption and scandals involving our political leadership and also witnessed short-lived coalition governments where it highlighted a steady growth of BJP since 1990s. And therefore, this particular phase highlighted the politicization of the support base of these political parties. As might be expected, the rise of left front and the regional state and uh, state parties like Asom Gana Parishad, uh, Samajwadi Party, PDP, Bahujan Samaj Party, etc. also changed the landscape of Indian political party system. So the main trend within this time, uh, which was uh, for Indian party system, was the rise of weak, indecisive and short-lived leadership, which continuously fought with crisis through unstable uh, coalition governments. And another important trend was the shift from a hegemony to a competitive multi-party system at the national level. It was further facilitated uh, by the process of federalization of Indian party system, especially the elections of 1996 and 1998, showed that yet another important trend within in this time was the emergence of a distinct state party system separate from the national party system. So all these developments highlighted the background for coalition politics in India. And we finally come to the current phase, which is 1999 onwards. Uh, so this phase symbolizes a very interesting trend in Indian party system called structural transformation of India's party system to region-based multi-party system. However, in a bimodal party system, uh, regional parties are there, but they are not as competitive as they are in regional party system. Uh, so, therefore, it can be argued that after 1999, our party system has competition and rise of regional parties. And therefore, another important trend since 1999 is the increasing competitiveness of Indian politics and the fragmentation of Indian party system. So, this particular period has led to politics of instability and disorder to some extent. The era of 1999 was very significant because it highlighted the rise of Adil Bihari Vajpayee led NDI alliance, which was one of the biggest coalition governments in Indian politics. And after that, we have also seen that the... Ah, yes, yes, and... yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm just concluding. Yeah. So after that, we have also seen that UPA and this alliance has created a new era of politics and highlights that alliance building became a part of coalition politics. And the rise of NDA has displayed a steady growth in BJP's vote share, while the rise of UPA has, has actually highlighted changing strategies and negotiations in Indian politics. So as you can see, five phases under these Indian party system followed by the current phase. The first phase was described as one party dominant system. One the dominant party system. The second was primarily characterized by deinstitutionalization of Congress, followed by uh, an erosion of dominant party system with consequent crystallization of anti-Congress forces, and which was then followed by the end of Congress dominance at the center. And for the first time, Indian politics witnessed the emergence of a short-lived two-party system. Now, the fourth phase was a period of transition where a return of Congress was dead, but without hegemony. And finally, we saw the rise in region-based multi-party system leading to gradual federalization of the party system. So the Current phase, however, highlights the rise of coalition, but also highlights the new trend of electoral alliances with state parties. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Shishmi. That was indeed a beautiful presentation on the growth of Indian politics over the last several decades. Well, uh, we'll have some more discussion with you, and at the moment, we'd like to move on to our next paper presenter, that is Ms. I. Mond, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Hindi in Sanat College. Is going to present the paper on Sarah Vallabhai Patel, the freedom fighter. Thank you, sir, and good uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, I'm sorry because I have to switch off my uh, camera because my network is not good. So no, my presentation is on the uh, my pre presentation is on the topic of Sardar Vallabhai Patel, freedom fighter. So, Vallabhai Patel was born at his maternal uncle's house, Desai Vego, in Nathiyat, in 
They were Patidar Gujja community of Gujarat. This actual date of birth was never officially recorded. Patil has entered 31st October 1875 as his date of birth on his matriculation examination papers. Now directly, if we talk about his work and contribution for India freedom, Balabhai Patil during his 3 years of public life from 1917 to 1950 served the nation in various fields. Even in some of the field, his contribution was so great that his name will also remain written in golden letters for thousand years of India history. Lord Mountbatten said, Wallabhai Patel marked his name in world history and made India capable of solving her problems. Sardar Patel's contribution had been unique and priceless in the struggle for India independence led by Mahatma Gandhi. During the course of freedom movement, the Saira Satyagraha protests against Rawlat Act, non cooperation movement, Flat Satyagraha at Nagpur, Bardoli Satyagraha, where some historical movement where Sardar Patel not only remained active, but he played non worthy role in them. Write the Kaira Satyagraha of 1918, still quite India movement 1942. He led about the one dozen non violent struggle directly or played a key role in them. Kaira movement was an important event in the public life of Wallabhai Patel. We can also consider it a fine stone in his life. The reason behind it is that in this movement, the capability he showed as the first lieutenant of Mahatma Gandhi, and they had he played the mode of action even surprised Mahatma Gandhi. Therefore, at the end of the movement, Mahatma Gandhi said, if we were not for Wallabhai Patel's assistance, I must admit that this campaign would not have been carried through so successfully. Wallabhai Patel was the deputy commander of Kaira Satyagraha. Mahatma Gandhi had him, himself selected him for this job, and this was not so ordinary thing. The Satyagraha continued for a little more than three months, although there was a partial success achieved through it. Wallabhai Patel's contribution was more important for the final result. On the 6th of April 1919, an unprecedented strike was held in many cities, including Ahmedabad, on the call of Mahatma Gandhi against Rawlat Act. In compliance with Mahatma Gandhi calls, Wallabhai Patel published Satyagraha Patrika. He also made an arrangement to sell Mahatma Gandhi banned books, Hind Swaraj, and Sarvodaya in public places. Later, after the cruel and the inhuman incident of Jalayawala Bagh on the 13th of April 1919, Wallabhai Patel was shocked at the incident of Ambedkar. He openly and strongly criticized the British government and its policies. Not only this, but during the critical situation in the city Ahmedabad, he worked for the restoration of law and order. The non-cooperation movement of uh, the non-cooperation movement of 1920 was a first step the directly of struggle against injustice and cruelty. The civil disobedience movement of 1930 was the second and the quiet India movement of 1942 was the third and final step. Due to these historical movements, the common masses of India were awakened to such a state that everyone understood the worth and need of independence. As a result, it became difficult for the British to continue their rule in India. Therefore, they were forced to declare independence on the 15th of August 1947. The manner in which the common man come forward to participate in the Indian national movement was unique and the role played by Sadar Wallabhai Patel and his contribution in awakening the masses cannot be assessed merely in few words. Wallabhai Patel played important role to achieve the three objectives fixed on the eve of starting the non-cooperation movement. Collection of 10 million rupees for Tilak Swaraj Fund, enroll, enrolling 10 million members for the Congress Party, and the national wide use of 2 million spin, uh, spinning roll, wheels. He alone collected 1.5 million rupees for the Gujarat and Kathiawad region as contribution to the Tilak Swaraj Fund. Under his leadership, activists went from village to village and in well planned manner. Recruited 300 
thousand members for the Congress party and sim uh, similarly managed to use of a hundred thousand spinning wheels. During the second phase of the movement in October 1920, when the proposal for the establishment of Gujarat Vidya Peed was put forward, Vallabhai Patel was the first one to work for them. He undertook the task of collecting money for its established during the period 1920 to 1950. Vallabhai Patel raised the institute with all efforts on the call of Mahatma Gandhi for the boycott of import goods and clothes on the first death anniversary of Bar Gangadhar Tilak, the whole of Gujarat, like other towns and villages, participate wholeheartedly. A big pile of import goods was burned in Ahmedabad. Although Vallabhai Patel had already given up his law practice in 1919, still asked to participate in above said event, he burned his gown, 12 of his suit and tie, 200 collars and about 10 pairs of shoes. It seemed as if on his call the whole Gujarat was motivated with Gandhi, Gandhian thought. Now he stopped staying at any private house and wherever he found a um, compassionate uh, environment wherever he found good companions engaged in the national task, he stayed there like a recluse. Sadar Vallabhai Patil was the leader of Nagpur's flag struggle. Under the leadership, the Satyagraha continued till 18 August 1923. During its course, 1,748 Satyagrahis, including Acharya Vinoba Bahawe, were sent to jail. One of the activists died during the period of custody, but at, at the last, the, move, the movement was successful in achieving its objective. The Indians were granted permission to carry their flag freely on roads and at the public, public places. In fact, Vallabhai Patel had organized the movement oh, in a well planned manner. Yes, sir? You have two minutes more. Okay, sir. Then the Bardoli Kisan agitation proved to be the best example of, of the practice of Gandhian principle in non violence. This Satyagraha was unique. Vallabhai Patel had divided all villages of the Tulaka of Bardoli in 14 Satyagraha centers. On every center, one or more than one person was appointed as supervisor of the chief organizer of the Satyagraha. The supervisor were made responsible to set the mode of action according to the situation along with them. Vallabhai Patel himself used to go from village to village to inspire people and to infuse zeal in them. He especially inspired the wife of farmer to be bold and courageous. He inspired work like magic on them and this woman like Kunwar Bhai, uh, Kurwan Bhan, Ichha Bhan, Moti Bhan come forward and prove to be great women warriors. The Bardoli Satyagraha was a unique example of unity. Sadal Vallabhai Patel life was fully devoted, simple and, left, uh, and selfless. Throughout the world, he will be called as the maker of new India, but all Indians will always remember him as a great commander of freedom struggle. For the conclusion, if our political leader can follow his footsteps, there might be a big change in our country so that our country can become more successful in every area. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, thank you, Ms. Mon, for that presentation. Now, when we um, come to the end of the paper presenters um, who have presented on different topics, um, well, uh, it was a beautiful session with uh, Professor Chintamani Raut, starting off with the discussion on the judiciary and the importance of the independence of the judiciary and how certain landmark cases played a very important role in the growth of the Indian state as a whole. But uh, Chintamani Raut sir, would have been more uh, benefited if you could have brought out uh, something more about the executive and the judicial relation because there has been a major debate about the relationship between the executive and the judiciary in India over the last 75 years. Um, the next paper presenter was a uh, paper presenter was Ms. Bahadabit. Bahadabit was uh, good. You were really pinpoint with certain things, but I would have been more happy if you could have 
For example, you started off with Gandhi and dietary principles of state policy, and then you went on to, you know, Panchayati Raj specifically, and the role of women. I think that itself would have been a very interesting debate. Panchayati Raj and the role of women at the moment, you know, that would have been more focused. But yes, of course, this is just a paper and development. You can still work on that. Um, yes, sir. Uh, Manyas and Kalushi, I think your paper was very utopian indeed because this debate on reservation has always been very interesting. Bami, can you just, yeah, this debate on reservation has been always very interesting and what you say, the trickle-down effect has not really taken place. You were very right in pointing out that there is a huge division between urban India and rural India when it comes to reservation. And there needs to be more awareness in urban, in the rural part of the country towards the issues of reservation. However, uh, the idea of re-looking into reservation, it is not a very easy topic, yes might be taken up, it might be discussed, but these things are not very easy when we look at it from a political economic point of view. Uh, Yashika Agrawal was very beautiful. I think your paper was very nice when you talk about the entire role of the Indian state in terms of its political system. You divided it into the five phases and towards the end you spoke about the present discussion it was very interesting. I think um, this is the beauty of seminars such as this where, you know, experience and youth come together and it's very interesting to know what the young generation also feels about it and it was a very beautifully drafted paper. But I feel you could have worked also a little more on the present political discourse, which I think you might be working on your paper. And last, Miss uh, Mondo's you know, these historical figures are very important. Sarah Vadapai Patel is one of the persons who is considered to be the architect of modern India. But again, if we look at from a political science point of view, today there is a huge debate as to how the present political dispensation is trying to uh, usurp the entire idea of Vallabhai Patel into its political ideology. You know, the making of this huge uh, Sardar Vallabhai statue by the present political dispensation. You know, how, how there is the politics of usurpation is going on. But however, it was a beautiful paper. Now, um, I would like to open the house for discussion. If anyone has any question uh, for any of the paper presenters, you are most welcome. Is, is there anyone who wants to ask any other question or any question? Because very rarely we have around, uh, we still have around 20, 23, uh, you know, people in the meeting, which is a very rare case when we have it offline. So anyone who wants to ask anything? Okay, I believe I believe uh, there are no questions to the paper presenters. However, um, I would just like to request all of the paper presenters. Sir, out there was nothing in your paper. You have been our teacher also. Uh, to my friends, other friends, you can all improve with your paper. Sir, out. Would you like to say something? Nothing. If you permit, actually, I have a query regarding that. Uh, Reservation. Uh, yes. So, the long back, we have made a three layer policy. So, actually, that is also not helping in case of for that school class junction right? So, uh, what you have suggested that uh, because that will be very difficult if you will go by division of rural and uh, this urban. So, people are migrating from rural to urban. So, no urban is in particular uh, connotation you can define. And that will be very difficult on the part of the judiciary to segregate the people uh, on the basis of uh, his living. Only on the basis of uh, the living standard. So that one aspect we have still generation. That first generation, second generation, which they have already happened. Now, this is subsidy we have left out. So since that has to be told to those community 
of the digital cast, those are already availed this first generation, second generation, they should be excluded uh, from the reservation policy. Uh, that way, I think, I may not uh, disagree 100%, it is his research and he has made it, but uh, to some extent I can add to, so if a uh, criminal uh, can be adopted in case of uh, OBC, so in that way, so that criminal in the terms of a generation, what is suggested, I accept it. Anyway, uh, uh, think about it. This is my suggestion and submission. What is the question? Thank you. And uh, regarding to my paper, you told, and the uh, last line I told, but I could not about more that uh, separating executive or uh, in a uh, relation between executive or legislature. But I told they want this to separation of two is not that watertight compartment, which can be rightly applied to the Indian democracy. So there is a harmonious relation between them. Little confrontation there, but still then, the judiciary has uh, uh, the operates and always in a way of hope for, hope for the people of the country. Uh, still then, uh, your suggestion is to welcome and I will enjoy. Exactly, exactly. You know, so what I meant to say because judiciary is considered as a custodian of the entire country and what is happening at the present political dispensation, if you see Ranjan Gogori, who is the former Chief Justice, has been made the member of Rajya Sabha. Now, these are precedents which needs to be kept apart. You know, a, a judicial person of that stature being given a political appointment, you know, here comes this idea of relationship between executive and judiciary. This is what I wanted to, to bring into picture. But in any case, sir, that is, uh, that is, you are, you are an expert on that, sir. I would just like to make an observation regarding my paper. Uh, so, Dheeraj, thank you so much for your suggestions, and um, hopefully I can expand more uh, on this particular area. And uh, one more thing I would just like to say is that though we have, um, you know, there are many... Um, there are many things yet to be achieved, right? Like with the Panchayati Raj institutions, we've seen problems with the devolution of functions and powers by the state governments to the Panchayati Raj institutions, as well as the lack of funds. Uh, nevertheless, what we have seen today is that 75 years down the line, um, the actual dream of Mahatma Gandhi to have um, independence and so-called independence in the at the village level and also to have uh, you know for the for the villages to experience democracy now this has become a true thing and regarding the welfare and the interests of the uh, scheduled cars and the scheduled tribes now mahatma gandhi had talked so much about socialism uh, that his um, you know his view on socialism was that it is you know there's no one too high no one too low in society that everyone is equal and so as we've seen uh, um, as we've, uh, you know, uh, in the makings of history, we've seen that the society and also the state are consciously making more productive efforts towards realizing this, um, you know, towards making India a more egalitarian society. We've seen um, the protection, uh, the protection of the scheduled castes and the scheduled tribes in various forms. But I cannot deny also that there are still many, uh, there are still many areas which in which we can also make further advancements. Now, in evidence, we've seen there are still caste based honor killings. We are we are still seeing caste discrimination. We're still seeing, uh, you know, forceful land grabbing um, of the tribal lands. Um, there is also the threat now posed to tribal identity and so on and so forth. But what I would like to make a point here is that uh, when it comes to directive principles, now the directive principles are like a blueprint for, you know, for making public policies. And so what we're seeing is the state has made conscious efforts. It has tried to bring uh, many of the directive principles into, uh, you know, it real, realizing thank these directive thank principles. You, thank, you. thank you, thank you. Thank you. We got you. Uh, Niraj, I think uh, we'll have to wind up because yeah, the yeah, next I session agree. is at eleven fifteen. Okay. 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 I think I think I think that has been a very uh, beautiful session. I must say, and we have had a nice paper presentations from different uh, presenters, right from as I told, um, from very experienced person to very beautiful students who are part of this entire session. I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Sonoff College so, uh, you know, and uh, all my uh, respected principals, sir, David, 
And I also saw Ma'am Lamon Sian, who was uh, just there, I think she left, who has been my teacher in St. Edmund's College. Uh, thank you to each and every one of you for making this session a very successful one. And uh, I hope that, uh, you know, during these pandemic times, as Sir David Siembe yesterday very rightly said, that lives and, ac lives and academics must go on. So these are very important uh, manner and ways through which we can continue our academic productivity. And I'll thank each and every paper presenter. Very good work. Mahesh and Bame, everyone was wonderful. But just improve your paper. Thank you very much. And uh, I think we may leave now because there is a next uh, session which is about to start. Thank you to all. Okay, thank day. you. Thank you. So, um, very good morning to every one of you here. And uh, I thank uh, Synod College for organizing this webinar on uh, celebrating uh, India at 75 in collaboration with the Department of uh, Urban Culture. So, uh, uh, we are very grateful that uh, uh, through even in this situation during this pandemic, but still we've been able to connect to one another and uh, share our experiences and our, uh, your expertise in various fields. Uh, I hope that through this webinar, uh, everyone will be benefited. So as you all know, the organizers have, uh, uh, have uh, uh, I think, have informed you and they have uh, given the time limit. Every one of you, we're having 10 minutes, okay? So uh, these are the, uh, the regulations that they have set in. They say that uh, every one of us, uh, we're going to start, we have uh, five paper presenters and uh, each one of us will stick to our time. Uh, we will start with uh, yeah, Ms. Ibanta Tiuso. Uh, she's an assistant professor from the Department of uh, Agriculture, Northeastern Hill University. And uh, the topic that she will, the title of the paper is Design and Innovation in Independent India. Then we have Dr. Dira Bomik, uh, associate professor uh, and head of the Department of English, Shillong College. And the topic title of the paper is India at 75, a vision for the future. And followed by Ms. Baya Dalinti Christine Lano. Uh, she's here, Baya Dalinti Christine Lano, uh, from the Department of Political Science, Sora Government College. And uh, the title of her paper is India's Advancements at the Handloom Sector. We also have um, uh, Alando. Uh, Raplang, okay, Lando Raplang from the Department of Computer Science, uh, uh, Com Department of Computer Science, uh, Synod College, and Lando's uh, paper will be on IT, I IT technology and its impact on economy. And then we have uh, Dr. Lalita Agarwal, Associate Professor, Department of Philosophy, uh, Gokhale Memorial Schools, uh, a girls' college, Kolkata. And her title of the paper is on revival of spirituality, uh, revival of true India and the global platform. So welcome all of you, my uh, paper presenters and all my dear colleagues uh, in today's uh, webinar, uh, which is organized by uh, Synod College in collaboration with the Department of Art and Culture. So uh, I know every one of you uh, will be taking your turn, uh, and but you have to stick to 10 minutes. Uh, three minutes before your time, I will be giving you a warning, okay? A warning uh, bell where, uh, uh, where I will give you a warning uh, and that you have to summarize your paper and, uh, and conclude it uh, so that we will not uh, uh, go beyond the time because the organizers have, to, uh, because your organizers have the uh, have uh, instructed that uh, there is, have informed us that there is another session at uh, 12, at 11, straight away. So we have to stick to our time. So now I call upon our first uh, paper presenters, uh, Ms. Uh, Ibanta uh, Tiuso, Assistant Professor, uh, Department of Architecture, Northeastern Hill University. So uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ms. Ibanta Tiuso, uh, please introduce yourself and we will start with your paper. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, my name is uh, Ibinta Bakmenti So uh, I'm presenting from, uh, I'm from the Department of Architecture, uh, Nehu. So today, uh, 
I mean, I would first of all like to uh, thank Sonat College for this uh, opportunity and for organizing this webinar in such an important theme. Um, okay, then, uh, what? so I would like to discuss uh, on my paper, I will dis discuss on the design and innovation in India. So I will uh, briefly, okay, let me just go to my, I'll just share my screen here. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. So, <clears throat> so uh, my topic name is on the design and innovation in India. I will briefly discuss an overview of the progress that design and innovation has had since the past 75 years of India's independence. And it will look at strides uh, that design education has made and the contributions that uh, design and innovation has had towards uh, nation building. So uh, first of all, I'd like to just have like a brief uh, definition of what does design uh, mean? So uh, design innately uh, contributes to nation building and its broad form and it's in its broad form has contributed significantly to our history, culture, economy, and the impact on the environment. A well-executed design can shape human thought and interaction, improve our way of life, give rise to endless possibilities, overall development, economic growth, and could be the answer to complex and real world problems. So uh, next, I would like to just highlight um, the in a timeline uh, format, uh, the landmarks of design education in India. So here you can see that, uh, you know, it's in two, um, in two sec uh, sections. There is the pre-independence and the post-independence. <laughs> So looking at the pre-independence, which is from the 1840s to 1922, uh, the British during their rule in India employed traditional artists in and around Madras to produce furniture, metalwork, and curios to be sent to the royal palaces of their queen. This led to the formation of the Government College of Fine Arts Chennai, initially known as Madras School of Art. Um, it was founded in 1850 as the oldest art school. A number of art schools in the country also came up around the same time with Sir J.J. School of Arts, Mumbai in 1857. The Government College of Art and Craft, Kolkata, established in 1854. The Kala Bhavana as part of the Viswa Bharati University founded by Rabindranath Tagore in 1919 and various other art schools all over the country. Some of these schools, in addition to academic programs in fine art, later included courses in architecture, pottery, tile making, metal crafts, etc. Now coming to uh, post-independence 1958 onwards, there was definitely a lot more, uh, lot more strides in uh, design education and, and development. So it was only after in the post-independence that the Indian government understood that the, to catch up with the West, it had to develop, build and plan cohesively from the bottom up. Among major uh, thrusts in various fields, the potential of design and its execution was realized and encouraged. So the government of India to the small industries, and that would resist <coughs> the present rapid deterioration in design and quality of consumer goods. So on invitation from the government of India and sponsorship of the Ford Foundation, Charles Ames, an American industrial designer, and his wife and colleague Ray Ames toured throughout India to explore the problems of design and make recommendations for the training program. So the India report prepared by the Ames in 58 emerged as a result of their study and discussions. It stipulated the underlying spirit needed to promote a suitable national design outlook and advocated the setting up of indige indigenous design legacy that involves applications of modern disciplines and old traditions to meet the challenges of contemporary India. So following the report, the government set up uh, national, the National Institute of Design in 61. 
as an autonomous National Institute for Research, Service and Training in Industrial Design and Visual Communication. NIDs are recognized by the Government of India as a scientific and industrial design research organization. They are accorded the Institute of National Importance by Act of Parliament under the National Institute of Design Act 2014. In 69, the Industrial Design Center, IIT Bombay, was established and offered multiple courses in design between 82 to 85 under the UN, uh, UNDP uh, IDC invited design educators from the UN school in Germany, from USA, Italy, and others. They spent months interacting, teaching, and doing design projects. And the faculty at IDC travel internationally, interacting with the other educators and practitioners. So these interactions and experiences led to a very strong methodology-based, user-centric, and uh, con uh, context-oriented design philosophy at the school that the industry was able to appreciate. So the model of education at IDC IIT Bombay was successful and adopted by the other IITs and the IISC in Bangalore. So in 18, uh, 1987, the Ministry of Textiles set up the uh, National Institute of Fashion Technology in Delhi. The school started programs in fashion, accessories and lifestyle products catering to the needs of the fashion industry in India. In the 90s, NIFT expanded further and opened uh, other centers to other parts of the country, Ahmedabad, Chennai, Mumbai, Bengaluru, and uh, Hyderabad, Kanpur. And we also want, have one uh, in Shillong, which was established in 2008. Uh, in 97, the newly formed uh, IIT in Gohati, with the support of IDC, IIT Bombay, introduced a full fledged uh, Department of Design. So in 98, the Ministry of Crafts initiated the Craft Institute of India at Jaipur with assistance from NID uh, Ahmedabad, the institute offers program in craft and design. So with the economic liberalization in the 80, in 90s, the opening up of the Indian economy and market reforms, it saw the setting up of private design schools in India and offered more courses in various design disciplines. So the Pearl Academy also was established in 93 and it's located in Mumbai and Jaipur. So the academy is extremely popular and has been considered the best design institute by Associum, which is the Associated Chambers of Commerce and in Industry in India. Uh, Symbiosis Institute of Design in Pune was also set up in 2002 to promote the ethical and creative learning of the candidate. The three institutes offer specialization of four different fields, communi uh, communication design, industrial design, fashion design, and fashion communication. Besides these various other private schools all over the country were also established. And next we come to the rise of the design and innovation industry. Trying to understand this, look at this uh, chart here, which is from the, about the economy of India, showing the steady uh, rise of different industries. So the GDP of the country, as we know, is driven by three major factors, uh, sectors, uh, agriculture, industry, and services. So design and innovation is intricately uh, woven in the service and industry sectors. The service sector under which design falls in has seen a steady rise every decade. At present, the service sector is at 59% of the total GDP. The opening up of markets after 91 also made it possible for making the economy more market and service oriented and expanding the role of private and foreign investments. So uh, talking about different fields in design, uh, looking at the pie chart here, the maximum uh, concentration of designers is in the field of architecture and interior design. But the obvious reason here is because architecture is a domain of study and practice has been well entrenched for a long time. And uh, the whole human uh, center, uh, computer interaction, which is a rising field now, uh, seem higher because of the migration of graphic and industrial designers to this field. So now uh, these fields are also merging now. Uh, and the other design domains are coming up as fast and soon the numbers will increase considerably in these domains. Uh, paving the way forward, uh, looking forward, there was, um, you know, before there was the only a small fraction of the uh, of the design kaleidoscope, which was pursued by the and encouraged by the British in pre-independent India. Fine arts was where it started, and towards the late 20th century, architecture was also introduced. 
However, it was only post-independent India that the possibilities of design was pursued and the opening of design schools by the government started in the 1960s. Post-economic liberalization in the 90s saw a paradigm shift in the, ex in the exponential growth in the nation's GDP. The services sector became a major contributing force towards the nation's GDP and has been one uh, which is growing since. With the growth with this growth, many opportunities, new jobs, new requirements, and unheard of expertise and designations followed. Private parties also jumped in to fill this void, to pro provide the necessary training and skilled manpower, um, and open their own design schools all over the country. The Make in um, India. Ms. Ibanta, uh, Ms. Ibanta yes, you have just two up. minutes. Two minutes left. Okay. Yeah. Yes, ma'am. Just wrapping up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Make in India initiative also launched by the government of India in 2014 as part of the wider set of nation building initiatives also, will also transform India into a global design and manufacturing hub. So the world uh, right now is still reeling under the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and this will redefine the future. Since then, it has touched upon all aspects of our lives from the way we live to the how we work and even how we interact. Every major life-changing event is also a major opportunity in thinking out of the box and coming up with creative workable solutions. Design and innovations uh, are here to stay and with a sustained focus can propel this country and make the dream by 2025 a $5 trillion economy and an economic powerhouse. I will end here uh, with this quote by Steve Jobs, which says, design is not just what it looks like or feels like design is how it works thank you thank you miss uh, ibanta tiso uh, we will have the discussion i think we will first present all of us then to, we will have the discussion if time permits and we will see towards the end okay so we so that so that we won't waste any time i will call upon uh, dr dira bomik uh, the head uh, department of english uh, shillong college to present her paper okay dira uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, respected chairperson. I'm Dr. Dhira Vomik, and uh, my paper is titled India at 75, A Vision for the Future. And I'm going to read out my paper. One of the world's major civilizations with a civilizational history that is at least 8,000 years old, a country of over a billion people, India shall celebrate its 75th year of independence on 15th of August 2021 at 75. India is still a young country. But we need to reflect on our successes and failures while India turned 75. India in 1947 was a poor third world country, a nation partitioned with large scale human tragedy. In spite of the colonial exploitation and subjugation, it made its twist with destiny. Its problems were many. And those were accentuated by wars in Kashmir and the borders, including one with China in 1962, and multiplied by natural periodic calamities such as um, floods, epidemics, cyclones, famine, etc. What strengthened India's will to fight and survive was the will of the people, reflected in adult franchise and parliamentary democracy. India remained committed to civilizational values in a practicing constitutional democracy. During the last 74 years of a vibrant and functional democracy, India has come out of the horrors of the past with self-will and commitment. It has successfully fought the battles on poverty, infant mortality, while developing a vibrant educational system and has made strides in terms of economic development. A World Bank report on poverty in India, released in April 2020 notes, and I quote, since the 2000s, India has made remarkable progress in reducing absolute poverty. Between financial year 2012 and 2015, poverty declined from 21.6 to an estimated 13.4% at the international poverty line, continuing the historical trend of robust reduction in poverty. Aided by robust economic growth, more than 90 million people escaped extreme poverty and improved their living standards during this period. World Bank poverty and equity. India continued to be on a growth path economically. The direct implication of ensuring rapid growth with inclusiveness is that policy making will have to be rooted in Indian ground realities while emphasizing the welfare of all in both policy design and implementation. 
The government's development strategy has helped achieve broad-based economic growth to ensure balanced development across all regions and states and sectors. This implies embracing new technologies, fostering innovation and upskilling. There is focus on the necessary modernization of our agriculture and mainstreaming of regions such as Northeast, hilly states and the 115 aspirational districts. The direct outcome of this has improved regional and interpersonal equity and elimination of dualism that has so far characterized our economy. An economy is put in place that is predominantly formal, rule-driven and facilitates investment and innovation. This strategy certainly will bridge the gap between public and private sector performance. The Prime Minister has focused on putting in a development state in place of a soft state that this government had inherited. In this context, the government has focused on the efficient delivery of public services, rooting out corruption and black economy, formalizing the economy and expanding the tax base, improving the ease of doing business, nursing the stressed commercial banking sector back to a healthy state, and stopping leakages through direct benefit transfers and widespread use of the jam trinity. The strategy for New India at 75 captures key message from the Prime Minister that that development must become a mass movement in which every Indian recognizes her role and also experiences the tangible benefits accruing to her in the form of shared collective effort and resolve that will ensure that we achieve a new India by 2021, just like independence was achieved within five years of Mahatma Gandhi giving his call of Quit India in 1942. However, recasting old developmental models has its problems and things need to be looked afresh and that's what the government has been doing. And this has to be uh, done, not only at the level of policy formulation, but also at the level of design and implementation. The present government has succeeded to a large extent in implementing government policies, trying to make India strong and having its rightful position among nations of the world. For achieving the goal of a strong India, there are four dynamic pursuits. First, having a holistic vision of development at the intersectoral level, pursuing world standards in all sectors, whether infrastructure, education, healthcare, innovation, industrial production, social welfare, etc. Secondly, converting development programs as people's movements such as Swachh Bharat, Atmanirbhar Bharat, Skill India, Digital India, etc. In making, of course, in making citizens' participation more robust, in attempting at that. Thirdly, following a dynamic foreign policy to ensure larger welfare of the world, joining on missions such as solar alliance, climate change, universal vaccination, etc. Fourthly, having India secured, secure its borders from any threat without compromise and being proud of its defense forces. These issues are constant and dynamic, but these need upgrading our policies and their implementation from time to time. 2020-21 has been a challenging year on many fronts. Chinese aggression on Eastern Ladakh, COVID-19 pandemic, loss of livelihood, deaths, and unremitted suffering. And also, it has been a time to acknowledge the talent in terms of innovations in medical equipment, drugs, and vaccines. The crisis has also tested our mettle in fighting the pandemic on many fronts, of which we are yet to be free. The pandemic and Chinese hostility have their challenges as they provide also, they provide opportunities for India India to engage with the world in a more positive and productive way. However, our achievement so far puts us in a better position to deal with the crisis and look beyond. India has made tremendous progress in the field of trade and commerce and has become the fifth largest economy. In addition, we have made spectacular progress in the fields of space research, IT, telecommunications, rail, road and port infrastructure, pharmaceuticals, ease in doing business, agriculture, etc. The country also has to fight many evils like caste, ethnic hatred, religious bigotry, linguistic rivalries, uh, separatist violence, terrorism, gender discrimination, etc. However, India's problems can be solved with Indian solutions only having faith in our social values and cultural learning. The present government has focused mostly on having Indian solutions to Indian problems as the Prime Minister has focused on Atmanirbhar Bharat, Made in India, and put in efforts to make India the innovation hub of the world through promoting startup and stand-up India. 
These missions are yielding predictable results and the future looks positive. By achieving the vision of making India strong, a new education policy has been announced. The main objective is to make India a hub in the, um, in the global supply chain, thereby ensuring prosperity of the country and the world. This is where we need to take a pause and think of India in a post-COVID multipolar world order. India has never been a country that is opportunistic and aggressively self-advancing. Our culture teaches us to be non-aggressive, non-interfering, and also we are ever ready to serve. The twin concepts of Vasudeva Kutumbakam and Sarvajan Hitaya Sarvajan Sukhaya still guide our foreign and domestic policies. India will carry forward after the COVID crisis the motto that a culture that believes in sacrifice and inclusiveness believes in a human free of exploitation, free from exploitation, violence in any form, and the welfare of all humanity shall prevail. No one can take away India's historical legacy written by its people in ensuring its position not as a superpower, but as a responsible world power committed to humane values and welfare of all, all humanity beyond statistics, indices, and world rankings. And this is how, how I would like to sum up. The inherent cultural characteristics of India as articulated by the Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 1900, I mean in uh, 2080, sorry, that the gems of Indian wisdom such as Vasudeva Kutumbakam with its underlying philosophy of oneness continues to be relevant and effective in the conflict with the world. The present situation has proven that our destinies are linked together. This Vedic dictum in Maha Upanishad, uh, chapter 4, lines 71 to 75, declares that it is only the small-minded who discriminate between the kin and stranger, while for the magnanimous, the entire world is a family. The eternal religion, or Sanatana Dharma, teaches us to hold together and sustain. Dharma's approximate meaning is, and I, and I quote, and it's natural law, and those principles of reality that are inherent in the very nature of the universe. The future for India at 75 unfolds on the strength of the principles of Sanatan Dharma, that means, and I quote, the natural, the ancient, and the eternal way, unquote. In following this principle, India certainly will work for a peaceable, healthy, and meaningful future. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dira Bhomik. Uh, we will have the discussions uh, when all the uh, if we have time, we will look into it. So I now call upon the, uh, Mr. Alando uh, Raplang, Raplang, Assistant Professor, Department of uh, Computer Application at Synod College. Uh, the title of his paper is Evolution of Information Technology, Its Impact on the Indian Economy After Independence. Okay, sir, you can start presenting your paper. Okay, ma'am, uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Rapla. Yes. Okay. Uh, a very good morning to our chairperson, uh, fellow presenters and uh, participants. Uh, the paper I'll be presenting to, uh, today is on uh, evolution of information technology, uh, its impact on uh, the Indian economy after independence. Uh, these are uh, my contents, uh, which I'll be discussing. So let me begin. Uh, information technology uh, is a knowledge-based industry uh, which embraces production, manipulation, storage, and dissemination of information. Uh, this sector has remarkably, uh, a remarkable potential for accelerating uh, economic growth of the nation. It has a potential to improve uh, the productivity of almost all sectors of economic development. Uh, this sector has made uh, our governance very efficient and its role in en enhancing the economic development of the country has been uh, acknowledged by the government of India. These are the different phases uh, are discussing uh, 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 on the evolution of the uh, IT uh, sector in India. Uh, before the 1980, uh, the Indian IT sector didn't exist up till uh, in 1960s. The sector was started with uh, hardware products and it was uh, government controlled through high tar uh, tariff rates and licensing. 
after the realization of the Indian government on the potential of foreign exchange earnings uh, through software sector. In 1972, it formulated a new software export scheme by importing hardware and exporting software in which TCS uh, was the first beneficiary in 1974. And in 1970s, in the mid of 1970s, the first software services and products were exported. In this period of 1980 and 1990, a new computer uh, policy was announced in 1984, aiming at promoting the uh, manufacture of computer base on latest technology at price comparable to international levels. Uh, seeing the software exports were very discouraging, the Indian government uh, to develop and liberalize the IT sector announced the 1986 policy on computer software export, software development and training. According to this policy, the imports of hardware were delicensed and were also made duty free. 1990 to 2000 here, this period has observed an intensified competition in the IT sector. During this stage, there were uh, some substantial changes in the Indian economy, including relaxation in the entry barriers, trade liberalization, opening up of Indian economy for foreign investments. And due to the liberalization, a flow of foreign investment came to India and multinational companies uh, in, in India also were introduced. This period is a rapid growth of the IT industry. Uh, the Y2K buck, dot-com crash and the recession in the US economy has forced many US firms to, to utilize the service of Indian firms. This has uh, resulted in placing the Indian IT industry on global map and software companies were earning good amount of foreign exchange. The IT Act uh, passed in uh, 2000 uh, gave a boost to the e-commerce and in 2005 uh, special economic zones were also passed. The result was an increase in number of software companies by the next 10, year, uh, 10 years, Indian com uh, companies place themselves as multinational companies and have emerged as leading players in the international arena. In this period, a strong growth in demand for export from new verticals, uh, rapidly growing urban infrastructure that has fostered several IT centers in the country and highly qualified talent pool of technical graduates. India became the world's largest sourcing and a preferred destination for IT and ITES. 2019, uh, India ranked uh, third among the global startup due to various government measures and ease of doing business in India. In February 2019, the government of India released a national policy on software products uh, to develop India as a software product nation. And India jumped four places to rank at 48 position uh, at the 2020 edition of the Global Innovation Index, GII. Uh, coming to the impact on the Indian economy, uh, if you look here, this is a graph showing that the Indian IT industry has achieved a phenomenal growth uh, post-economic reform period and has grown manif manifold during the period of 19, uh, 1992, 1992 and 1920. The industry has contributed significantly to the economy in terms of GDP, foreign uh, investment and employment. The total revenue generated by the IT and BPM industry in India as over 191 billion US dollars in 2020. Currently, the sector contributes around 6.7% uh, to the country's uh, GDP. Foreign, uh, in terms of foreign investment, many foreign investors are investing in India software industry, which also contributes uh, to the growth of Indian economy. They are mainly in the form of foreign investments uh, the FDI, number one, there are a number of multinational companies in India that uh, invest directly in their business in India. Example, uh, Google, Accenture, uh, Microsoft, Apple, is all, uh, Microsoft and Apple is planning also to manufacture its product in India. These companies get the benefit of employing a very, at a very reasonable salaries. FII, FII. Uh, the Foreign Institutional Investment, FPI, uh, for, Foreign Portfolio Investments. The, uh, in this, the Indian economy is growing fast and has attracted attention of foreign investors as a promising market of, for investment. Many countries like US, Malaysia, Singapore, China, and Dubai have invested in Indian stocks that include the IT sector.
India has been placed third rank among the countries that are considered to be the most attractive investment destination for technology transactions as per the report of the EY Global uh, Capital Confidence Barometer. Uh, when it comes to uh, Indian, uh, uh, its impact on employment, uh, we do, if we look here in this uh, table here, uh, in the year 2001-2002, the total employment uh, from the uh, IT sector is half a million. It grows up to uh, 3.96 uh, million uh, in 2017-18, which is estimated as per the uh, source of NASCOM. In addition to being one of the largest provider of create and creator of organized industry segment, this sector also plays a key important role in enabling higher levels of indirect employment. Uh, in terms of women employment in the IT sector and ITES sector, 34% uh, of women are employed, out of which out of 39.68 lakhs employee uh, in the fiscal year of 17-18. Uh, in the terms of growth and export, if you look here, uh, this sector has transformed India finances and effectively financed a large scale of imports. The export revenue of the Indian information technology stood 136 billion US, US dollars in the fiscal year 2019. In terms of uh, the market size uh, growing here, uh, the, uh, the IT and BPM industry revenue was estimated at uh, around 191 uh, US dollars in the fiscal year of 2020 at a 7.7% growth year on year. Sir Alan, you have just uh, one minute, okay? Just sum up. Okay. Uh, this is my conclusion. Uh, the realization of the Indian IT sector 30 years ago, and introduction on MMN of different policies by the Indian government and in subsequent years, paved ways for an impressive growth to the sector. With a significant contribution to the nation's GDP, the industry has grown manifold. The competitiveness with global players and improved global economy, the Indian IT uh, industry has to move to digital transformation in order to compete. It also has to instill confidence to users and investors need by investing and adhering in future technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT, IOT, and others. The 10.81% increased job in the sector and the IT BPM uh, sector expected to grow 350 billion US dollars by 2025 has proven that the Indian IT industry is a success. But in order to survive in the future challenges like neglecting in the area of R&D, electronic hardware manufacturing, saturation of selected cities and neglecting of other areas, low IT services and highly dependent on markets in the US and Europe accounting approximately 90% of the total IT and ITS export has to be addressed. So with this, uh, I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Alando. I know there will be many questions, uh, especially in during this uh, uh, sit uh, pandemic situations, but I hope uh, we will be, uh, we'll just move on with the next paper and we will see if their time permits and there will be any queries and any uh, uh, suggestions on what we have to share. But now I call the next um, paper presenter, that is Ms. Uh, uh, Baya Dalinti uh, Christine Lanong, uh, Political Science Department, Sora Government College, uh, Sora. And her paper is the title of her paper is India's Advancement at the Handloom Sector. Okay, you take on, Ms. Baya. Uh, good morning, madam. Good morning, uh, fellow participants. My, I'm Baya Dalinti Lanong. I'll be speaking on India's advancement at the handloom sector. Uh, I'll be reading, I'll be just giving you the crux course for 10 minutes. I won't be able, able to cover the entire paper. So I'll first start with the historical background. The Swadeshi movement launched at Calcutta Town Hall on the 7th August 1905 as a protest against the British government decision to partition Bengal as well as to revive local made good has continued to inspire present India. It is no coincidence that the national National Handloom Day is celebrated on 7 August since 2015, commemorating the 100th anniversary of the Swadeshi movement. The importance of this sector, it can be attributed to the fact that it's the second largest income generating activity after agriculture in rural India. It is estimated that 31.45 lakhs household in India 
are involved both directly and indirectly in the sector. Handloom are the major source of livelihood for tribal communities with more than 50 percent of India's total weaver population resides in the country's eastern and northeastern region. Moreover, the handloom sector contribution to women empowerment with over 23 lakhs female weavers and allied workers are engaged in the sector. And almost every state of India has a unique handloom product to offer such as Jaguar from Uttar Pradesh, Chandeli from Madhya Pradesh, Kulkar from Punjab, Northeast India is also blessed with different types of natural fibers like cotton, tussar, airy silk, and an array of handloom goods. The government of India stood committed towards the handloom sector since the attainment of independence. The All India Handloom Board was reconstituted in 1952. The Central Cottage Industry Corporation of India Limited was established in 1952. The Khadi and other Handloom Industries Development Act was passed in 1953, and the All India Handloom Fabric Marketing Cooperative Society was set up in 1955. To further boost the sector, the Handloom and Handicraft Export Corporation of India Limited was set up in 1958. The Handloom Reservation of Production Article Act 1985 was passed the National Handloom Development Corporation was set up in 1983. However, despite the government of India taking robust initiative pro problems like shortage of raw materials, lack of technology, and failure to provide incentives to the artisan has hampered the growth of the sector. Problems like patent and designing, advertisement, and competition from the power loom has only weakened the handloom sector. The noble aim of directing the country and its citizen to the path of independence and self-reliance is only possible when the grassroots are involved in the growth of the country. Thus, the handloom sector received a major fillip with the Atma Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan or Self-Reliant India campaign by the Prime Minister on 12 May 2020, thus making the handloom sector an integral part of Make in India program. Prime Minister Narendra Modi made a clarion call to be vocal for handmade products, which will not only strengthen efforts for a self-reliant India, but as well as preserve the indigenous craft of our nation. His mantra, vocal for local, has brought about various government incentives to the sector. Among the incentives, I'll read out a few. The Handloom Export Promotion Council has worked tirelessly towards connecting handloom weavers and exporters from different corners of the country with the international market. In 2006, the government of India, in its effort to provide a distinct identity to handloom product, launched the Handloom Mark. During the celebration of, the, of 7 August 2015 as Han, uh, National Handloom Day, India Handloom brand was launched. Under the Indian Handloom brand, a total of 1590 registration have been issued under 184 products, categories, and more than 22,000 registration have also been issued up to 31st March 2020 under the Handloom mark. The Government of India launched on the 6th National Handloom Day social media campaign, Vocal for Handmade. The campaign was successful in generating interest among the Indian public in Handloom. The Indian Textile Soaring Fair was organized on the 7th, 10th, 11th August 2020, where more than 200 participants from across the country showcased their products with unique designs and skill. The Solar Chakra program was set up to address concerns such as lack of market connection pricing and raw materials in labor intensive activities such as spinning, weaving and embroidery work. Tribe India eMart, a website allowing tribal artists to sell the product was launched. 23 e-commerce entities have been engaged for online marketing of handloom products. Under the Go Tribal campaign, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs has aimed for every household in India to have at least one tribal product over the next three years. 
The National Institute of Fashion Technology has been roped in to collaborate with the Design Resource Center in building and creating design-oriented excellence in the handloom sector. Distant education courses have been designed both by the National Institute of Open Schooling and Indira Gandhi National Open University relevant for the handloom sector. Financial assistance is provided through the National, uh, National Handloom Development Program, Comprehensive Handloom Cluster Development Scheme, the Handloom Weavers Comprehensive Welfare Scheme, and the Yarn Supply Scheme. Addressing the welfare of the handloom weavers, the Government of India introduced schemes such as the Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana, the Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana, and the Mahatma Gandhi Bankir Bhima Yojana. Under the Hat Kardya Samavardhan Sahat Yatta scheme, 90% of the cost of the loom and accessories are borne by the government. Sari diplomacy and Khadi diplomacy have been endorsed by the government on various platforms. Ministry of Textiles have been annually conferring awards like Sun Kabir Award, National Award, and the National Merit Certificate towards excellence in weaving, design, development, and marketing efforts. To develop textile industry in the northeastern region of India, the government of India implement the Northeast Region Textile Promotion Scheme. The handloom sector has made remarkable... Ms. Uh, Ms. Baya, you just you please sum up, okay? It's a uh, one minute. Just one. Minute. Please try to sum up. Okay, okay I'll just. I'm sorry, few, uh, but we have to keep. Okay. okay. The sector is estimated yeah. to employ 68.86 like artisan. Around 95% of the world's hand woven fabric comes from India. And during the pandemic, artisans and members of the self help group across 27 Indian states produced more than 19 million masks. Indian textile products, that is handloom and handicrafts, are exported to more than 100 countries, with the United States of America and the European Union account for approximately 43% of India's textile and apparel export. I'll conclude uh, by, by saying that a prosperous future of the handloom se sector in India will not only bolster the economy, but will empower the rural folk, while at the same time integrate India through ancient artwork. Okay, madam, I will stop here. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you, uh, Ms. Baya. I'm so sorry, but we have to keep no, to the time because uh, we also we, we have to see whether we will be having time to discuss uh, and interact. Oh. Okay, we now okay, go straight you. away to uh, Dr. Yeah, thank you, Baya. So we come now to straight away to Dr. Lalita Agarwal, Associate Professor, uh, Department of Philosophy, uh, Gokla Memorial Girls College, Kolkata. And her title of the paper is Revival of Spirituality. Revival of True India at the Global Platform. You can take in, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yeah, you're audible, yes. Am I? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, ma'am. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Synod College for arranging this amazing webinar. I would like to thank Professor David Arnold Kharchandi for giving me this opportunity to present my paper here. Uh, so here I will be uh, speaking on revival of spirituality, that is the revival of true India at the global platform. Spirituality is a globally acknowledged concept and it deals with understanding the nature of the soul and one's journey back to identifying with the soul and experiencing it as one's true nature. So it is an expansive science about how to be blissful and it gives us the clarity that whatever goes on in our minds and in the outer world, we are responsible for that. And uh, so it's a quest for uh, meaning that is the purpose of life and refers to the development of the non-material element of life and life is more than biology. Now the question is, what does a spiritual revival mean? Uh, revivalism uh, uh, is increased spiritual interest or renewal in the life of a church, congregation or society with a local, national or global effect. So it's time now to revive the lost spirit, the lost glory, the lost India. Science and spirituality move hand in hand and they are not separate. Science says, what is this? Whereas spirituality deals with who am I? The subjective knowledge about oneself is spirituality and... Two sides of the same point. In India, spirituality was at the center of all other studies. Every field of study revolved around spirituality. Spiritual knowledge was given prime importance along with the scientific knowledge. 
in fact the ancient rishis were the scientists of that time and a student was given holistic education in science as well as spirituality however today uh, education has become a rat race devoid of spirituality the core values of life like love belonging there joy happiness have taken a back seat and uh, um, uh, lives have become filled with anxieties inhibitions fear stress so people have forgotten their roots now the time has come to make people aware of their glorious past uh, which somehow has been lost in time so reawakening the national feeling of pride and self respect is the need of the time so indians and indian uh, india is known more, more for spirituality and not for materialism and so now uh, whatever country we may belong to what whatever religion we may belong to we have every right to become spiritual and when we become that uh, we can see there so many qualities within us uh, start showing and we get a new dimension in our consciousness and that is the collective consciousness the whole world can be changed and transformed so we are living in a world of uncertainties and limitations today it is the pandemic uh, tomorrow it will be something else so we are constantly plagued by uh, enemies of lust anger greed pride etc so the only solution is to revive our spirituality inherent in our uh, ourselves and it is through reconnecting with our spiritual science that we can attain unlimited happiness in the spiritual realm that fixes one stably in the truth so india has a rich philosophical heritage over several thousands of years and here uh, indian philosophy is known mainly for three main doctrines that is uh, the doctrine of karma that is the principle of causality mukti that is the release from the cycle of love uh, life in this world and soul or atma the inner self of the human person uh, since um, hence spiritual wisdom gained an upper hand over materialistic prosperity spirituality in indian philosophy is about the correct way of living and a right way of thinking is creative lifestyle and in on this planet with a purpose and that purpose is to be compassionate caring and loving so this spiritual thinker started to teach and spread the art of living a healthy and fulfilling life by connecting through inner self today's indian spirit foundation by sadguru and art of living by ravi shankar the motive of all these establishments is to make the earth a peaceful place to live a violence and stress free global family and the goal of their spiritual movement is to bring peace to individuals society nation and the world so today not only indians but people across the world look up to the indian spiritual gurus to find peace and meaning to life and spirituality is nothing but a step towards uh, inner peace and india spirituality revolves around only a uh, three main, uh, main main central values that is satyam a civilization that serves justice shivam a society with emotional integrity sundaram an aesthetically beautiful community so uh, Uh, sadguru also says says that something fundamental is shifting in the very way human beings are and in many ways it will be a time of great possibilities the coming years will be the golden age for spirituality on this planet even top level universities in the united states such as stanford harvard yale uh, and many other ivy league uh, schools are opening up to the spiritual process for the very uh, first time and it is a good thing for the world that established sectors corporate sectors academics and even politicians are opening up Uh, to spiritual uh, process and uh, when it comes to the spiritual uh, uh, well being we have to think yes there is a break uh, does it, can everyone hear ma'am lalita agarwal Yes. There's a break. Well. Hello. Hello. Yeah. Yes. Yes. We can hear you now. Yes. Hello. I think there's some uh, technically there's some. Hello. Are uh, are participants? Please, can you hear any all the paper presenters? Participants. There's a break. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? Can you hear me? It's an audible, no? Audible. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. Ma'am, ma'am, Lalita, Alando, please, uh, please check in, sir. Alando. Oh yes, ma'am. I can hear. Yeah, just it. Yeah, we we cannot hear, ma'am. There's a break. We are not getting. Um, 
Sir Alandu, can you hear Ma'am Alalita? Yeah, yeah. Uh, no, Ma'am. Yes, Ma'am. I'm audible. I'm audible. Yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah, we, yeah. Okay, we, 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 we. Yeah, you're audible now. Yes, yes. Okay, okay. ma'am, please, please try to sum up. Okay, ma'am, please try to sum okay, up. Okay, okay. Yes, ma'am. As yes, ma'am. So, uh, I would like to say here that uh, it is the spirit, the spirit to strive for liberation, and that is the spiritual strength that kept India intact as a nation, and individual uh, Indian civilization as a living civilization. And uh, I, here, I would like to say that. Uh, uh, just in such spiritual traditions, only true inner peace within the hearts of the people can bring about a uh, true outer peace in the world. Because if Indians are plagued by inner conflicts and doubts, uh, we just start blaming others for their problem with it, without even realizing what they are doing. It is just necessary for all of us individuals to wake up and become increasingly uh, conscious of our own thoughts and feelings and how these are creating certain results or consequences in the world. Uh, so that we may uh, each become increasingly responsible for the type of world that we are creating, including whether this world is a peaceful one or not. Uh, in one of his speeches, Sadhguru uh, said that in the past we were divided into at least 200 different states, 200 uh, political entities, yet we were recognized as one nation. We eat differently, we dress differently, we speak different languages, yet we remain one. What holds us as one nation is the spiritual thread. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, all our esteemed uh, paper presenters. And I know uh, time is very short, but we will just stick in for just one or two questions. I uh, We will see, uh, because we have uh, just another five minutes. But whatever it is, uh, we will try to, any one of you, you have any questions, we will just take one or two questions, uh, if we can, at this time. Any one of you, you have any queries or any clarifications or any um, suggestions on uh, all the papers, uh, presenters. Please, all of you, uh, my dear colleagues, do you have any questions? Can you, uh, am, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, do you have any questions, uh, any uh, suggestions, or any observations? I think uh, no one is there. So we will. Well, I will just try to sum up uh, on uh, whatever we have uh, presented at this time. So uh, it's been a very um, informative sessions. And I thank all the uh, paper presenters uh, and uh, and on uh, and their contributions in every aspect. So I will try to sum up uh, on what we have been uh, delivering at this in these sessions. We we know that uh, we witness a cornucopia of perspectives pertaining to India's uh, platinum age. Um, besides uh, being an informative sessions, I would say that it makes us think of India as a person that we have grown along with. It is a country that can boast on just about any front, be it in terms of spirituality and the arts or in terms of its proficiency in the field of IT and development. We began with Ms. Uh, Ibanta, uh, Ibanta Tiuso, take on design and innovation in independent India and the feat that has been achieved by something that has had such simple beginning. It is interesting to be able to get to know the different things that contribute into India's growth and design and innovation is one of them. India is a country with a rich legacy of the arts and it is fortunate that we have been able to combine this legacy along with emerging trends in the field of architecture. Thank you, Ms. Ibanta Tiuso. Uh, Dr. Dira's uh, Bhomik uh, paper resonates uh, with positivity and uh, hopefulness Threads that have been regulated to the corners, especially in this time of the pandemic. We are made to rethink India's stance and remember the contribution it has made to the world. To go back to these core values uh, that are the very essence of India and place them at this juncture, using them as bearing to look future has truly been a pleasure to listen to and comprehend. Thank you, Dr. Dhira, uh, for the wonderful paper. Mr. Alando Raplang takes on IT and its impact on the economy of a country presents another facet of India's fast growing pace. IT is one of the most relevant and significant entities in this day and age. 
Therefore, it is necessary to acknowledge its large presence in the economy of a country. Uh, thank you very much, Sir uh, uh, Alando Raplang, on your uh, presentations. Uh, yet another neglected area that has contributed to the making of India's very essence presents itself in Ms. Baya Christine Lanong paper, which talks about the handloom sector. Uh, while much has been achieved by this sector, it is unfortunate that it now suffers because of the times and people's preferences that are less inclined towards the sector. It is important to revisit our love for such products. After all, it was through this very factor that our independence was achieved. Uh, finally, Dr. Lalita Agarwal's uh, paper on spirituality and its uh, uh, revival puts the frosting on the cake for this session. Uh, these are desperate times, and while we can only do our part by staying in and staying safe, there is not much that we can do except to rely on agents besides ourselves to keep us strong. This has been a very informative session indeed, and I look forward to more in the times to come. Uh, thank you, all of you, uh, my dear colleagues, and your uh, expertise and your knowledge in various fields have immensely um, had an impact in today's session. So until then, uh, have a good day, and uh, we will meet and have more deliberations uh, when the situations will be fine. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, okay. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, thank Shana. You. Okay. And thank you to yes. all the presenters. God bless you. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Care, it's okay, no? Fine. Care? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank yeah, you. Yes, Have a nice day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fine. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, before we start, yeah, uh, all the presenters are here. We can start. We can go ahead. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, um, very good morning to every one of you here, and uh, I thank uh, Synod College for organizing this webinar on uh, celebrating uh, India at seventy-five in collaboration with the Department of uh, Urban Culture. So, yeah, uh, uh, we are very grateful that. Uh, uh, through even in this situation during this pandemic, but still we've been able to connect to one another and uh, share our experiences and our uh, your expertise in various fields. Uh, I hope that through this webinar, uh, everyone will be benefited. So as you all know, the organizers have, the, uh, have uh, uh, I think have informed you and they have uh, given the time limit. Every one of you, we're having 10 minutes, okay? So uh, these are the... Um, uh, the regulations that they have set in, they say that uh, every one of us, uh, we're going to start, we have uh, five paper presenters, and uh, each one of us will stick to our time. Uh, we will start with uh, yeah, Ms. Ibanta Tiuso. Uh, she's an assistant professor from the Department of uh, Agriculture, North Eastern Hill University. And uh, the topic that she will, the title of the paper is Design and Innovation in Independent India. Then we have Dr. Dira Bumik. Uh, Associate Professor uh, and Head of the Department of English, Shillong College. And the topic title of the paper is India at 75, A Vision for the Future. And followed by Ms. Uh, Baya Dalinti Christine Lanong. Uh, she's here, Baya Dalinti Christine Lanong, uh, from the Department of Political Science, Sora Government College. And uh, the title of the paper is India's Advancements at the Handloom Sector. We also have um, uh, Alando uh, Raplang, okay? Alando Raplang, from the Department of Computer Science, uh, uh, Com Department of Computer Science, uh, Synod College, and Alando's uh, paper will be on IT, I IT technology and its impact on economy. And then we have uh, Dr. Lalita Agarwal, Associate Professor, Department of Philosophy, uh, Gokhale Memorial Schools, uh, a Girls College, Kolkata. And her title of the paper is on revival of spirituality, uh, revival of true India and the global platform. So welcome all of you, my uh, paper presenters and all my dear colleagues uh, in today's uh, webinar, uh, which is organized by uh, Synod College in collaboration with the Department of Art and Culture. So uh, 
uh, I know every one of you uh, will be taking your turn, uh, and but you have to stick to 10 minutes. Uh, three minutes before your time, I will be giving you a warning, okay? A warning uh, bell where, uh, uh, where I will give you a warning uh, and that you have to summarize your paper and uh, and conclude it uh, so that we will not uh, uh, go beyond the time because the organizers have to, Uh, because your organizers have to, uh, have uh, instructed that uh, there is have informed us that there is another session at uh, 12 at 11 straight away so we have to stick to our time so now i call upon our first uh, paper presenters uh, miss uh, ibanta uh, tiuso assistant professor uh, department of architecture northeastern hill university so uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Ms. Uh, please introduce yourself and we will start with your paper. Uh, thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, good morning to you all. Um, my name is uh, Ibinta Bakman So uh, I'm presenting from, uh, I'm from the Department of Architecture, uh, Nehu. So today, uh, I mean, I would first of all like to uh, thank Sonot College for this uh, opportunity and for organizing this webinar in such an important theme. Um, okay, then, uh, what? so I would like to discuss uh, on my paper, I will dis discuss on the design and innovation in India. So I will uh, briefly, okay, let me just go to my, I'll just share my screen here. Is it visible? Yes. Okay. So, <laughs> so uh, my topic name is on the design and innovation in India. I will briefly discuss an overview of the progress that design and innovation has had since the past 75 years of India's independence. And it will look at strides uh, that design education has made and the contributions that uh, design and innovation has had towards uh, nation building. So uh, first of all, I'd like to just have like a brief uh, definition of what does design uh, mean? So uh, design innately uh, contributes to nation building and its broad form and it's in its broad form has contributed significantly to our history, culture, economy and the impact on the environment. A well executed design can shape human thought and interaction, improve our way of life, give rise to endless possibilities, overall development, economic growth and could be the answer to complex and real world problems. So uh, next, I would like to just highlight um, the in a timeline uh, format, uh, the landmarks of design education in India. So here you can see that, uh, you know, it's in two, um, in two sec uh, sections. There is the pre-independence and the post-independence. So looking at the pre-independence, which is from the 1840s to 1922, uh, the British, during their rule in India, employed traditional artists in and around Madras to produce furniture, metalwork, and curios to be sent to the royal palaces of their queen. This led to the formation of the Government College of Fine Arts, Chennai, initially known as Madras School of Art. Um, it was founded in 1850 as the oldest art school. A number of art schools in the country also came up around the same time, with Sir J.J. School of Arts, Mumbai in 1857, the Government College of Art and Craft, Kolkata, established in 1854, the Kala Bhavana as part of the Viswa Bharati University founded by Rabindranath Tagore in 1919 and various other art schools all over the country. Some of these schools, in addition to academic programs in fine art, later included courses in architecture, pottery, tile making, metal crafts, etc. Now coming to uh, post-independence 1958 onwards, there was definitely a lot more, uh, lot more strides in uh, design education and, and development. 
So it was only after in the post independence that the Indian government understood that the, to catch up with the West, it had to develop, build, and plan cohesively from the bottom up. Among major uh, thrusts in various fields, the potential of design and its execution was realized and encouraged. So the government of India. to the small industries, and that would resist <coughs> the present rapid deterioration in design and quality of consumer goods. So on invitation from the government of India and sponsorship of the Ford Foundation, Charles Ames, an American industrial designer, and his wife and colleague Ray Ames toured throughout India to explore the problems of design and make recommendations for the training program. So the India report prepared by the Ames in 58 emerged as a result of their study and discussions. It stipulated the underlying spirit needed to promote a suitable national design outlook and advocated the setting up of indige indigenous design legacy that involved applications of modern disciplines and old traditions to meet the challenges of contemporary India. So following the report, the government set up uh, national, the National Institute of Design in 61 as an autonomous National Institute for Research, Service and Training in Industrial Design and Visual Communication. NIDs are recognized by the Government of India as a scientific and industrial design research organization. They are accorded the Institute of National Importance by Act of Parliament under the National Institute of Design Act 2014. In 69, the Industrial Design Center, IIT Bombay, was established and offered multiple courses in design between 82 to 85 under the UN, uh, UNDP uh, IDC invited design educators from the UN school in Germany, from USA, Italy, and others. They spent months interacting, teaching, and doing design projects. And the faculty at IDC travel internationally interacting with the other educators and practitioners. So these interactions and experiences led to a very strong methodology based, user-centric and uh, con uh, context-oriented design philosophy at the school that the industry was able to appreciate. So the model of education at IDC IIT Bombay was successful and adopted by the other IT IITs and the IISC in Bangalore. So in 18, uh, 1987, the Ministry of Textiles set up the uh, National Institute of Fashion Technology in Delhi. The school started programs in fashion, accessories, and lifestyle products catering to the needs of the fashion industry in India. In the 90s, NIFT expanded further and opened uh, other centers to other parts of the country, Ahmedabad, Chennai, Mumbai, Bengaluru, and uh, Hyderabad, Kanpur. And we also want, have one uh, in Shillong, which was established in 2008. Uh, in 97, the newly formed uh, IIT in Gohati, with the support of IDC IIT Bombay, introduced a full-fledged uh, Department of Design. So in 98, the Ministry of Crafts initiated the Craft Institute of India at Jaipur. With assistance from NID uh, Ahmedabad, the Institute offers program in craft and design. So with the economic liberalization in the 80, in 90s, the opening up of the Indian economy and market reforms. It saw the setting up of private design schools in India and offered more courses in various design disciplines. So the Pearl Academy also was established in 93 and it's located in Mumbai and Jaipur. So the academy is extremely popular and has been considered the best design institute by Association, which is the Associated Chambers of Commerce and in Industry in India. Uh, Symbiosis Institute of Design in Pune was also set up in 2002 to promote the ethical and creative learning of the candidate. The three institutes offer specialization of four different fields, communi uh, communication design, industrial design, fashion design, and fashion communication. Besides these various other private schools all over the country were also established. Uh, next, we come to the rise of the design and innovation industry trying to understand this, look at this uh, chart here, which is from the, about the economy of India, showing the steady uh, rise of different industries. So the GDP of the country, as we know, is driven by three major factors, uh, sectors, uh, agriculture, industry, and services. So design and innovation is intricately uh, woven in the service and industry sectors. 
The service sector under which design falls in has seen a steady rise every decade. At present, the service sector is at 59% of the total GDP. The opening up of markets after 91 also made it possible for making the economy more market and service oriented and expanding the role of private and foreign investments. So uh, talking about the different fields in design, uh, looking at the pie chart here, the maximum uh, concentration of designers is in the field of architecture and interior design. But the obvious reason here is because architecture is a domain of study and practice has been well entrenched for a long time. And uh, the whole human uh, center, uh, computer interaction, which is a rising field now, uh, seem higher because of the migration of graphic and industrial designers to this field. So now uh, these fields are also merging now. And the other design domains are coming up as fast and soon the numbers will increase considerably in these domains. Uh, paving the way forward, uh, looking forward, there was, um, you know, before there was the only a small fraction of the uh, of the design kaleidoscope, which was pursued by the and encouraged by the British in pre-independent India. Fine arts was where it started and towards the late 20th century, architecture was also introduced. However, it was only post-independent India that the possibilities of design was pursued and the opening of design schools by the government started in the 1960s. Post-economic liberalization in the 90s saw a paradigm shift in the, ex in the exponential growth in the nation's GDP. The services sector became a major contributing force towards the nation's GDP and has been one uh, which is growing since. With the growth with this growth, many opportunities, new jobs, new requirements, and unheard of expertise and designations followed. Private parties also jumped in to fill this void, to pro provide the necessary training and skilled manpower, um, and open their own design schools all over the country. The Make in um, India... Ms. Ibanta, uh, Ms. Ibanta yes, you have just two minutes, two minutes left, okay? Yeah. Yes, ma'am, just wrapping up. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the Make in India initiative also launched by the government of India in 2014 as part of the wider set of nation building initiatives also, will also transform India into a global design and manufacturing hub. So the world uh, right now is still reeling under the impact of COVID-19 pandemic and this will redefine the future. Since then, it has touched upon all aspects of our lives from the way we live to the how we work and even how we interact. Every major life-changing event is also a major opportunity in thinking out of the box and coming up with creative workable solutions. Design and innovations uh, are here to stay and with a sustained focus can propel this country and make the dream by 2025 a $5 trillion economy and an economic powerhouse. I will end here uh, with this quote by Steve Jobs, which says, design is not just what it looks like or feels like design is how it works thank you thank you miss ibanta tiuso uh, we will have the discussion i think we will first present all of us then to, we will have the discussions if time permits and we will see towards the end okay so we so that so that we won't waste any time i will call upon uh, dr dira bomik uh, the head uh, department of english uh, shillong college to present her paper okay dira uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, respected chairperson. I'm Dr. Dhira Vomik, and uh, my paper is titled India at 75, A Vision for the Future. And I'm going to read out my paper. One of the world's major civilizations with a civilizational history that is at least 8,000 years old, a country of over a billion people, India shall celebrate its 75th year of independence on 15th of August 2021 at 75. India is still a young country. But we need to reflect on our successes and failures while India turned 75. India in 1947 was a poor third world country, a nation partitioned with large scale human tragedy. In spite of the colonial exploitation and subjugation, it made its twist with destiny. Its problems were many. And those were accentuated by wars in Kashmir and the borders, including one with China in 1962, and multiplied by natural periodic calamities such as um, floods, epidemics, cyclones, famine, etc. What strengthened India's will to fight and survive was the will of the people, reflected in adult franchise and parliamentary democracy. 
India remained committed to civilizational values in a practicing constitutional democracy. During the last 74 years of a vibrant and functional democracy, India has come out of the horrors of the past with self-will and commitment. It has successfully fought the battles on poverty, infant mortality, while developing a vibrant educational system and has made strides in terms of economic development. A World Bank report on poverty in India released in April 2020 notes, and I quote, since the 2000s, India has made remarkable progress in reducing absolute poverty. Between financial year 2012 and 2015, poverty declined from 21.6 to an estimated 13.4% at the international poverty line, continuing the historical trend of robust reduction in poverty. Aided by robust economic growth, more than 90 million people escaped extreme poverty and improved their living standards during this period. World Bank, poverty and equity. India continued to be on a growth path economically. The direct implication of ensuring rapid growth with inclusiveness is that policy making will have to be rooted in Indian ground realities while emphasizing the welfare of all in both policy design and implementation. The government's development strategy has helped achieve broad based economic growth to ensure balanced development across all regions and states and sectors. This implies embracing new technologies, fostering innovation and upskilling. There is focus on the necessary modernization of our agriculture and mainstreaming of regions such as Northeast, hilly states and the 115 aspirational districts. The direct outcome of this has improved regional and interpersonal equity and elimination of dualism that has so far characterized our economy. An economy is put in place that is predominantly formal, rule-driven and facilitates investment and innovation. This strategy certainly will bridge the gap between public and private sector performance. The Prime Minister has focused on putting in a development state in place of a soft state that this government had inherited. In this context, the government has focused on the efficient delivery of public services, rooting out corruption and black economy, formalizing the economy and expanding the tax base, improving the ease of doing business, nursing the stressed commercial banking sector back to a healthy state, and stopping leakages through direct benefit transfers and widespread use of the jam trinity. The strategy for New India at 75 captures key message from the Prime Minister that that development must become a mass movement in which every Indian recognizes her role and also experiences the tangible benefits accruing to her in the form of shared collective effort and resolve that will ensure that we achieve a new India by 2021, just like independence was achieved within five years of Mahatma Gandhi giving his call of Quit India in 1942. However, recasting old developmental models has its problems and things need to be looked afresh and that's what the government has been doing. And this has to be uh, done, not only at the level of policy formulation, but also at the level of design and implementation. The present government has succeeded to a large extent in implementing government policies, trying to make India strong and having its rightful position among nations of the world. For achieving the goal of a strong India, there are four dynamic pursuits. First, having a holistic vision of development at the intersectoral level, pursuing world standards in all sectors, whether infrastructure, education, healthcare, innovation, industrial production, social welfare, etc. Secondly, converting development programs as people's movements such as Swachh Bharat, Atmanirbhar Bharat, Skill India, Digital India, etc. In making, of course, in making citizens' participation more robust, in attempting at that. Thirdly, following a dynamic foreign policy to ensure larger welfare of the world, joining on missions such as solar alliance, climate change, universal vaccination, etc. Fourthly, having India secured, secure its borders from any threat without compromise and being proud of its defense forces. These issues are constant and dynamic, but these need upgrading our policies and their implementation from time to time. 2020-21 has been a challenging year on many fronts. Chinese aggression on Eastern Ladakh, COVID-19 pandemic, loss of livelihood, deaths, and unremitted suffering. And also, it has been a time to acknowledge the talent in terms of innovations in medical equipments, drugs, and vaccines. 
The crisis has also tested our mettle in fighting the pandemic on many fronts of which we are yet to be free. The pandemic and Chinese hostility have their challenges as they provide also, they provide opportunities for India, India to engage with the world in a more positive and productive way. However, our achievement so far puts us in a better position to deal with the crisis and look beyond. India has made tremendous progress in the field of trade and commerce and has become the fifth largest economy. In addition, we have made spectacular progress in the fields of space research, IT, telecommunications, rail, road and port infrastructure, pharmaceuticals, ease in doing business, agriculture, etc. The country also has to fight many evils like caste, ethnic hatred, religious bigotry, linguistic rivalries, uh, separatist violence, terrorism, gender discrimination, etc. However, India's problems can be solved with Indian solutions only having faith in our social values and cultural learning. The present government has focused mostly on having Indian solutions to Indian problems as the Prime Minister has focused on Atmanirbhar Bharat, Made in India, and put in efforts to make India the innovation hub of the world through promoting startup and stand-up India. These missions are yielding predictable results and the future looks positive. By achieving the vision of making India strong, a new education policy has been announced. The main objective is to make India a hub in the, um, in the global supply chain, thereby ensuring prosperity of the country and the world. This is where we need to take a pause and think of India in a post-COVID multipolar world order. India has never been a country that is opportunistic and aggressively self-advancing. Our culture teaches us to be non-aggressive, non-interfering, and also we are ever ready to serve. The twin concepts of Vasudeva Kutumbakam and Sarvajan Hitaya Sarvajan Sukhaya still guide our foreign and domestic policies. India will carry forward after the COVID crisis the motto that a culture that believes in sacrifice and inclusiveness believes in a human free of exploitation, free from exploitation, violence in any form, and the welfare of all humanity shall prevail. No one can take away India's historical legacy written by its people in ensuring its position not as a superpower, but as a responsible world power committed to humane values and welfare of all, all humanity beyond statistics, indices, and world rankings. And this is how, how I would like to sum up. The inherent cultural characteristics of India as articulated by the Prime Minister uh, Narendra Modi at the World Economic Forum in Davos in 1900, I mean in uh, 2080, sorry, that the gems of Indian wisdom such as Vasudeva Kutumbakam with its underlying philosophy of oneness continues to be relevant and effective in the conflict with the world. The present situation has proven that our destinies are linked together this Vedic dictum in Maha Upanishad, uh, chapter 4, lines 71 to 75, declares that it is only the small-minded who discriminate between the kin and stranger, while for the magnanimous, the entire world is a family. The eternal religion, or Sanatana Dharma, teaches us to hold together and sustain. Dharma's approximate meaning is, and I, and I quote, and it's natural law, and those principles of reality that are inherent in the very nature of the universe. The future for India at 75 unfolds on the strength of the principles of Sanatan Dharma, that means, and I quote, the natural, the ancient, and the eternal way, unquote. In following this principle, India certainly will work for a peaceable, healthy, and meaningful future. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dira Bhomik. Uh, we will have the discussions uh, when all the uh, if we have time, we will look into it. So I now call upon the, uh, Mr. Alando uh, Raplang, Raplang, Assistant Professor, Department of uh, Computer Application at Synod College. Uh, the title of his paper is Evolution of Information Technology, Its Impact on the Indian Economy After Independence. Okay, sir, you can start presenting your paper. Okay, ma'am. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Rapla. Yes. Okay. Uh, a very good morning to our chairperson, uh, fellow presenters and uh, participants. Uh, the paper I'll be presenting uh, today is on uh, 
evolution of information technology, uh, its impact on the Indian economy after independence. Uh, these are uh, my contents, uh, which I'll be discussing. So let me begin. Uh, information technology uh, is a knowledge-based industry uh, which embraces production, manipulation, storage, and dissemination of information. Uh, this sector has remarkably uh, a remarkable potential for accelerating uh, economic growth of the nation. It has a potential to improve uh, the productivity of almost all sectors of economic development. Uh, this sector has made uh, our governance very efficient and its role in en enhancing the economic development of the country has been uh, acknowledged by the government of India. These are the different phases uh, I'll be discussing uh, 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 on the evolution of the uh, IT uh, sector in India. Uh, before the 1980, uh, the Indian IT sector didn't exist up till uh, in 1960s. The sector was started with uh, hardware products and it was uh, government control to high tar uh, tariff rates and licensing. After the realization of the Indian government on the potential of foreign exchange earnings uh, through software sector, in 1972, it formulated a new software export scheme by importing hardware and exporting software in which TCS uh, was the first beneficiary in 1974. And in 1970s, in the mid of 1970s, the first software services and products were exported. In this period of 1980 and 1990, a new computer uh, policy was announced in 1984, aiming at promoting the uh, manufacture of computer base on latest technology at price comparable to international levels. Uh, seeing the software exports were very discouraging, the Indian government uh, to develop and liberalize the IT sector announced the 1986 policy on computer software export, software development, and training. According to this policy, the imports of hardware were delicensed and were also made duty free. 1990 to 2000 here, this period has observed an intensified competition in the IT sector. During this stage, there were uh, some substantial changes in the Indian economy, including relaxation in the entry barriers, trade liberalization, opening up of Indian economy for foreign investments. And due to the liberalization, a flow of foreign investment came to India and multinational companies uh, in, in India also were introduced. This period is a rapid growth of the IT industry. Uh, the Y2K buck, dot-com crash and the recession in the US economy has forced many US firms to, to utilize the service of Indian firms. This has uh, resulted in placing the Indian IT industry on global map and software companies were earning good amount of foreign exchange. The IT Act uh, passed in uh, 2000 uh, gave a boost to the e-commerce and in 2005, uh, special economic zones were also passed. The result was an increase in number of software companies by the next 10, year, uh, 10 years, Indian com uh, companies place themselves as multinational companies and have emerged as leading players in the international arena. In this period, a strong growth in demand for export from new verticals, uh, rapidly growing urban infrastructure that has fostered several IT centers in the country and highly qualified talent pool of technical graduates, India became the world's largest sourcing and a preferred destination for IT and ITES. 2019, uh, India ranked uh, third among the global startup due to various government measures and ease of doing business in India. In February 2019, the government of India released a national policy on software products uh, to develop India as a software product nation. And India jumped four places to rank at 48th position uh, at the 2020 edition of the Global Innovation Index, GII. Uh, coming to the impact on the Indian economy, uh, if you look here, this is a graph showing that the Indian IT industry has achieved a phenomenal growth uh, post-economic reform period and has grown manif manifold during the period of 19, uh, 1992, 1992 and 1920. The industry has contributed significantly to the economy in terms of GDP, foreign uh, investment and employment. The total revenue generated by the IT and BPM industry in India as over 191 billion US dollars in 2020. Currently, the sector contributes around 7.7% uh, to the 
country's uh, GDP. Foreign, uh, in terms of foreign investment, many foreign investors are investing in India software industry, which also contributes uh, to the growth of Indian economy. They are mainly in the form of foreign investments. Uh, the FDI, number one, there are a number of multinational companies in India that uh, invest directly in their business in India. Example, uh, Google, Accenture, uh, Microsoft, Apple, is all, uh, Microsoft and Apple is planning also to manufacture its product in India. These companies get the benefit of employing a very, at a very reasonable salaries. FII, FII. Uh, the Foreign Institutional Investment, FPI, uh, for, Foreign Portfolio Investments. The, uh, in this, the Indian economy is growing fast and has attracted attention of foreign investors as a promising market of, for investment. Many countries like US, Malaysia, Singapore, China, and Dubai have invested in Indian stocks that include the IT sector. India has been placed third rank among the countries that are considered to be the most attractive investment destination for technology transactions as per the report of the EY Global uh, Capital Confidence Barometer. Uh, when it comes to uh, Indian, uh, uh, its impact on employment, uh, we do, if you look here in this uh, table here, uh, in the year 2001-2002, the total employment uh, from the uh, IT sector is half a million. It grows up to uh, 3.96 uh, million uh, in 2017-18, which is estimated as per the uh, source of NASCOM. In addition to being one of the largest provider of create and creator of organized industry segment, this sector also plays a key important role in enabling higher levels of indirect employment. Uh, in terms of women employment in the IT sector and ITES sector, 34% uh, of women are employed, out of which out of 39.68 lakhs employee uh, in the fiscal year of 17-18. Uh, in the terms of growth and export, if you look here, uh, this sector has transformed India finances and effectively financed a large scale of imports. The export revenue of the Indian information technology stood 136 billion US, uh, US dollars in the fiscal year 2019. In terms of uh, the market size uh, growing here, uh, the, uh, the IT and BPM industry revenue was estimated at uh, around 191 uh, US dollars in the fiscal year of 2020 at a 7.7% growth year on year. Sir Alan, you have just uh, one minute, okay? Just sum up. Okay. Uh, this is my conclusion. Uh, the realization of the Indian IT sector 30 years ago, and introduction on MMN of different policies by the Indian government and in subsequent years, paved ways for an impressive growth to the sector. With a significant contribution to the nation's GDP, the industry has grown manifold. The competitiveness with global players and improved global economy, the Indian IT uh, industry has to move to digital transformation in order to compete. It also has to instill confidence to users and investors need by investing and adhering in future technologies like blockchain, artificial intelligence, machine learning, IoT, IOT, and others. The 10.81% increased job in the sector and the IT BPM uh, sector expected to grow 350 billion US dollars by 2025 has proven that the Indian IT industry is a success. But in order to survive in the future challenges like neglecting in the area of R&D, electronic hardware manufacturing, saturation of selected cities and neglecting of other areas, low IT services and highly dependent on markets in the US and Europe accounting approximately 90% of the total IT and ITS export has to be addressed. So with this, uh, I'll, I'll conclude my presentation. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Sir Alando. I know there will be many questions, uh, especially in during this uh, uh, sit pandemic situations, but I hope uh, we will be, uh, we'll just move on with the next paper and we will see if their time permits and there will be any queries and any uh, uh, suggestions on what we have to share. But now I call the next um, paper presenter, that is Miss. Uh, uh, Baya Dalinti uh, Christine Lanong, 
political science department sora government college uh, sora and the paper is the title of the paper is india's advancement at the handloom sector okay you take on miss baya uh, good morning madam good morning my, uh, fellow participant my i'm bairalunti lanong i'll be speaking on india's advancement at the handloom sector uh, i'll be reading i'll be just giving you the crux was for 10 minutes i won't be able, able to cover the entire paper so i'll first start with the historical background the swadeshi movement launched at calcutta town hall on the 7 august 1905 as a protest against the british government decision to partition bengal as well as to revive local made good has continued to inspire present india it is no coincidence that the national national handloom day is celebrated on 7 august since 2015 commemorating the 100th anniversary of the swadeshi movement the importance of this sector it can be attributed to the fact that it's the second largest income generating activity after agriculture in rural india it is estimated that 31.45 lakhs household in india are involved both directly and indirectly in the sector handloom are the major source of livelihood for tribal communities with more than 50% of india's total weaver population population resides in the country's eastern and north eastern region moreover the handloom sector contribution to women empowerment with over 23 lakhs female weavers and allied workers are engaged in the sector and almost every state of india has a unique handloom product to offer such as jaguar from uttar pradesh chandeli from madhya pradesh pulkar from punjab north east india is also blessed with different types of natural fibers like cotton to sar airy silk and an array of handloom goods the government of india stood committed towards the handloom sector since the attainment of independence the all india handloom board a board was reconstituted in 1952 the central cottage industry corporation of india limited was established in 1952 The Khadi and other Handloom Industries Development Act was passed in 1953 and the All India Handloom Fabric Marketing Cooperative Society was set up in 1955 to further boost the sector the Handloom and Handicraft Export Corporation of India Limited was set up in 1958 the Handloom Reservation of Production Article Act 1985 was passed The National Handloom Development Corporation was set up in 1983. However, despite the government of India taking robust initiative pro- problems like shortage of raw materials, lack of technology and failure to provide incentives to the artisan has hampered the growth of the sector. Problems like patent and designing, advertisement and competition from the power loom has only weakened the handloom sector. The noble aim of directing the country and its citizen to the path of independence and self-reliance is only possible when the grassroots are involved in the growth of the country. Thus, the handloom sector received a major fillip with the Atma Nirbhar Bharat Abhiyan or Self-Reliant India campaign by the Prime Minister on 12 May 2020, thus making the handloom sector an integral part of Make in India program. Prime Minister Narendra Modi made a clarion call to be vocal for handmade products which will not only strengthen efforts for a self-reliant India but as well as preserve the indigenous craft of our nation his mantra vocal for local has brought about various government incentives to the sector among the incentives I'll read out few the handloom export promotion council has worked tirelessly especially towards connecting handloom weavers and exporters from different corners of the country with the international market in 2006 the government of india in its effort to provide a distinct identity to handloom product launched the handloom mark during the celebration of the of 7 august 2015 as Han, uh, national handloom day india handloom brand was launched under the indian handloom brand a total of 1590 registration have been issued under 184 products categories and more than 
2,000 registration have also been issued up to 31st March 2020 under the handloom mark. The government of India launched on the 6th National Handloom Day social media campaign, Vocal for Handmaid. The campaign was successful in generating interest among the Indian public in handloom. The Indian Textile Soaring Fair was organized on the 7th, 10th, 11th August 2020, where more than 200 participants from across the country showcased their products with unique designs and skill. The Solar Chakra program was set up to address concerns such as lack of market connection, pricing and raw materials in labor intensive activities such as spinning, weaving and embroidery work. Tribe India eMart, a website allowing tribal artists to sell the product was launched. 23 e-commerce entities have been engaged for online marketing of handloom products. Under the Go Tribal campaign, the Ministry of Tribal Affairs has aimed for every household in India to have at least one tribal product over the next three years. The National Institute of Fashion Technology has been roped in to collaborate with the Design Resource Center in building and creating design-oriented excellence in the handloom sector. Distant education courses have been designed both by the National Institute of Open Schooling and Indira Gandhi National Open University relevant for the handloom sector. Financial assistance is provided through the National, ha uh, National Handloom Development Program, Comprehensive Handloom Cluster Development Scheme, the Handloom Weavers Comprehensive Welfare Scheme, and the Yarn Supply Scheme. Addressing the welfare of the handloom weavers, the Government of India introduced schemes such as the Pradhan Mantri Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana, the Pradhan Mantri Suraksha Bhima Yojana, and the Mahatma Gandhi Bankir Bhima Yojana. Under the Hat Kardya Samavardhan Sahat Yatta scheme, 90% of the cost of the loom and accessories are borne by the government. Sari diplomacy and Khadi diplomacy have been endorsed by the government on various platforms. Ministry of Textiles have been annually conferring awards like Sun Kabir Award, National Award, and the National Merit Certificate towards excellence in weaving, design, development, and marketing efforts. To develop textile industry in the northeastern region of India, the government of India implement the Northeast Region Textile Promotion Scheme. The handloom sector has made remarkable... Uh, Ms. Baya, you just, you, please sum up, okay? It's a uh, one minute. Just one, please try to sum up. Okay, okay I'll just- I'm sorry, few, uh, but we have to keep- okay. Okay. The sector is estimated yeah. to employ 68.86 like artisan. Around 95% of the world's hand woven fabric comes from India. And during the pandemic, artisans and members of the self-help group across 27 Indian states produce more than 19 million masks. Indian textile products, that is handloom and handicrafts, are exported to more than 100 countries with the United States of America and the European Union account for approximately 43% of India's textile and apparel export. I'll conclude uh, by, by saying that a prosperous future of the handloom se sector in India will not only bolster the economy, but will empower the rural folk, while at the same time integrate India through ancient artwork. Okay, madam, I will stop here. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, uh, Ms. Baya. I'm so sorry, but we have to keep no, to the time because uh, we also we, we have to see whether we will be having time to discuss uh, and interact. Oh. Okay, we now okay, go straight you. away to uh, Dr. Yeah, thank you, Baya. So we come now to straight away to Dr. Lalita Agarwal, Associate Professor, uh, Department of Philosophy, uh, Gokla Memorial Girls College, Kolkata. And her title of the paper is Revival of Spirituality, Revival of True India at the Global Platform. You can take in, ma'am. Uh, yes, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Yes, yes, yeah, you're audible, yes. Am I? Okay, okay, okay. Thank you, ma'am. First of all, I would like to thank uh, Synod College for arranging this amazing webinar. I would like to thank Professor David Arnold Kharchandi for giving me this opportunity to present my paper here. Uh, so here I will be uh, speaking on revival of spirituality, that is the revival of true India at the global platform. 
spirituality is a globally acknowledged concept and it deals with understanding the nature of the soul and one's journey back to identifying with the soul and experiencing it as one's true nature so it is an expansive science about how to be blissful and it gives us the clarity that whatever goes on in our minds and in the outer world we are responsible for that and uh, so it's a quest for uh, meaning that is the purpose of life and refers to the development of the non material element of life and life is more than biology now the question is what does a spiritual revival mean uh, revivalism uh, uh, is increased spiritual interest or renewal in the life of a church congregation or society with a local national or global effect so it's time now to revive the lost spirit the lost glory the lost india science and spirituality move hand in hand and they are not separate science says what is this whereas spirituality deals with who am i the subjective knowledge about oneself is spirituality and sides of the same point in india spirituality was at the center of all other studies every field of study revolved around spirituality spiritual knowledge was given prime importance along with the scientific knowledge in fact the ancient rishis were the scientists of that time and a student was given holistic education in science as well as spirituality however today uh, education has become a rat race devoid of spirituality the core values of life like love belonging there joy happiness have taken a back seat and uh, Um, uh, lives have become filled with anxieties, inhibitions, fear, stress. So people have forgotten their roots. Now the time has come to make people aware of their glorious past, uh, which somehow has been lost in time. So reawakening the national feeling of pride and self-respect is the need of the time. So Indians and Indian uh, India is known more, more for spirituality and not for materialism. And so now, uh, whatever country we may belong to, what whatever religion we may belong to we have every right to become spiritual and when we become that uh, we can see there so many qualities within us uh, start showing and we get a new dimension in our consciousness and that is the collective consciousness the whole world can be changed and transformed so we are living in a world of uncertainties and limitations today it is the pandemic uh, tomorrow it will be something else so we are constantly plagued by uh, enemies of lust anger greed pride etc so the only solution is to revive our spirituality inherent in our uh, Ourselves, and it is through reconnecting with our spiritual science that we can attain unlimited happiness in the spiritual realm that fixes one stably in the truth. So India has a rich philosophical heritage over several thousands of years, and here uh, Indian philosophy is known mainly for three main doctrines: that is, uh, the doctrine of karma, that is the principle of causality; mukti, that is the release from the cycle of love, uh, life in this world; and soul or atma, the inner self of the human person. Uh, since um, Hence, spiritual wisdom gained an upper hand over materialistic prosperity. Spirituality in Indian philosophy is about the correct way of living and a right way of thinking. Is meditative lifestyle and in on this planet with a purpose, and that purpose is to be compassionate, caring, and loving. So, these spiritual thinkers started to teach and spread the art of living a healthy and fulfilling life by connecting through inner self. today's indian spirit foundation by sadguru and art of living by ravi shankar the motive of all these establishments is to make the earth a peaceful place to live a violence and stress free global family and the goal of their spiritual movement is to bring peace to individuals society nation and the world so today not only indians but people across the world look up to the indian spiritual gurus to find peace and meaning to life and spirituality is nothing but a step towards uh, inner peace and india spirituality revolves around only a uh, three main, uh, main central values that is satyam a civilization that serves justice shivam a society with emotional integrity sundaram an aesthetically beautiful community so uh, Uh, sadguru also says says that something fundamental is shifting in the very way human beings are and in many ways it will be a time of great possibilities the coming years will be the golden age for spirituality on this planet even top level universities in the united states such as stanford harvard yale uh, and many other ivy league uh, schools are opening up to the spiritual process for the very uh, first time and it is a good thing for the world that established sectors corporate sectors academics and even politicians are opening up Uh, to spiritual uh, process and uh, when it comes to the spiritual uh, uh, well being we have to think
Yes. There is a break. Uh, does it, can everyone hear? Ma'am Lalita Agarwal? Yes. There's a break. Hello? Hello, yeah, yes, yes, we can hear you now, yes. Hello? I think there's some, uh, technically there's some. Hello? Are uh, participants, please, can you hear any, all the paper presenters, participants? There's a break. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Yes, yeah, ma'am. Yeah. Can, can you hear me? It's an audible, no? It's an audible. No. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Same. Ma'am, ma Lalita, Alando, please, uh, please check in. Sir Alando? Oh, yes, ma'am. I can hear. Yeah, just say, yeah. We, we cannot hear, ma'am. There's a break. We are not getting. Um... Sir Alando, can you hear, ma'am, Alalita? Uh, no, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Am I audible? Am I audible? Yeah, we, we, yeah, 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 we, and uh, I, here I would like to say that uh, just in such spiritual traditions, only two inner peace within the hearts of the people can bring about a uh, true outer peace in the world. Because if Indians are plagued by inner conflicts and doubts, uh, we just start blaming others for their problem with it, without even realizing what they are doing. It is just necessary for all of us individuals to wake up and become increasingly uh, conscious of our own thoughts and feelings and how these are creating certain results or consequences in the world. Uh, so that we may uh, each become increasingly responsible for the type of world that we are creating, including whether this world is a peaceful one or not. Uh, in one of his speeches, Sadhguru uh, said that in the past we were divided into at least 200 different states, 200 uh, political entities, yet we were recognized as one nation. We eat differently, we dress differently, we speak different languages, yet we remain one. What holds us as one nation is the spiritual thread. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Uh, thank you, uh, all our esteemed uh, paper presenters. And I know uh, time is very short, but we will just stick in for just one or two questions. I, uh, we will see, uh, because we have uh, just another five minutes. But whatever it is, uh, we will try to, any one of you, you have any questions, we will just take one or two questions, uh, if we can, at this time. Any one of you, you have any queries or any clarifications or any um, suggestions on uh, all the papers, uh, presenters. Please, all of you, uh, my dear colleagues, do you have any questions? Can you, uh, am, am I audible? Am I audible? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma yeah. 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 Uh, do you have any questions, uh, any uh, suggestions, or any observations? I think uh, no one is there. So we will. Well, I will just try to sum up uh, on uh, whatever we have uh, presented at this time. So uh, it's been a very um, informative sessions. And I thank all the uh, paper presenters uh, and uh, and on uh, and their contributions in every aspect. So I will try to sum up uh, on what we have been uh, delivering at this in these sessions. We we know that uh, we witness a cornucopia of perspectives pertaining to India's uh, platinum age. Um, besides uh, being an informative sessions, I would say that it makes us think of India as a person that we have grown along with. It is a country that can boast on just about any front, be it in terms of spirituality and the arts or in terms of its proficiency in the field of IT and development. We began with Ms. Uh, Ibanta, uh, Ibanta Tiuso, take on design and innovation in independent India and the feat that has been achieved by something that has had such simple beginning. 
It is interesting to be able to get to know the different things that contribute into India's growth and design and innovation is one of them. India is a country with a rich legacy of the arts and it is fortunate that we have been able to combine this legacy along with emerging trends in the field of architecture. Thank you, Ms. Ibanta Tiuso. Uh, Dr. Dira's uh, Bhomik uh, paper resonates uh, with positivity and uh, hopefulness, traits that have been regulated to the corners, especially in this time of the pandemic. We are made to rethink India's stance and remember the contribution it has made to the world. To go back to these four values uh, that are the very essence of India and place them at this juncture, using them as bearing to look future has truly been a pleasure to listen to and comprehend. Thank you, Dr. Dhira, uh, for the wonderful paper. Mr. Alando Raplang takes on IT and its impact on the economy of a country presents another facet of India's fast growing pace. IT is one of the most relevant and significant entities in this day and age. Therefore, it is necessary to acknowledge its large presence in the economy of a country. Uh, thank you very much, sir, uh, Alando Raplang, on your uh, presentations. Uh, yet another neglected area that has contributed to the making of India's very essence presents itself in Ms. Baya Christine Lanong paper, which talks about the handloom sector. Uh, while much has been achieved by this sector, it is unfortunate that it now suffers because of the times and people's preferences that are less inclined towards the sector. It is important to revisit our love for such products. After all, it was through this very factor that our independence was achieved. Uh, finally, Dr. Lalita Agarwal's uh, paper on spirituality and its uh, uh, revival puts the frosting on the cake for this session. Uh, these are desperate times, and while we can only do our part by staying in and staying safe, there is not much that we can do except to rely on agents besides ourselves to keep us strong. This has been a very informative session indeed, and I look forward to more in the times to come. Uh, thank you, all of you, uh, my dear colleagues, and your uh, expertise and your knowledge in various fields have immensely um, had an impact in today's session. So until then, uh, have a good day, and uh, we will meet and have more deliberations uh, when the situations will be fine. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ma yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Thank, okay. you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much, thank Shana. You. Okay. And thank you to yes. all the presenters. God bless you. Yes, thank you. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Care, it's okay, no? Fine. Care? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Yeah. yeah okay. Thank yeah, you. Yes, Have a nice day. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Fine. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning. Good morning. So uh, we are here for the another day of the national webinar on the theme celebrating India at 75. So in this uh, technical session, I am the chairperson and uh, we have five paper presenters. They are Ms. Venetia Grace Walang, Department of Education, Sunat College. We have Dr. S. Maxwell Lingdor from Martin Luther Christian University, Dr. Persara Lingdo, also from Synod College, Assistant Professor. Then Ms. Finley E. J. Singai, who's from the Department of Sociology, St. Edmunds College. Then Ms. Bulsilian Lingdo Mauflang, who's also from the uh, Department of Kasi, Shankardev College, Shillong. So hopefully everyone is there. And uh, in this session, uh, wonderful papers I can see. The title is really, really interesting. In fact, all of them. We will be dealing right from life skills in the classrooms to career counseling to, in fact, uh, some kind of um, uh, some kind of a human subject, and then also emerging food culture and cultural 
heritage and tourism in Meghalaya. So therefore, I would like to, without wasting much time, in fact, and I would also want to request everyone, just as we have been instructed by the organizers, that there will be only 10 minutes given to the paper presenters. So hopefully you keep your time. And uh, maybe I may just remind you uh, just one minute before so that you can wind up and conclude. So please be brief. So first of all, I would like to call upon Ms. Venetia Grace Walang to do her presentation. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, am I audible? Hello, can you hear me, ma'am? Uh, not, yes, yes, yes. Okay, okay. With your permission, may I now present my PowerPoint? Can you see my slide, ma'am? Ma'am, can you see my slide? I can see your slide, Vinisha. Okay. Go ahead. Yes, okay. So, uh, good morning, everyone, respected chairperson, Professor Karbi Rumbai. Thank you for giving me this opportunity to present my paper. Warm greetings to my fellow paper presenters and to all the participants present here. My name is Vanessa Griswala. I'm here to present my paper titled Revisiting the Quality of Indian Education by Introducing Life Skills Education in Classroom. This paper that I'm about to present is a conceptual paper and will focus on the different life skills that can be incorporated in our classroom's activities so that our students can be equipped with the right skills. So now I go on to the introduction. Uh, we are all living in a busy world, including a toddler who has just joined kindergarten. We are so busy sometimes, so engrossed in this busy world that we tend to forget to live our lives and that too, quality lives. It is infamous to do so that one's life can be a frustrating one. Now, when we look at our educational setup, we have to start questioning ourselves as educators. Does our educational system provide our students with quality education? Now, when we look at today's educational system, it is very much lopsided as it provides more of knowledge related concepts rather than skills. Now, our present day life is getting very complicated. In fact, day by day, we need more than just simple knowledge. Now, the quality of life, when we look at what is this quality of life, when we, when we talk about quality of life, we talk about having a good physical health. We need to participate in various activities. We need to enjoy every context and situation. If we forget to live a quality life, it is because we lack skills. So we need skills that can help us to tackle our daily problems in an effective and efficient manner. Now, looking at definition given by the World Health Organization, in the year 1944, it defined life skills as the abilities for adaptive and positive behavior that enable individuals to deal effectively with the demands and challenges of everyday life. Now, when, when we look at this definition, it clearly emphasizes on the competency of a person to be flexible and to remain positive in our behavior towards the challenges of our daily life. Now, staying positive in this negative world is important as this will help our mental well-being. It is when our mental well-being is healthy that we can have a balanced personality. Now, going more further, the World Health Organization came up with 10 basic life skills, as you can see in the screen. They are as follows. The self-awareness, then empathy, critical thinking, creative thinking, decision-making, problem-solving, effective communication, interpersonal relationship, coping with stress and coping with emotions. Now, let us further look at the definition given by the UNICEF in the year 2008. Now, UNICEF too has defined life skills as a behavior change 
and a behavior development approach designed to address a balance of these three areas. That is your knowledge, attitude, and skills. Now, looking at this knowledge, attitude, and skill, as you all can see there, that the skill that we have will lead to our competencies. Now, when a child or when a student, or me and you for that matter, when we are competent, when we look there, we have the ability to use that acquired skill in a more efficient and effective manner. Now, many a times, a lot of students, they have knowledge about many things, but their attitude still remain the same. Now, the question is, why so? This is because, like you can see there, the knowledge, attitude, and skills. It is because they lack the right skill to tackle the problem. Now, when we wish to bring about a behavior change in our students, we need to tackle these three aspects, that is the knowledge, the attitude, and skill. Now, so coming back to the term uh, positive behavior, it is important because we need to create a positive outlook and approach in our students. Because when we create a positive outlook in our students, the working environment, the studying environment, the living environment for that matter, can be healthy and can be happy to be in. Positive environment can also lead them to teamwork. And sometimes when we look at our system, teamwork is what it is lacking in our educational system. Now, when we equip our students with life skills, we help them to overcome life challenges uh, so that they can solve their problem, especially when they finish their formal education. Because when we look at uh, the real life, many a time students, they cannot make meaning out of this world that they live. Because what they studied in their formal education is not what they experience in their everyday life. So now we need to bridge uh, the gap of these two, that is the theoretical knowledge and the practical experiences. And what we need is the bridge, the, bri the name of this bridge is actually life skills. Now, uh, let us look at the different life skills as you can see in the screen. The 10 core life skills which has been identified by the World Health Organization, the, the 10, 10 core life skills is subdivided into three more, that is social skills, thinking skills and coping skills. Now, one by one, we will look at them so that we can understand at how these life skills can help uh, uh, the students and how we can inculcate them into our classrooms. Okay. Now, when, when, uh, when we look at how life skills can be designed, they can be designed carefully in our classroom so that we can facilitate learning, so that we use participatory learning methods, so that, um, uh, and these participatory learning methods, they are based on our social learning process. Um, for example, now, when we, when we give life skills in our classroom, we can include group work, we can include discussion, debates, storytelling, peer-supported learning, and practical community development projects. Now, now look at uh, social skills. When we look at social skills, the first life skill that we have to inculcate in a classroom is self-awareness. Now, when we help our students to become self-aware, our students will be able to, to have the ability to introspect themselves. They will be able to analyze, to accept their own thoughts, their own actions, their own feelings, and to recognize why they feel so. By having self-awareness, it will really help them to understand themselves. Now, if we inculcate effective communication in them, our students will be able to express themselves both verbally and non-verbally. Now, when we look at empathy, empathy is the ability to be sensitive to another person's situation, to imagine what life is like for another person. Now, when we inculcate interpersonal relationship with them, our students will be more positive in the manner. They will be able to interact. They will be able to keep friendly relationships. Continue now, when we, oh, now, when oh. we go to thinking skills, the critical thinking skills is the ability to analyze information. Yes, ma'am. Uh, can you please wind up? Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes. So now when we look at all these skills, the think, uh, yeah. uh, social skills, thinking skills, and the coping skills, okay. when we calculate them, we will understand with this Dallas Commission in 1966 when he speaks about the four pillars of learning. That is learning to know, learning to do, learning to be, learning to live together. When our students are able to know themselves, when they're able to do something with their psychomotor domain, they're able to be a good person, they will be able to live together. 
in togetherness. And now who needs life skills? All of us needs, the young ones, all of us, so that we can be more adjustable, um, we will develop in different aspects. And also we need to teach them in the classroom so that they can solve their problems, so that they can delay the onset of tobacco uh, and drugs, and so that they can balance them themselves. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Venetia, for the wonderful paper. And I think life skill is very important now. So we will be picking up all the papers and discuss at the end. Uh, first, we give time to the paper presenters so that we can uh, present efficiently. And later on, maybe we pick up the questions. All right. So now next, can we have um, Dr. S. Maxwell Lingdor from Martin Luther Christian University. His paper is on sustaining education, incorporating career counseling in the curriculum of school teachers in Meghalaya. Uh, Maxwell, you also have 10 minutes. So sure, ma'am. Kindly, kindly start. Yeah, thank you so much. Very good morning to everyone present. Um, my paper is on sustaining education, incorporating career counseling in the curriculum for school teachers in Meghalaya. Ma'am, I hope you, uh, you're able to see my slide, ma'am. Uh, yes, I can see. All right. But, I, I would like okay. to take this, this opportunity to thank the organizing members of the Senior College for accepting my paper to be presented in this uh, webinar for on the theme uh, Celebrating India at 75. The introduction, when we look at the current scenario of the education uh, system in, in India, we come to realize that uh, things has really changed from what it used to be in the past years, in the past decades, as compared to what it is now. The national education policy has uh, made it uh, compulsory and mandatory to have equipped career counselors uh, and counselors in all educational institutions in the country. Uh, the counsellors are uh, uh, supposed to be addressing uh, issues ranging from life skills to mental health and career guidance for the students in the institute. Uh, I'm going to the third uh, slide. Here, uh, when we're looking at uh, the career counselling, we're, we're looking at uh, the uh, facility, the support that is provided to the students, which ranges, which ranges from choices of subjects in secondary grades, including vocational subjects and choices in higher education, uh, which would lead to potential career uh, choices. Uh, now, when we look at the current scenario, what happens is uh, though the education uh, policy has uh, made it mandatory for counselors to be uh, employed in all educational institutions. However, when we look at the uh, practical uh, aspect of it, I don't know how much of this is possible because it has a financial implications. It has investment uh, to be made for infrastructure and most importantly for human resources and other needs, uh, needs uh, that has to be kept in mind. Um, now, when we look at uh, the role of the teachers, I think we all are familiar with the role of teachers uh, uh, based on our experiences and what we see uh, uh, the, the kind of roles that teachers are playing. The Ministry of Education, Gua uh, Guyana, in 2020 has, um, has uh, uh, pointed out in the role of the teachers in the classrooms in terms of being educators, in terms of being uh, mentors, in terms of uh, listening and talking to, uh, to students, and uh, most importantly, in gaining the trust, in gaining their... Um, their, uh, you know, in understanding them uh, better and uh, in enabling them to guide the students in a better way. Now, uh, I'll go on uh, mentioning about the role of the teachers a bit more. Uh, we are also looking at teachers, uh, you know, who are 
are also good motivators who encourage students, who inspire them, who, uh, who most importantly provide a lot of guidance to the students. Okay, and here we are looking at students in terms of uh, you know those who are in the primary and higher secondary, a uh, secondary and higher secondary level, uh, whereby they look up to the teachers for all kind of guidance uh, in terms of personal or in terms of their career. Uh, the objective for this uh, for this uh, study is number one to look at the responses of the school teachers from the secondary and higher secondary on whether they understand the need uh, of career counselling in schools. The second is to look at school teachers if they would like to take up a certificate course or any kind of a training in career counselling as part of skills enhancement to be able to assist students with relevant career guidance and career counselling. Um, so when we look at the methodology, uh, I'll just briefly mention, uh, I have taken the, the um, uh, descriptive cross-sectional study design in which I've used purposive uh, sampling design. And then uh, I'll go back directly to the respondents. Uh, I, I have included uh, included around 80 respondents of uh, in the study, uh, and th uh, these included uh, teachers from uh, all across uh, from schools all across Shillong. And uh, during the, the the data collection, I have uh, specifically instructed the principals of the schools to hand over the questionnaire to uh, teachers from various backgrounds, from various educational backgrounds, those who are te teaching in uh, secondary, higher secondary, in primary, uh, so that we, are, we could get a uh, uh, better input, a better sharing from these teachers uh, who are who have been dealing with students for a long period of time and who knows exactly what are the kind of needs uh, that these students require. I'll go directly to uh, the findings. So, uh, when we're looking at the first uh, uh, the first uh, figure, um, so uh, I asked uh, the teachers uh, whether career counselling was organised in the school at any point of time. Uh, Seventy-three of percent of them said yes, which means that they have an idea of what career counselling is all about, and they also know how uh, how it has helped the the students uh, in their particular schools. The second figure is about. Um, uh, the level of career counselling and guidance that uh, is supposed to be provided for the teach uh, for the students, and here I have given the option of class six onwards, which is only fourteen percent. Uh, class nine onwards, uh, I got the responses of eighty one percent, which uh, which uh, seems to suggest that career counselling is something that is required for the students right from class nine onwards. Okay, it's, it's, it's not something that we wait for class 10 or 11 and 12, but it should be provided as early as class 9 onwards. I'm going to the third figure now, uh, which talks about the importance of career counselling for the students in today's context. Uh, uh, almost all of the, uh, there was a 100% response from the teachers that yes, career counselling is very much important for the students in, uh, in today's uh, uh, educational system. I'm going to the fourth figure, which talks about career counselling should be conducted very routinely by experts, uh, uh, experts and trained career counsellors. There was a 95% responses from the teachers. This also means to suggest that uh, career counselling is not a one-time uh, kind of an affair. It has to be conducted time and again. There has to be follow up on the on the students. Uh, to know about their aspirations, to know about their aims, because uh, if you look at the interests, if you look at the kind of potentials that they have, it keeps changing from time to time as 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 an individual grows, as an individual becomes mature, as an individual uh, is exposed to many other career options in his or her life. Hence, career counselling should be conducted by trained career counsellors, number one, and there should be a constant follow-up with them. I'm going to the, to the next... Um, uh, figure which talks about recommended school to have trained career counsellors to assist students. Uh, Ninety-two percent of them said yes. So, uh, like I said, um, we we do need someone who is in the school. We do need someone who are familiar with the students. We do need someone who uh, wears 
students can actually go and uh, knock the door and speak to them every time they have a kind of a confusion, every time they have, uh, you know, they encounter any kind of uh, family pressure, societal uh, uh, society, uh, pressure from the society society uh, in relation to the career. Okay, so th these kind of uh, confusions and clarifications can be made time and again if they have a full-time co career counselor in the school, uh, you know, which which uh, they can use, which students can use the service uh, in, in a big way. Um, I'm going to the next figure, which talks about the career counseling as a growing field, uh, 84 percent said yes, it is a growing field, Dr. which Mata, also implies have... that teachers are aware that. You yes, have uh, one minute, please. Sure. Uh, so uh, the teachers have expressed that yes, they are aware that career counseling can be taken up. Uh, it can be taken up professionally as a career. Uh, I'm going to the next which talks about opting for a career a certificate in career counseling teachers are aware that you know uh, there is a possibility for teachers to be uh, to be uh, to opt uh, certificate courses diploma courses postgraduate uh, diploma uh, in career counseling for the teachers who wants to pursue it uh, in a big way i will go to the conclusion directly that, that talks about um the need to have career counseling for all the teach uh, for all the schools it is the need of the r uh, because that is how we get to uh, you know question the aspirations the 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 aims and uh, uh, of the students in which direction they would like to know uh, to would like to go to facilitate a better career preparedness uh, i would also like to conclude uh, by saying that perhaps the uh, uh, the institutions which offer B Ed and M Ed can incorporate comprehensive program consisting of career counseling components, which which the uh, the candidates can opt either as an optional paper or can opt as a specialization. Because at the end of the day, though the schools cannot provide full time career counselors, but can use the human resource of the teachers to be trained in career counseling and hence continue the service for the students. Uh, lastly, just like the Calcutta High Court has uh, given uh, an order that career counsellors should be there in all the schools of West Bengal, I think in Meghalaya we can do the same, whereby we can have uh, our teachers to be uh, to also be facilitators in career counselling. With this, I come to the end of my paper. Thank you so much, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, everyone, for listening. Thank you, Dr. Maxwell, uh, for this wonderful paper. In fact, uh, I can see that this is a very important issue now, not only in uh, West Bengal, I think in all the states in Meghalaya, we can come up in a big way in terms of career counselling. And your findings have also shown that everyone is uh, requiring, they're wanting this career counselling in school. So anyway, we'll discuss about this later. Thank you so much. Now I would want to uh, call upon... Thank you so much. I would want to call upon Ms. Finlay E. J. Smai from Assistant Professor and Head Department of Sociology, St. Andrews College, Geelong. Are you there? Uh, yes. Yes, ma'am. Can you hear me, ma'am? Yes, yes. So uh, kindly go ahead with the presentation because we are running short of time. You will be getting 10 minutes, so kindly be brief. Thank you. Okay, ma'am. A very good morning to Madam Chairperson, fellow presenters, and everyone. I am Ms. Finley Singh Ai, and my paper is uh, on emerging food culture with special reference to Northeast India. The caption, India at 75, implies a growing and changing India. It suggests a comparative study of the Indian society then and now. Being inevitable in nature, change is bound to enter and affect all aspects of life and society. Social change, by definition, refers to any alterations as occur in the structure and function of society. Social change also refers to the modifications which occur in the life patterns of people. These two definitions points to the two types of social change, directed or planned, and non-directed or unplanned. Directed social change refer to the deliberate attempt to alter any social situation in a desired way. Non-directed change appears spontaneously, unprecedentedly, without any specific date of origin or end. The magnitude of such changes is large, 
and the impact is also great. This is a community change. It is unpredictable and shows chain reaction. When India gained independence, sociologists observed tremendous changes occurring in the patterns of life and behavior of the people. Srinivas and Yogendra Singh, to name a few, saw this overwhelming trend and offered reformulations and provided a paradigmatic and precise way to understand the process of change. Other than the synchronized changes affected in established institutions like economics, politics, education, etc., this was to include every way of acting, thinking, and feeling, as these are the social facts. Comprehensiveness is gained when these are treated as communicative dialogue of change in society. Coming to social change in Northeast India, we have to take account of regional political change religious, linguistic, economic, educational, healthcare, and demographic changes appearing as a result of policy and planning. The introduction of new ideas, work culture, greater exposure, connectivity, travel, communication, media, technology, conflicts, movements, migration, urbanization, cross-cultural marriages, growth of class consciousness have changed the traditional character or face of Northeast in the eyes of the world. Out of all the changes that are observed in various fields, this paper will focus on the changes in the area of food, that is, the food habit and food culture, with emphasis on Northeast India and in particular, the East Khasi Hills district of Meghalaya. This selective approach appears as the promising path for a merit exploration as we look at our society as India turns 75. Why food? Food is basic to survival. Food provides a privileged approach to social representation through which the dynamics of change can be apprehended. This is one area of life that affects all and perhaps an area where we have either knowingly or unknowingly engaged in. The sociology of food study food as it relates to the history, progression, and future development of society and takes into account the method of food production, preparation, consumption, distribution, cultural and ritual meaning, labor, conflict, medicinal use, environment, and status issues related to food. The arrival of new food in the region, the growth and popularity of food joints and restaurants over the years have revolutionized the concept of food altogether. The method of its preparation, consumption, value and significance have changed in an alarming way. Food structures reflect the organization of human groups and emerges as a core subject for sociological studies. Food history can reflect an integral aspect in the journey for survival of any given group. Thus, food is understood in different ways by different people. It is linked to the identity of a group. It is a symbolic medium of culture. Before embarking on that discussion, let us consider food to mean anything that is consumed to quench hunger and thirst. The Oxford Dictionary defined food as any nutritious substance taken to maintain life and growth. Food will be used in a broad sense to include alcoholic beverages as well, since they result from different culinary treatment. The same grain can become rice, snacks, or rice beer, depending on the technique applied. This reflects creativity and richness of food culture. Food is a form of material culture. It is an embodied form of material culture, carefully prepared, and immediately destroyed through the transformative process of ingestion. Given that eating is a social act that is repeated daily, the culturally coded sense of taste is developed simultaneously. The traditional foods consumed by the tribes of the region are intimately connected to virtually all aspects of their social and cultural as well as spiritual life and health. They depended on shifting cultivation, and they depended on their indigenous knowledge on plant use and forest management. Rich in plant diversity, many ethnic vegetables and plants 
rich in nutrition and compatible to culture are used in their diet. While plants, roots, mushroom, and certain non-vegetarian foods are collected for sustainable survival of families and tribe, women knew the art of food conservation. The collected items are either conserved in the soil or smoked or fermented for nutritional and food security. Kitchen gardens were popular. Sharing of food items, cooked or uncooked, was common. For example, the Adis of Arunachal Pradesh share food at the community level during the Etar, the Solong, and the Arang festivals. Fermentation is very common, and the food items that are used throughout the region, though the process of fermentation is different and the name of the food item is uh, you know, known by different uh, names, the common items are soybean seeds, bamboo shoot, fish, tobacco, and of course, the brewing of rice beer. Food was mainly boiled, oil was not in use, except for some animal fats. It is often said that food ways are among the most conservative and persistent aspects of culture. Like most truisms, this turns out to be true, but not entirely false either. Due to the intervention of modern crop varieties, materialistic life, current trend towards increasing use of commercial process. Mr. Finley, kindly wind up, okay? Yes, ma'am. Uh, exposure to modern life sophistication and transformations has been radical. People have moved from a diet in which the majority of nutrients are drawn from local food to more generic diet of store-bought food and fried items. Fast food restaurants, joint food joints have invaded the and affected the age-old food habits. Younger generation are less familiar to traditional food items and methods of preparation, conservation, and fermentation. Examples of avid adoption of new food has got to the point of it becoming indigenized to be considered as a part of daily diet. Example price. Familiarity and preference of new food is taken to be a mark of modernity and cultural exposure. In 1988, a survey was conducted to analyze this trend in Police Bazaar, and the findings showed that dining out, treating friends, preference for Chinese, Indian, and continental dishes was on the rise. Today, there are about 50 food joints in Lime Kra area alone. The intersecting networks of kinship affiliation, social categories, class, and status group membership explains such adoptions. Demand for new food and practices vary according to social category of the people. Food choice mark internal distinctions and boundaries of group. Thus, nutritional values of traditional cuisine, fermented and non-fermented items, method of preparation, preservation, fermentation, and production needs to be revived. The slow food movement or method of preparation must be revived along with the conscious effort to protect the indigenous knowledge property of the tribes. Food sovereignty can then be assured for the tribes as well. Thus, food is a channel for social and cultural change. Food aids the negotiation of social interaction in various ways, and they structure perception of the social world in the modern times. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Finley, for that uh, wonderful presentation on uh, food, emerging food culture, with special reference to Northeast India. And uh, now, without wasting much time, we will discuss about this after the next presentation. Now, without wasting much time, I would like to call upon our next paper presenter, Ms. Bulsilian Lingdo Maupplang, Assistant Professor, Department of Khasi, Shankardev College, Shillong. She's going to enlighten us on um, cultural and heritage tourism in Meghalaya, a case study, a case of Khasi Jaintia Hills region. Are you there? Okay, you can. You also have 10 minutes, so please uh, try to wind up within 10 minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chairperson, for your kind introduction. I'm a bit good morning. I'm very much thankful to the college for organizing this webinar in collaboration with the Department of Arts and Culture, Government of Meghalaya. And the topic of my presentation is Cultural and Heritage Tourism in Meghalaya, a case of Khasi Jaintia region. Tourism in Meghalaya is at its nascent stage. It has been observed that local populations of the state have themselves been quite mobile. Such movements took place because of various reasons like work festivities, sightseeing, medical purposes, and so on. 
as a result of which different types and forms of tourism like agro tourism eco tourism cultural tourism etc took place as classified by various experts in the field from tourism point of view people from outside the state visited meghalaya shillong region in particular because of its natural beauty climate festivals natural vegetation etc clearly if many people visit the state regularly in large number tourism potential of meghalaya is definitely huge if this potential is tapped fully the state may transform itself from low to high income state like goa and sikkim it is a fact that india is a land of many languages cultures and religions it is therefore known as the land of beauty and diversity traces of different cultures can easily be seen and found in the form of music festivities traditional beliefs language custom food habits etc it is the development of these aspects of life that makes india a land of rich cultural heritage in this article i only try to highlight some limited aspect of tourism in the khasi jaja hills region of the state as we all know cultural and heritage tourism is among the various types of tourism which makes people move from place to place because of religious reasons and festivals of different communities in the country to be more specific in meghalaya there are a lot of such festivities undertaken by the make by the people since ancient times these were the basis of the khasi jaja traditions and the various festivities are directly related with people's belief on the importance of the mother nature certain aspect of khasi culture that we the local people may be proud of now are undoubtedly the sacred grove culture and monolithic culture besides several others the honorable prime minister of india sri narendra modi also stressed on the need that the way india moves forward is by taking the best of tradition and the modern global outlook into consideration in meghalaya there are several aspects of their cultural heritage which are of a great value for all of us today for example the concept of sacred grove is nothing short of a reflection of the divine connection that man on earth has such heritage also reflects that man knows how to respect and be kind to both plant life and animal life nobody will deny that the values of plant life are still more important for us in this digital era for the need of more oxygen the limited areas of this paper are the mauklang sacred grove natyang monolith and the nokran dance of kima khairim mauklang sacred grove the point to be noted here is that the early humans everywhere in the world would understand quite well how man depends on plant life and animals of various types for their food and for their survival itself later on when fire was invented humans became more intelligent too and the most powerful among the animals the use of fire made them the supreme pressure on earth this had led to many good things happening all around in man's life it brought with a lot of destructive activities too like wildfire unnecessary destruction of forest areas and so on visionary leaders among the khasis since long time ago could realize this danger of mass destruction of forests and various natural resources this might be one of the reason probably that we have various type of forest area in our region including the protected forests such as lawlingdo lawkentang law adong which may together be classed as sacred groves mauklang sacred grove locally known as lawlingdo mauklang is one of them it represents one of the most important feature of the khasi community it also reflects that forests and forest resources are part and parcel of the khasi traditional religious belief system since the ancient times the management and protection of this sacred forest lies in the hands of the darbar khatakur led by the lingdo or the chief of the lingdo mauklang from tourism point of view being one of the oldest natural vegetation well protected and found in this part of the country the sacred grove fits the bill of a heritage tag and no explanation is required about its cultural significance as it is part and parcel of the rituals performed by the lingdo for the welfare of the people within the lingdo ship in other words if one talks about any aspect of khasi culture or khasi cultural heritage mauklang sacred grove is without doubt among the few prominent things that would trigger his or her mind first of all in brief celebrating 75 years of india's independence will not be complete 
if the importance of the gift of nature, like Mauplam Sacred Grove, is forgotten even in this digital era because of the following reason. It stands tall as habitat to many living things, both plant and animal life. It is of great social values in today's highly individual, individualistic society. It is of great religious values to mankind as it symbolizes the creation of God himself. It is a place that attracts tourists from far and wide because of several reasons. Some people visited it for some serious research works. Many others visited it for sightseeing. Still many others visited it for fun and for picnic purposes. Last but not the least, it is a great example for the people of other villages and urban centers to emulate for the healthy and clean environment. Nakyam monoliths in Meghalaya, monoliths exist throughout the length and breadth of Kasi and Chancha Hills. However, the biggest collection of monoliths in one single place is found in Nakyam village. The tallest stone were erected single-handedly by Umar Kalinki, the trusted lieutenant of the Chancha King. The other stones were erected by Umar Kalinki and various clans inhabited at Nakyam village between 1500 AD and 1835 AD. It is quite famous because of the cluster of monoliths, which are among the tallest anywhere in the world. The tallest is as high as 8 meters, 2 meters wide, and 46 centimeters thick. These monoliths have been of great attraction to the people, people from other states and international stories alike. Teachers of various schools and colleges took their respective students to this place for a field trip or educational tour to have first-hand knowledge of this cultural heritage left behind by the Dentia Bishan Greek leader. Nongkrem dance of Kahima Khairan, the Pomblang and Kashad Hima Khairan. Nongkrem dance is the annual ceremonial dance organized by Kahima Khairan and held at Smith. It is called Nongkrem dance because it was held at Nongkrem village in the earlier days of Kahima Khairan. It is one of the most important annual festivals of Hazis. It is a five-day annual religious festival celebrated with much traditional form and deity. This festival is celebrated as a ceremonial annual thanksgiving to God, the Almighty, for the good harvest and to pray for peace and prosperity of Ikhun Kihaja. The same who is the administrative head of the Hima, the same Saad, the ministries, the Lindo Asoblai, the Duhalia, and the people in general all join together in this festival, which is a rhythmic form of prayers for the well-being of all. In the words of Paim's aim, Dr. Balajit's aim, the aim of this Hima, Hima Khairim has always been a bastion of Khasi culture. The Pomblang and Chat Hima Khairim has been organized in the same manner for hundreds of years, even before the earliest recorded years of undivided Hima Shalom, that is pre-1831 AD. The dances, the music, the rituals, all have remained the same. Again, according to Pan Hok Shila, Hello, you have only one minute, okay? Okay. Please wind up. Kapomblang and Kashar Kima Khairib is today the only Khasi festival that is a social, cultural, political, and religious event and all role in one. As a teacher and a member of Khasi community, I feel strongly that each one of us, the present generation, have tremendous duty and responsibility towards a better society, community development, of pollution free environment. Kasi society has proved to the world that Kasi value system and democratic structure have been well established since ancient times and passed on successfully to us now rather smoothly in the form of traditional institution, traditional belief and wisdom formally associated with modern nature. So with modern nature in mind, Conclusion may be made in following few lines. It is quite satisfying to note that the Kasi traditional values and wisdom are still prevalent among the members of the community. They would be strong base upon which tourism potential of the state can develop upon. It has been observed that the state government has taken certain initiatives to develop the tourism industry in the recent past. However, more concerted efforts have to be made in this regard. It would be proper for the government to have a policy in place so that tourism infrastructure are made strong. The policy may well consider public participation in all tourism projects because the sense of belonging and ownership makes everyone responsible, which is necessary for any project to succeed. Thank you. Thank you so much. So I think uh, 
we have come to the end of all the paper presenters. There, there were four presentations today, and uh, all of them have really given a lot of inputs regarding the papers. Okay, and uh, now uh, I would just like to give my view first uh, regarding the papers. First of all, um, regarding Ganesha's paper, uh, which was on revisiting quality of Indian education by uh, introducing life skills. So I felt that uh, it was a very nice paper, very informative. A lot of uh, issues, in fact, had also come up regarding life skills. And this is very important. Life skills are very important, as you can see, uh, even by the government also, it's been emphasized to now that we do not only need only one type of education, we need to have various type of skills embedded in us. It could be a computer skill, it could be, you know, data analytics or anything like that, which will enhance us to go ahead in life. And then that also helps us in employment. Uh, we get employment faster if we are equipped, well equipped with life skills. So uh, one thing I, uh, about this paper is that, you know, you have given a lot of emphasis on how it can be designed in the classroom, all right? How it can be designed in the classroom. So, um, and another one, uh, I think the questions will be given, taken up by, by the others. Vanisha, you saw in the chat box, uh, there's a question for you. Uh, if you can see the chat box. Uh, this question is given by Amanda Parir, and she says that how can life skills be used among students in college? So can you answer that? Yes, thank you. Amanda Pariyat, are you there? Amanda Pariyat, are you there? Uh, yes, ma'am. All right. Uh, actually, yes, ma'am. Yes. Uh, when we look at life skills, actually, the, uh, the best time to inculcate life skills is actually during the formative years of a child. So we can inculcate uh, in that many years. So generally, when they go to college level and when they have not developed these life skills at a very young age, it becomes very difficult for college-going students to start developing self-awareness and critical thinking. That is why it is always advised to develop uh, life skills at a, a very formative years, right from childhood when they learn to even tie their shoe and to even comb their hair. Even that also requires a lot of life skills because they, they need to use these skills and solve their problem. But nevertheless, we cannot say that even at a college level, we cannot help them to form life skills. But yes, it is always best to, to form at a very, very young age. I hope I've answered your question, Amanda. Yes, Amanda, yes. are you... Yes, 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 right? ma'am. Uh, All yes. right. Uh, yeah. okay. You can add if you have anything to say. Uh, yes. I just want to know that because like if in the schools, uh, they, we just have a certain number of students, maybe 30 to 40, but then amongst the uh, college students, we have around 100 plus uh, students in a class. So if the, it, it, like, can you just suggest some yeah. ways and means maybe, maybe, maybe one Maybe you two. can do something like a debate. Maybe you can do discussion and divide them into team. That is what I do in my class. Uh, because like in the school level, maybe they have come from a school whereby they have never been a team work. They have never uh, initiated doing critical thinking because they always thought critical thinking means to, to always uh, have in a negative manner. But that is not true. Uh, because uh, people would every time use the word criticize, they think criticize is not a good word. But actually that's not true. We help them to criticize a very critical manner to look at a thing whether I should do it, I should not do it. You know, for example, even if you look at this COVID situation now, a lot of people have the hearsay that COVID is not real. But I think many deaths that occur actually, it, it's it's not true. You know, the way people are thinking that deaths are just fake, all this government, all this blah blah blah. But then, when you really have critical thinking skills, you will start. Uh, thinking in a very uh, uh, analytical manner, whether really COVID is present. If that is the case, I mean, sorry to say, I've lost my father just two weeks back, you know. So it, it was really shocking for me. And I started believing it more. And not that I don't take care, I do. But I started telling people that, you know, you, you shouldn't just take it very lightly because I know what that is like to have in a family. So for you all, you just, uh, every day you put in a status, this and that. I keep telling my students, even if you don't believe, it's all right. Just stay safe. 
because now it is more of a collective manner because if you are ill the entire society will be ill as well so um, yeah you can do debates you can do a, a, a storytelling even at a college level you can even do discussion demonstration all this you can actually inculcate uh, life skills even at a college level never done the less yeah, thank you, Amanda. I uh, thank you, uh, Venetia. I'm so sorry for your loss. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, thank, you yes. thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you so much, Amanda and uh, Dr. Venetia. Uh, now, uh, anyone else? Anyone else wants to ask questions to Venetia so that uh, if not, we can go to the next one? Dr. Maxwell, anyone? All right. So, uh, Dr. Maxwell, uh, thank you so much for your paper. It was really, really, you know, insightful. You had uh, spoken at large on career counseling, and uh, we know it is very important now. And uh, looking into our schools, uh, everyone knows that is, it is important, but I don't know why no one is doing anything about it. Okay, it looks like the teachers are giving counseling, whereas the teachers cannot actually give counseling because we are not trained for that. We can just be guided, give guidance, but we cannot give counseling. We are not trained. All right, we need to have a trained counselor and we need to know uh, at which level the child actually wants to deviate away to the, to the different courses, especially maybe at the after class 10 or maybe while joining 11 and 12. Uh, they, uh, some maybe even after 12, they are not interested to go for higher education and would like to go for some kind of professional course, which they feel it is interesting and would, would, uh, would, they would be earning well. Employability also is good. So I feel that is it's a very important paper. And uh, even teachers also can help maybe, but not actually be a counselor, like what you said. They need to go for some type, type of a crash course or a certificate course before they can actually counsel the students, right? So uh, anyone uh, here who wants to just, you know, maybe highlight on this point or maybe just discuss on this issue, or give your old inputs, or maybe have a question for Dr. Maxwell, you are free to do so. So I don't see anything in the chat box also. So anyway, uh, Dr. Maxwell, thank you so much. So uh, now going to the next paper presenter, Ms. Finlay E.J. Sangai. Uh, your paper was on emerging food culture. Uh, with special reference to Northeast India. And um, it was a wonderful uh, presentation with a lot of inputs regarding food. Uh, we know we are all foodies, uh, most of us, and going to different places, different regions, we would like to know more about the food. And uh, of course, uh, food also refers to, you know, the different practices that uh, and the culture and the tradition which is there in place, uh, how we cook the food, how we eat it, you know. Uh, and it also depends on how we are raised up. You know, if you're raised up and eating a particular type of food and then uh, you cannot change it maybe as you you have already, you know, grown to a particular age where you feel you can go in for some other type of a cuisine or other type of food. I don't know, for me, it is very difficult. So I felt like, uh, you know, a lot of input was give, given regarding food, culture, society, and how climate, land, and then uh, and also natural resources, they all have access to this food and culture. And of course, um, you have also emphasized on the role of women. Uh, because uh, when we talk about uh, food, we, we feel it's, it's a woman in the kitchen, all right? But I don't think that should be important. I think nowadays the men are also very good cooks. Uh, you know, I have uh, four boys in the house. Uh, my sons, uh, they cook better than me. So uh, they prefer cooking and, you know, giving me, uh, laying a dish for me. So I feel that that should be there, of course. Uh, but from ancient time, the role of women has been always there with, related with food. A very good input you have given. And uh, of course, uh, the social role of food also. Society also is very important. How you can see the different societies, how they give importance to the food. OK, so um, that was a very good presentation. And, you know, we got a lot of insight from your paper.
and uh, I would request anyone here if you would like to add up or if you would like to, you know, uh, have some queries with uh, Finlay regarding this uh, her paper on uh, food culture. May I now? Yes, Vanisha, please come Actually, in. I don't have a question to Nam Finley, but I just want to add on what she was saying. The paper was very good at one point. I started imagining a lot of food, actually. <laughs> yeah, so then she, she mentioned the word creativity, which I really like. So, you know, coming back to what Amanda was just asking the question, I think this is very important also. She, she, she actually, you can look at it, that she was talking about food, but she's actually inculcating life skills in them to be creative. Because with the same grain, you can make a lot of things. So in her paper, I looked at it as she looked at livelihood skill in order to survive. And she also looked at the life skill, the creative thinking skills. So, you know, I was just thinking, like, uh, since Amanda was questioning about how can we do that to our college-going students. Because I think most of us, including myself, during the lockdown, I've learned to cook a lot of many food. So a lot of students nowadays, they don't know how to cook food. They like only fast food, YY and Maggie, you know. So like Nam was just telling about being creative. So I think this is one life skill that we can inculcate as well. Thank you, Nam. Yes, thank you. So much, Benisha, to add on. Finley, you would, would like to say anything? Uh, you know, it's just that, um, yeah, as we you know like just the basic concept about food like for instance tea tea for us especially like like our mother's generation and all it's always a tea or coffee always a hot beverage but now we have iced tea then cold coffee yes. you know, they're like, we are changing. Uh, we are changing. yeah changing so these are just like some of the few things that i thought is interesting that we should be aware as we look at our society you know india turning 75 Thank you so much, ma'am. True, true. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, now uh, we have, uh, in fact, the last paper presenter who had given, you know, shared her concepts regarding uh, regarding this uh, cultural and heritage tourism in Meghalaya. So this is also very important. You know, you have shared a lot of important uh, inputs regarding tourism and heritage. And uh, of course, how we would preserve this cultural tourism. You have shared so much important, so many, you know, ideas. And also you have given us a view regarding all the sacred groups okay in Meghalaya and of course the different dances which are there which are uh, you know people come uh, from outside to see all these cultural uh, dances which you know which is just one in place it cannot be seen anywhere else but only in Meghalaya so this I felt also is a very important paper and of course uh, the, the government should come up with certain policies regarding tourism but now with this point, at this point with COVID I know uh, tourism industry has really come down but obviously we will again come back, revive back and of course pub, uh, public participation is also very very important and uh, I would like to also add here that, you know, uh, regarding the sacred grooves, which you mentioned, okay, regarding the sacred grooves, we know it is there, but can tourists go there? I don't think they can go there, right? Can you, can you, uh, you know, enlighten us on that? We can't hear you. Yes, yes, ma'am. Yes, they yeah. can go there. Yes, I can. Can we go there? Yes. Okay. okay. Anything from there, they cannot cut trees or not. Because I remember going to the sacred grooves, as Mount Klang sacred groove, and uh, we we just had to see it from far. We were not allowed to enter or do anything like that of that sort. You can so I. Yeah, so I thought that why did I come so far? I could just see a forest over there, but I was not allowed to go in and even see anything there. All right. So I don't know about the others. That was quite some time back. So that's why I wanted to ask you the question. Can we actually go inside and, you know, see the place? Yes, yes, yes ma'am. You can go there. You can enter the sacred forest. Because Lutukai also is there. But you want you not to cut any block anything not block not all right there. 
Okay, okay. So this is a very important part also of our heritage and culture in Meghalaya. There are many, many sacred groups. Clans have, there are many clans uh, who have different sacred groups and we preserve it. It's a way of preservation and the ecosystem also grows because of this. So it's a wonderful presentation, uh, Bulsilian. And uh, now I would like to request anyone from here who have a query, who would uh, like to add on with her what she had said. Uh, maybe in the chat box, uh, someone has written, uh, ma'am, you mentioned that Mikalia need a policy. Are you referring to tourism policy? What exactly do you have in mind that should be included in the policy? Uh, I know we have a tourism policy in place, uh, but uh, maybe because even Bolsilian had spoken about this policy about regarding the government, I feel the policy which is in place, we don't know what exactly needs to be added on there so that, you know, the tourism industry becomes more vibrant, it attracts more tourists, and uh, not only that, we can also, you know, revive uh, whatever has been, you know, not portrayed in the tourism sector regarding our culture, regarding our heritage, and uh, why people, why should tourists come here? That is also a very important point. Most of them come here to see our cultural heritage, to see, to taste the food, and to see the place. So we should, in fact, give more emphasis on the culture and heritage of Meghalaya. That's what I felt, rather than just, you know, having beautification and all the other things. So uh, I think we are already across two minutes. We should be winding up by 12.15, it's 12.17 now. So I would like to thank uh, everyone here present at this point. All the paper presenters, the organizers, the principal of the college of Synod College, Dr. Richard Lingdo, the Dr. David Karshandi, who's been uh, very kind always, you know, and very, you know, uh, what to say. He's always been very much into organizing webinars and seminars and, uh, you know, good in this managing these type of forums. Uh, and of course, the others, uh, Dr. Ruben, Dr. Venetia, who's been a part of this. And many other faculties of Synod College, the non-teaching staff, the students, people behind who are not, you know, here. Thank you so much for organizing such a wonderful webinar at this point of time. In spite of COVID, we still had a wonderful uh, webinar. And um, also thank you for inviting me and giving me an opportunity to be the chairperson. Hope everything was okay. And uh, thank you all the participants who are here today and uh, in this platform. And wish you all the best. Uh, go ahead with the paper that you have presented. Maybe we can refine it more further if you want for publication. And thank you so much. Stay safe. And um, of course, lockdown, so stay at home. Thank okay. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So, I hope all the presenters are uh, uh, are in right now. Yeah. Congratulate right now. the uh, organizer yeah. uh, of this uh, but, seminar, but but seminar, and I've seen the feedback right? from yesterday's um, presentation. It is quite overwhelming. And I hope that even today's seminar also, each and every uh, session would be very fruitful as we, um, um, through this mode, as we look at uh, India's progress in the last uh, 75 years of its freedom from the different perspective. And I surely believe that yesterday's deliberation shed some light on the progress of uh, of india in the various uh, fields and and i'm sure we have also seen maybe some gaps which uh, still needs to be filled in some gaps which needs to be plugged in and uh, if uh, our leaders over the last uh, 75 years if they have done their job i feel that it is now our role, the present generation, to take India forward 
And as we also move into, you know, as we be part of this globalized uh, world, as we try to be part of um, fulfilling the sustainable development goals, I hope that uh, we will also do our part in ensuring that uh, India uh, progress will also help uh, the world to you know to obtain uh, to achieve the goals that has been laid down where India is also part of the signatory and uh, in uh, today's session we have five papers and looking at the title of the papers that are esteemed uh, academicians, scholars, and practitioners will be presenting. Uh, what uh, I notice is that uh, we be discussing more. On, we'll be discussing more on the economic uh, aspects. And what is interesting is that I noticed that the uh, that the papers would be throwing lights not only at the micro level, but even we have uh, a paper. I hope uh, which will shed light on the, um, the the national level. Then we have a paper that will uh, be discussing at the state level and also the district level. So uh, it's I'm sure this session will be very interesting because we will be getting you know uh, uh, information, getting you know work that has been done by all these scholars, the academicians, and as I said, the practitioner um, from their perspective. And uh, at uh, the outset, once again, uh, the organizers, well, they have meticulously organized the seminar uh, and they have planned it, uh, you know, to, I would say, to the best that they can. And so I also, um, as the uh, moderator, I would say, of this session. Uh, it is my duty to ensure that the uh, what the organize, organizers have planned to, you know, to um, um, it is my duty to ensure that all the presenters also stick to the time that has been given to you. And therefore, once again, uh, I would request all the presenters to stick to the timing that has been given, 10 minutes, and maybe two minutes before the end of the time, I will uh, give you a warning. And for the benefit of the listeners and also the participant, mm -hmm. I would request the paper presenters, maybe you can just very briefly talk about, you know, give an introduction and maybe talk about your objective Maybe if you have a methodology that you have uh, use in carrying out your, uh, uh, you know, in, in this presentation to give a brief introduction about the methodology and then maybe the, your findings and then your, the conclusion and your um, suggestion. So I hope uh, by doing that, by following this, um, this pattern, you'll be able to keep up with the time. So uh, I will be invite uh, the first presenter of today's uh, of this session. That is Ms. Badaya Hunlang Mauke from the Department of Economics at Anthony's, who is uh, presenting a joint paper with uh, Dr. Darisha Warthanke from the Economics Department, Department of uh, Department of Economics, Nehu, and the title of the paper is "Size and Sectoral Distribution of the Informal Manufacturing Sector, India and the Northeastern States." So, Ms. Badayhun, the time is yours. Please stick to the timing. And as I said, two minutes before the end, I will give you a warning for you to give your concluding remark and also suggestion. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Uh, good morning, everyone, respected chairperson, all fellow paper presenters and others. My name is Badaya Hunlang Maokheo, and the paper that I'm going to present is on size and sectoral distribution of the informal manufacturing sector, India and the Northeastern states. Well, this is a joint paper that I have been I have done along with uh, Dr. Darishi Shah Warthankyo, Assistant Professor, Department of Economics, Northeastern Hill University. 
So now I'm uh, straight away, I'm going to start uh, sharing my screen first. I hope I am audible to all. Yes, yes. Okay. Is the screen visible as well? If you can uh, maybe uh, enlarge the screen, that will be better for all the uh, participants. Uh, sir, I have done it in slideshow. For okay. me, it's already uh, like... Oh, uh, okay, okay. Okay, okay, you carry on, carry on. So, uh, uh, to begin to it, the informal sector has been growing in many developing countries of the world, which also includes India, whereby the presence of informal sector is conspicuous in terms, particularly in terms of employment as well as in number of enterprises. <clears throat> this has been observed in the field of manufacturing, in trade, as well as in construction. According to a recent paper by Opel, within the manufacturing sector, a sizable proportion of workers is in the informal manufacturing sector. Also, as per the 73rd National Sample Survey Office report, it has been observed that from all the unincorporated non-agricultural enterprises, of in total, 31% belongs to the manufacturing sector. Also, more, it has been generally be observed that when we look at the productivity of enterprises in the informal sector, they are usually very low productivity of low productivity compared to their formal counterpart. This has been more so in the case of uh, enterprises located in rural areas than in the urban areas. That can be probably because of lack of skilled workers or lack of fixed capital. So further, when we look at the northeastern states of India, the only state which has somehow uh, more industrial activity is Assam compared to the other states of the, or, or, or the other northeastern states. Even within the north, among the non states, also it has been observed that the share of the unregistered, which which indicate informal manufacturing units of all the northeastern states in the net state domestic product was substantial, according to Kumar, that it was 42.25%, 39.99%, and 44.92% during the period of study 1984-85, 1989-90, and 1994-95, respectively. Uh, moving ahead from the literature that we have reviewed, it has been observed that. It has been uh, observed that the term informal sector was coined by Keith Hart in his study, with his study on the group of people called the Frafas, where the northern Ghanaian group who have migrated, migrated to the southern part of Ghana in search of employment. However, they end up getting employed in the informal sector. Then with regard to India, the 55th National Sample Survey Office has defined that all those unincorporated enterprises operating on either proprietary or partnership basis as informal sector. And it also says that the unorganized sector includes proprietary and partnership enterprises, cooperative societies, trusts, and private public limited companies, which indicates that informal sector is a part of, is or subset of the unorganized sector. However, according to the National Commission for Enterprises in the unorganized sector, it says that the unorganized or informal sector as consisting of all those unincorporated private enterprises were owned by household or individuals engaged in the sale and production of goods and services operated on a proprietary or partnership basis, but with less than 10 workers in Total. Further, with regard to the informal manufacturing sector in India, it has been generally observed from the various papers that informality has increased after the reform period and more so in the case of urban areas. Further, while rural enterprises fared well in terms of the number of enterprises and employment generation, the urban enterprises have higher share towards GVA and the fixed capital. Also, at the state level, in Assam, it has been found that the number of urban informal manufacturing enterprises has increased over the period 1994-95 to 2010-2011 compared to the rural sector enterprises. Though, of course, the number of rural enterprises is still higher than the rural enterprises. Further, again, at state level, it has been reported by that in, in, in various government, in, in the two government reports that unregistered units have been more in the rural than in the urban areas. So, uh, over the, the, and overall, it has been observed from the papers that the absolute number of rural enterprises is more than the urban enterprises. However, the growth rate of the number of enterprises that belongs to the informal manufacturing sector in rural areas is declining over time. 
compared to the those of belonging to the urban sector. Further, the objective of the study is basically to determine the size, the sectoral distribution of the informal manufacturing sector in the northeastern states, the non-northeastern states, and the union territories by using the recent available data. The data consists of secondary data from two rounds of the NSSO survey, which is basically on unincorporated non-agricultural sector, particularly the manufacturing sector. Further, for comparative study, this, uh, we, uh, have divide, we have divided into uh, three categories, the non-eastern states, non states, the non-non-eastern states, and union territories. Further, the informal manufacturing sector data have been sub uh, categorized into uh, rural as well as urban sector. For, uh, also, the, for analyzing the data, uh, the, the size and the sectoral distribution, simple tools such as averages, percentages, along with tabular presentation have been used, have been utilized. Uh, on the findings of the study, the, the findings of the study have been from three aspects. First of all, it has been in terms of the state-wise distribution of enterprises. The second one is, has been in terms of sector-wise, that is rural urban distribution of enterprises. And the third aspect is uh, from the view the changes that has been occurring, occurring during the period of study 2000, that is 2011, 2010 to 2011 to 2015, uh, which is an union territories. The findings has been indicating, has been, has indicated that Assam has the highest number of units among the northeastern states and West Bengal among the non-northeastern states during both the period of study 2010, 2011, and 2015, 2016, respectively. Also, uh, usually it has been known, already known that Assam is having more industrial activities than the rest of the northeastern states. So that can be probably that the reason behind is being the, both the increasing number of registered and unregistered units. Further, in the case of West Bengal, West Bengal has recently been known to have a high growth of the micro, medium, micro, small, and medium enterprises. And the unregistered units is so much a part of these micro, small, and medium enterprises. And that has been reflected here also at the growing number that, that West Bengal having the highest number of enterprises among the non Northeastern states. Well, Goa and Lakshadweep, they are they continue to have the least number of units among the non-northeastern states and union territories in both the year of the period of study. Sikkim has replaced uh, uh, replaced uh, has been replaced by Arunachal Pradesh by Arunachal Pradesh uh, during the period of time being the least uh, number of uh, least state with the uh, least uh, having having the least number of enterprises um, among the northeastern states and. Uh, and also, uh, Delhi has been replaced by Jammu and Kashmir being the least, uh, the, the state with the least number of, uh, sorry, the, the state with the highest number of enterprises among the union territories. So further, uh, as we moved on, uh, we have observed, this is the, the, the distribution, uh, overall distribution of, of the enterprises uh, in the rural and urban areas, it has been observed that the high, there has been a higher proportion or percentage of rural informal enterprises being 59% and 58% in the rural areas during the period 2010, 2011, as well as 2015, 16, respectively. So moving ahead, when we look at this aspect of the percentage share of enterprises uh, in the rural and, and the urban areas, it has been found that that there has been differences being observed in various states and territories having the highest and lowest percentage of units in rural and urban areas during the period of study. However, one observation that can be you can be seen here is that Meghalaya has the highest percentage in rural areas during the, the in, during 2010-11, which really supports the previous government report saying that unregistered units mostly are concentrated in rural rather than in urban areas. Further. Uh, among um, also also among the non northeastern states, it has been observed that Gujarat has the lowest percentage among uh, in the rural areas, uh, in the enterprise in the rural areas, which is probably because Gujarat is well known to be an industrialized state of the country, thereby having both registered as un as, well as unregistered units in the urban areas. Also, Delhi having the least percentage of enterprises in rural areas among the union territories is obvious because Delhi is an industrially active metropolitan area. Further, um, an observation of the changes during the period of study, uh, in the Northeastern state, there has been a negative growth in the total number of manufacturing enterprises as well as in the rural, uh, at the aggregate level as well as the rural areas. However, there has been a positive growth in the number of urban 
a high, in fact, a high positive growth in the number of urban enterprises during the uh, period of study. At all India level, positive growth have been uh, observed at the aggregate level, at the rural level, as well as the urban level in terms of the, the, the number of, uh, of uh, informal manufacturing enterprises. However, it, it, this also can be, it can be also observed that in terms of uh, the, the urban uh, areas that has been uh, you know, more higher than what has been observed in the at, at the aggregate level as well as at the uh, rural in, uh, in compared to the rural areas. So there are th uh, these are the striking observations from studies that, uh, that that the northeastern state has witnessed a decline in number of units both at the absolute and percentage terms, which we have observed from the last table. Mm -hmm. The number of enterprises in the rural sector has a declining trend, but the urban sector has see has seen a jump in the same. Also, the pattern and trend seen in northeastern states has not been observed in the rest of the country. As conclusion, the con concentration of informal manufacturing enterprises is more in the rural than urban areas. This also has been seen in previous st studies. Uh, that data of some uh, states have more or less remained the same with a sizable number of informal manufacturing units, Assam among the northeastern states, West Bengal among the non-northeastern states, and Delhi among the union territories during the period of study. The size of informal manufacturing sector in the northeastern states is seen to have declined in absolute as well as percentage term. This is explained by the decline in the number of units in the rural sector, though the decline has largely been offset by an increase in the urban sector. To conclude, there is still a need to further examine about the factors causing such differences in informal manufacturing distribution among the states, as well as the sector level. So till here, this is uh, what I wanted to present. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Barayhun, for keeping up to the timing and also for your presentation, which we will have a discussion after the completion of all the five uh, uh, papers. So thank you once again, Ms. Barayhun, and also uh, Dr. Darisha for the presentation. May I now call upon uh, uh, Mrs. Subro Michael Gomes, who is the director uh, from the Institute of Course Accountant of India. And his uh, paper is on developing an index for corporate governance which is a case study of a public of a central public sector undertaking i which i hope uh, will throw a lot of light on the um on the corporate governance and he will be discussing i believe since he talked about the central public sector so we get to see the performance on this pertinent issue at the uh, national level so this is so, bro, um, so, uh, I give you your time now, so you can start your presentation. Like I said, uh, please the timing, so that we can have enough time for discussion. So the time is yours, Mr. Gomes. Thank you. Let me share the screen. This first slide appearing? Yes, yes. Well, very good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm here at Kolkata. And uh, yes, missing uh, the ambience of Synod College because uh, I've been a regular visitor. But then uh, a small introduction, obviously, is now required because everything is now online. And uh, to give a perspective of what I have done, before that I let you know that I am now the director studies the Institute of Cost Accountants of India. We control the cost accounting profession. And while doing so, we have also eventually got into corporate governance in a very major way. And from there, I had taken the hint and, uh, and done some work on perhaps the one area which not only requires awareness, many things can be done. A project uh, of this sort, I had uh, designed it in such a way that uh, I give you some introductory on this, then I'll move to research objectives, some review work, which I've already done, identify it as a research gap, methodology, 
uh, summary of work done, I may skip, but uh, research results, etc., appear and recommendations to follow. So corporate governance is now not that sort of a new buzzword, but then uh, uh, it had come up in 2008. People had been talking about it uh, because of various scams. And India had also not been an exception to it. A very big one had been uh, the Satyam. But why only that? Even in the government sector also we find that. More or less my presentation would be covering a, a different area and why it is so. I perhaps uh, share a few, some bit more, then I get into where, where my research is focused. The CII had been a leader with respect to corporate governance in India. 1998, they started. And Kumar Mangalam Birla Committee was formed there after SEBI, then the Resh Chandra Committee, then the Narayana Murthy Committee, many committees. But as we have moved towards uh, corporate governance, codes, and etc., I actually found that whatever we are practicing, we need to also look from a perspective of grading, which has already been started in the government sector, and perhaps indexing. And what to index? We need to index uh, the corporate governance in a holistic manner. Transparency, accountability, disclosure, reporting. And uh, very lucidly it should be, as we find that uh, we try to uh, uh, put so much of uh, laws, regulations, perhaps we are unable to work well. So mine was, I it off. But if you comply, you get a medal. That's how my approach is. So let me share that. So the objectives which have come up, even in slides you are noticing, that uh, a comparative analysis I have done. Uh, I'll go to the research methodology to talk about that in more details. And from there, uh, I've also wanted to know about the policies, systems, the processes, procedures. For that, uh, I had to rely on some literature. Kazi 2017, Lisma, the Subramaniam. These studies have been more on uh, whether it is transparent or not, how far it is effective, uh, to identify certain factors, uh, information should be shared. Few more also, like in 2016, Ravi was there. Uh, I can't say that it was political, rather uh, in apolitical manner also, we are trying to uh, uh, take it up, these issues. And uh, some have done in banks, some for some for the government. Uh, private will is a bit low. I liked few of the works of uh, Sony, where five aspects had been identified, including regulation and others. Uh, some bit of Gopal also, it was there, talking about uh, the board, uh, the independency part, uh, then uh, auditors' role. I didn't stop with those, but there were a few more, just to mention, Singhal, Chattopadhyay, Singh. Let me come to my part. This research had been focused, uh, a sample had selected, and uh, you may say today, with this COVID going on, it's not that easy to do whatever research you want to do. So there had been a purposive approach to this. 
and uh, a selection of Maharatna, Navaratna. Why it is so? My expectation is they are the guy, they are the companies with the high, and they would be complying it. Perhaps there are to take care of. From that perspective, I had challenged it the how good you are, and I'm trying to bring that in front of you. That's why. Uh, the current management and government practices, how far it is consistent to be good ones, there lies the research gap. And mm -hmm. I had taken it up uh, and followed mm -hmm. it up with some bit more also. From my perspective, I wanted to see the transparency, accountability, disclosure, and reporting mechanisms, uh, where they lie. Where they lie means the compliance part. Let me go to research methodology, which perhaps uh, would be more interesting, as because this sort of research work uh, has been purely done by me, and uh, I don't mind uh, saying how I have done it, because I want more to do. I'm not talking about following me. See, these research of mine had been descriptive, exploratory, as well as empirical. I had been uh, playing with secondary data. The opportunity of infusing primary had come, but uh, I resisted. For one reason is that uh, I will not be able to take care of the bias. But when the secondary data, it is published data, it is not that uh, it will have that sort of a bias. So the collection of data had been uh, through, that had been a conscious selection of 52. Oh. 52 such companies. Yeah. Excuse me, Mr. Yeah. Gomes, sorry to interrupt you. You please uh, try to, you know, to um, to speed Fine. it up because you, still, you have just about three minutes left. And as okay. you look at the sources, uh, the methodology which I have told, I come to uh, first result. You see, you have uh, scores stated here, and uh, this is more specific to the ones which I've selected. These are all from the oil sector. And if you note, these A to I, these are all categories. These categories had been scored. First one, it is not by uh, sheer uh, size of it, but they had scored 100 on one. But 100 uh, scores have been uh, achieved by others in other areas also. But I had uh, conducted one variance analysis, although being in government who are expected to have 100 on upon 100 for all, uh, the scores, statistically, there is no difference, but at 5% level. But when we increase the level of significance to, say, 10%, I find there are differences, at least when criteria are compared. Here is the interesting find, which is the 12 bars, it is okay. Sufficiency they have arrived at, but there are still signs and areas where to develop. And most importantly, it is independent directors. If you look at the relative scores uh, of various companies, BPCL, has stopped. It's not that uh, it had gone for a reward. And you see uh, now the transparency and the practice. This, some, uh, this had been some primary data where they are saying that it is good. But uh, there are some who have talked about it is poor. Statistically, not that much significant. 
and uh, hear how they feel about the impact of corporate governance. They find it to be high. So when I talk about this uh, results being uh, tested once again, yes, Indian oil PSUs, they are not at an infant stage. But I can't say they are highly advanced because there are areas where they need to grow. Recommendation of mine are that I had worked out that index on this way. CGI, it is a group index, 100 minus this part S is the sufficiency in the areas and D is where there is no sufficiency. This sort of an index has been uh, taken from Bhutan's uh, happiness index. The way they constructed, uh, I had borrowed it from there. And I have found it to be quite useful while comparing. And, uh, yes, Mr. Gomez, sorry, yes. Mr. Gomez, can you please conclude? Because uh, yeah, so, the time is, is up. Yeah. So in conclusion, although we find that Indian oil PSUs are really, really the top brass, we consider it to be complying with corporate governance in India, there is still some lacunae. And uh, as identified there with independent directors. Here I mentioned, furthermore, uh, they are very strongly monitored through DP, SEBI, if there lies some lacuna, what happens to the others? Here, I rest my case and uh, stop my sharing so that we can hear to others and then we can have a discussion okay. later on. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Gomes, uh, for your presentation. Uh, I'll now move, call upon Dr. Charlene Swear from the Department of Economics, uh, Sinatis College, to share her thoughts on bank credit in India, which is a case study of Meghalaya. Your time is yours, Charlene. Okay, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to present my findings uh, on a paper which uh, is uh, entitled Bank Credit in India, a case study of Meghalaya. So let me present my screen right now. Is my screen visible? Yes, yes. Okay, thank you so much, sir. So the title of my paper is Bank Credit in India, a case study of Meghalaya. I am Charlene Maysware from the uh, Department of Economics, St. Anthony's College. Um, <clears throat> since independence, there has been many initiatives which have been undertaken to improve the availability of institutional credit, particularly to rural households. And through uh, programs of bank nationalization in 1969, 1980, the setting up of regional rural banks. And in the 1990s, we see the deregulation of interest rates, the launching of Kisan credit card schemes, the setting up of uh, uh, self-help groups. These have provided positive outcomes. And uh, positive outcomes like they have led to poverty reduction, uh, there has been women empowerment, there has been an increase in household income, and also a reduction in the dependency on informal sources. And uh, the latest reforms, uh, which were carried out in 2006 onwards, uh, through the financial inclusion policies like the Know Your Customer, mobile banking systems, financial literacy campaigns, have also been uh, introduced to sensitize the farmers and the rural households about the concept of formal financing. However, the results of these policies have been lopsided to be uh, we witnessed uh, lopsided development, and there has been a lack of access to formal credit. So the objective of this paper is that we have reviewed the trends in the banking sector development post-bank nationalization in the northeastern region. And uh, this paper also attempts to fill the informational gap using secondary data to present an overview of the banking sector development in NER as well as in our state, Meghalaya. For the data sources, we have mostly consulted secondary data sources from the National Sample Survey Organization, particularly the 70th round, which talks about the All India Debt and Investment 
assessment survey carried out in 2013. Uh, we have also used uh, data from state level bankers committee report, which uh, have been published by the State Bank of India and also the census data. Now, when we come to the results and discussions, the results and discussions of the paper have been divided into three sections. The first section talks about uh, banking sector development in India. And we have reviewed the period of 1974 to 2020 using indicators like the number of bank branches, the population per branch office, the credit deposit ratio, per capita credit and per capita deposits. We have found that uh, the banking sector development in uh, northeastern region is a post-nationalization phenomena because the region was poorly served by banks prior to 1969. Uh, the table shows that by 1981, only 2.2% of the bank branches in the country were located in the region, and the average population per branch office in NER was, uh, was in fact uh, up to 32,000 in 1981, compared to uh, 18,000 at the national level uh, during the same period. Between the period of uh, reference, that is 1974 to 2020, the number of bank branches in the region has increased by nearly 18 times, while the average population per branch office has declined. Uh, when we look at the per capita credit, we find that uh, in, uh, it has also improved. By, 90, uh, by 2020, the per capita credit in India was nearly uh, three and a half times more than the amount in NER. Of course, it has increased, but still, uh, it is still lagging behind uh, at the All India level. So this reflects the gap that exists between the penetration of banking services in NER and the rest of the country. However, a point to be noted here is that the relative improvement in the banking indicators is perhaps due to this poor status of banking infrastructure in the earlier period. Uh, now, we have also looked at the CD ratio, which is the credit deposit ratio. Uh, this is another indicator which has helped us to examine the develop, uh, development of the banking sector. And the CD ratio has been used as an indicator to identify the level of credit deployment by commercial banks in relation to the amount of deposits received by them. By the 1980s to 1990s, we find that in the CD ratio in India was about 62 to 67% at the original level. Uh, percent. Uh, this reflects that the low CD ratio uh, that the credit mobilized in the states have not been deployed uh, to fund financial needs of the households and businesses. Perhaps another reason for low uh, CD ratio is the fact that many are still outside the purview of institutional credit. Even with the progress in the opening of bank branches, the majority of the population in NER is still outside the ambit of the commercial banks and the RRBs. And this, low, uh, this is evident, this low bank penetration is evident through the low percentage of households availing banking services, according to um, the census of 2011. Only 49% in NER compared to 59% at the national level have availed banking services. This reflects uh, the poor utilization of facilities by the households of the region, which is also responsible for low economic development. The second part of uh, the paper has uh, focused on the development on um, the rural banking in NER. And we have uh, looked at the period between 1981 to 2016. In 1981 to 1991, the percentage of rural, house, uh, rural bank branches in NER, of course, has increased. But uh, in 1991, there has been a decline uh, in the number of bank branches, which uh, affected households access to banking services in the rural areas. And the average per, uh, population per branch office declined from 48,000 to 20,000 um, till 1991, but then it increased again because of closing of these bank branches. The per capita credit in 2011 in NER uh, was almost half than that at the national level. Thus, uh, there is cons uh, considerable, considerable development in terms of expansion of rural banking in NER, and also in terms of the increase in per cap uh, capita rural credit and deposit. The region is still lagging behind when compared with the situation at the All India level. Rural banking sector development still needs to be given a priority so as to intensify the pace of development in the region. The third section of my paper 
focuses on rural credit in NER and Meghalaya. In this section, we have shifted our focus from the progress of the banking sector to the subject of credit access among rural households in NER. We have used the data from NSSO in the 70th round uh, through the All India Debt and Investment Survey, uh, which has classified households into cultivator and non-cultivator households. Cultivator households were identified as rural households operating uh, on 0.002 hectares of land, while the latter include those households operating on more land or land less than 0.002 hectares during the last one year before the survey. And this survey covered cash loans, whether they are repaid in cash or kind, with or without interest. The sources of loans have been identified as institutional sources, which include government cooperatives, commercial banks, regional rural banks, self-help groups, and others, and non-institutional sources, which uh, includes um, landlords, money lenders, input suppliers, friends, and relatives. The results of the survey shows that indebtedness to institutional sources among cultivator ho uh, households in Arunachal Pradesh, Meghalaya, Mizoram, Nagaland, and Sikkim varied between 85 to 98 percent. Among these, the major contributor to, uh, to uh, rural credit was uh, identified as uh, to be commercial banks and regional rural banks. When we look at the situation in Meghalaya, both types of households borrowed more from commercial banks and regional rural banks which is perhaps a positive indication of bank penetration uh, among the rural households in the state. 14% uh, of the cash loans of cultivator, uh, cultivator households uh, were supplied by the inst non-institutional sources, uh, whereby 7% came from family, friends, and relatives, and only 1.6% came from money lenders. On the other hand, when we looked at the non-cultivator households, we have found that instead they have borrowed more from money uh, lenders. Then uh, we have also looked at the contribution of, uh, of uh, credit, of banking credit, uh, uh, through the Kisan credit card schemes in the northeastern region. And we have found out that there has been minimal distribution of KCCs among rural households, which is less than 3% uh, uh, households availing this facility in the region, compared to 7.8%, uh, 0.08% at the national level. And when we looked at the case of Meghalaya, less than 1% of rural households have availed this facility. Um, the above uh, discussion shows that the performance of KCC scheme varies across the states of the region, and NER as a whole continues to be an underperformer of this scheme. This finding is also reflected in some studies which have reported that more than half of the KCCs in the country has been issued from uh, in the southern and the northern regions, while well, in the eastern and northeastern regions have recorded the lowest number of KCC issued. Uh, Nabar has stressed that in order to enlarge the coverage of the scheme, simplification of procedures and paperwork is required. Apart from, the, uh, from these, lower interest rates, flexibility in installment payments, enhancement in credit limit should be taken into consideration. However, close monitoring of the program is required to ensure that farmers do not divert their loans as per their requirements. And the paper ends. Charlene. The paper ends. Yeah, yes, Charlene, sir? yeah, please come to your conclusion and your suggestion, okay? Yeah. Okay. So uh, we have also reviewed the banking progress in Meghalaya over the last 20 years. And in conclusion, we can say that in any arm, in spite of the increase in the number of bank branches, uh, there has been no bank penetration. And of the borrowing households, majority have been indebted to banks. Although money lenders do not play an important role, except in the state of Manipur, however, in NER, uh, friends and family and relatives have been identified as major sources of informal credit. And in Meghalaya, even though commercial banks have increased in number, we see that the CD ratio is still lower than the national average, as well as the uh, regional average. So uh, perhaps from the uh, from the side of the banks, the impediments are like low business prospects, high non-performing assets have uh, discouraged banks from uh, from uh, lending to rural households. And from the part of the uh, rural households, perhaps in, uh, uh, factors like risk factor, lack of communication, lack of transportation, these have been um, deterring factors for rural households to come forward to borrow more from institutional sources. Therefore, there is a need to bridge the gap there is a need to bridge the gap uh, so as to increase the level of credit deployment in the state and the region as a whole if there is to be any rapid growth, economic growth and development. Thank you so much. So, 
I will now call upon the next presenter, Dr. Ibalari Pala Kongjo, along with uh, Ms. Austrian Maori. These are the two teachers from the host uh, uh, college, Sinat College. They will be discussing on the rural livelihood in Meghalaya, which is an overview of uh, this case. So the time is yours. Once again, I request you please stick to the timing that has been allotted to you. Thank you. Uh, a very good morning uh, to everyone. And uh, sir, thank you for uh, allowing me and uh, my uh, colleague, Austrian, uh, to present this paper. So, uh, this paper has been titled Rural Livelihood in Meghalaya and Overview. And this is a joint uh, uh, paper between myself and uh, uh, Mr. Austrian uh, Maury. Now, uh, the, the Firstly, this uh, paper, it aims to uh, review some of the basic facts on rural, li uh, rural livelihood in the state and also to examine the need for focus on rural livelihood and also to analyze uh, how the people residing in the rural areas have benefited from the steps taken up by the government to enhance their livelihood in their respective areas. Now, uh, as we all know, livelihood is very important for man's survival in this world. And when we talk about rural livelihood, we refer to all those activities where people in the rural areas uh, undertake to carry out so as to sustain their living and survival. Now, when we look at the rural sector uh, uh, in a developing country, one of the main characteristics of the rural area is that uh, the people residing in it are very much dependent on agriculture and uh, its allied activities, which very much involves dependence on uh, nature. Uh, similarly, uh, for a country like India, we see that uh, most of the people uh, residing in uh, the rural areas are dependent on uh, agriculture for their livelihood. Now, uh, Meghalaya, one of the states in the northeastern region of uh, India, uh, which comprises of the three uh, main tribes, the Khasis, the Jaintias, and the Garus, uh, when we look uh, in the state also, about 75% of the total population in the state is still dependent on agriculture for their livelihood. And uh, uh, when we look at the rural sector, we find that around 98.28% of them are cultivators. Now, uh, when we look at the percentage distribution of main workers and marginal workers engaged in different activities, when we look at the different census, we see that the percentage of cultivators in 1981, it was 71.80%. Uh, which declined to 60.03% uh, in 2001, and further to 55.30% uh, in 2011. Now, uh, what, uh, what is interesting though, is that the number of agricultural laborers has increased. Uh, the percentage of agricultural laborers was uh, roughly, uh, it was 11.12% uh, in 1981. It is increases to 14.63% in 2001, and further to 15.24% uh, in 2011. And when we look at the different categories of workers available, we see that uh, though a compositional uh, change has been noticed in the rural areas, yet agriculture continues to be the main source of livelihood for the people residing in the rural areas. Now, apart from agriculture, majority of the people who are residing in the rural areas uh, also depend on the forest for their day-to-day -day need uh, for food supplements, for further medicines, uh, for fuel, wood, uh, and they derive their income by, uh, from the forest by way of extraction and sale of forest products and employment in the forest-based industries. This is, a, this is based on a study which was done by Professor Tiwari and Barik in 2019. Now, when, uh, according to them, the availability of medicinal plants uh, can be said to be accountable for the existence of more than 300 herbal practitioners in Shillong and its suburbs. Now, another activity is sericulture, where we will find that most of the population or the rural population are engaged in. Now, when we look at the data available from the Directorate of Economics and Statistics, what we see is that in 2004-2005, there are 18, uh, 1,812 sericultural villages uh, and about 16,000 families are engaged in it. And when we look at the data available in uh, 2014 and 2017, what we find is that though the number of sericultural villages have declined to 15 point, uh, to 1,523, 
Yet, the number of families engaged in sericulture has increased to 45,205. Now, and apart from this, we have fishing, which is another activity where the rural population of Meghalaya earn their livelihood. Uh, another activity is mining. Uh, Do coal mining has been banned in this state, but uh, if we look at the uh, earlier scenario, I mean, we don't have the official data for the number of people who are engaged in mining, but if we look at the NSS 5% of the total 10 lakh workers, they are engaged in a coal mining. Now, another uh, source of livelihood which is gaining importance in the state is rural tourism. Now, rural tourism uh, is, uh, uh, as I've uh, said, is another source of livelihood and the formation of these uh, groups such as like uh, the to uh, tourism cooperative societies, they have uh, been instrumental in linking the indigenous culture and their creativity in the fields of art, crafts, uh, weaving uh, and spinning uh, with the tourism sector, which is uh, about uh, plenty of natural and ethical attractions of the rural areas of Meghalaya. Now, uh, hence, we can see that uh, there are various sources of livelihood for the people residing in the rural area of the state, and the government has been uh, uh, instrumental, or it has taken up various uh, steps to introduce various schemes so as to help create uh, livelihood opportunities for the people residing in the rural areas. Now, one of these uh, programs uh, is the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, which was notified as the Meghalaya Rural Employment Guarantee Scheme uh, on July 28, 2006. Now, various studies have been conducted from time to time to study and evaluate the impact of this scheme. And most of these reports have commented that though there are various uh, uh, setbacks and loopholes in the implementation of the scheme, yet there is no denying that this scheme has brought a change in the life of the people residing in the rural areas. It has created job opportunities for them and it has ensured a strong safety net for the vulnerable uh, rural poor and has brought a significant income diversification in the rural economies. Now, uh, apart from Nerega, we have the Northeast Region Community Resource Management Fund, which is a livelihood and rural development project centrally uh, funded, which aim at transforming the lives of the poor and uh, ma marginalized tribal uh, families. It was introduced in West Pasi Hills and West Garo Hills district of Meghalaya. This project also has been able to make a change in the lives of the rural people by enhancing their livelihoods. The formation of self help groups. If we look at the success stories of this particular project, we see that uh, we see the case of an unemployed youth through this uh, uh, scheme, we can say. He has been able to uh, receive training and uh, 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 receive training and uh, have a job. And then we have we see the formation of self-help groups in West Kasi Hills, uh, where uh, NERCOM uh, actually encourages the formation of what is known as the natural resource management groups. And these groups have been instrumental in bringing together a group of people such as the small scale uh, beekeepers in uh, Mongolwai. Now, uh, it has not uh, only brought uh, like, uh, you know, it has not only created Jobs, we can see also that it has uh, led to women empowerment also with the uh, number of opportunities that has been given to the, uh, to the uh, rural woman. Now, another project introduced in the state is the Meghalaya Livelihood Improvement Project for the Him uh, Himalayas, uh, which was funded by IFAD and it was started in 2005. And this project was actually meant for all the remaining other districts in the state with the exception of West Kasi Hills and West Garo Hills. Now, this project also has been uh, instrumental in bringing in empowerment by enhancing rural livelihood through the formation of self-help groups. We see that in the case of Lakadong Turmeric, uh, the, uh, the community, they came together uh, in the case, uh, like in the formation of the Laskin Federation of Self-Help Groups. And now uh, through this particular project, they also receive training and they have been able to produce and manufacture this turmeric in a more scientific uh, manner and get a uh, good uh, remuneration for it. Now, another project, uh, another scheme uh, taken up by the government is the National uh, Rural Livelihood Mission, which is actually a restructured and renamed self-employment program, which was earlier known as the uh, Swaranjayanti uh, Swaranjayanti Yojana or SGSY. 
Now, the Meghalaya State uh, Rural Livelihoods Society was actually established in 2011 for this, so as to be the nodal agency of the government of Meghalaya for implementing our, uh, NRLM in the state. Now, some women beneficiaries residing in the rural areas have greatly benefited from this scheme. Now, we see uh, the case uh, like uh, of uh, one Madam Srimiti Amili A. Sangman. She has a land of their own, but she was actually a daily wage uh, uh, laborer from a village in uh, uh, Garo Hills, Dumit Bigre. Now, what happened is that uh, she, uh, since she did not have the financial uh, ability, she had to rely on uh, being a daily wage uh, uh, worker. Now, however, when uh, through NRLM, she has been able to uh, uh, have or to get access to, uh, she, she now has the financial ability where she now is cultivating her own land and get a good uh, income from it. Similarly, we see the case of those who are uh, landless. We see the case of one uh, Madam Srimiti Deborah Tongwa from Jackram Village. She actually uh, now has a, a small business of her own ways. She is selling uh, secondhand clothes. But apart from that, she has received training where she is making and selling dry flowers and uh, is able to participate in these uh, different uh, you can uh, we can see uh, programs where she is able to uh, market her product and hence is getting a good income for it. Another project is the Meghalaya uh, Livelihood and uh, Yes. Sir. Is uh, you ready to come to come to your conclusion? Okay. Okay, sir. I'll just wind up. So apart from uh, from these projects that we have uh, discussed, uh, what uh, what we see is this is that despite the government taking up a crucial role in uplifting the rural sector, the, the rural sector of the state still have or still show a very poor development indices. In terms of basic facilities, they are still lacking behind. And then when we talk about poverty, poverty in rural areas at uh, 55% is almost, almost double the percentage of uh, urban poverty. Now, some of the important findings of this particular paper is that agriculture, though everyone is talking about people uh, the, totally, uh, the, the, about the process of de people are not relying on agriculture, but there is no denying the fact that agriculture will be the main source of livelihood and will remain the main source of livelihood for the rural people, especially for the next 10 years. With the, uh, uh, with the population projection that we are having, their livelihood, especially in the rural areas, will still be directly or indirectly linked to the agricultural sector. Changes have taken place in the agricultural sector, no doubt about it, through the implementation of various uh, schemes. We have seen in the creation of assets, job opportunities. Uh, however, there is one suggestion. I mean, there are several suggestions, but I'll be talking about one. We have seen about convergence taking place. Now, uh, the government has to really work hard to create more, uh, uh, like, you know, the, 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 the different departments, such as the Department of Soil, Department of uh, Fisheries, Department of Sericulture, all these, they have to work in tandem together. Uh, being dependent on agriculture is not bad, but actually agricultural sector has to be profitable, especially in times of uh, the pan uh, pandemic. We see that agriculture uh, is very important. And then, uh, and then uh, when we talk about most of the schemes, uh, we see that most of the schemes are centrally sponsored, uh, where the planning has been done at the central level. Now, it's high time where people in the rural areas are taken into uh, confidence and include them in the planning process, since they will be the best judge of what is really needed to enhance their livelihood opportunities. So only this much. Thank you. Thank you. I now come to the last presentation of the day, which will be presented by Ms. Chanmi Akhar, who is a research scholar from the Department of History. And so let us listen from a different perspective. We've heard a lot from the economics, uh, people from the economic background. And now let us listen to someone from history to shed her light on the economic activity from the historical you know, uh, background. 
so the time is yours, Ms. Dachan Chanmi. Thank you, sir. So I'll go directly uh, to my paper. My paper is on crafts as an alternative livelihood, a case of textile weaving of Riboy. This paper examines the development of textile weaving and how this craft provides an alternative livelihood for the people. Especially for the women in Riboy. The study will be historical, historical in orientation. Craft constitute an important aspect of material culture. Crafts are handmade and the techniques for creating them are learned through family or community traditions that pass along through, tradition, uh, through generations with craft persons remaining true to time-honored methods or techniques. With the increasing mechanized industries and the impact of globalization, most of the traditional crafts Becomes, becomes taken in or activities being reduced to rural areas or produced for the aesthetic wants of the people. To cope up with the steady decline of crafts in the 1950s, we saw that the promotion of handicraft was incorporated into India's economic planning that acknowledged not only the aesthetic uh, qualities of the crafts, but also about the earning, but also talk about the earning and employment and employment potential of the craft production. Traditionally, crafts flourish alongside agriculture and the degree of development of the crafts depended on agrarian productions. So craft and agriculture are often combined and interdependent on each other. It has been observed that crafts are often taken by agricultural workers during slack seasons, as craft includes its general use being primarily utilitarian are functional in purpose. Production is usually on a small scale at the level of household or cottage industry. This provides economic opportunities to the, for the low income group and women to participate in a craft production. Therefore, craft making can be seen as an alternative livelihood that not only cater for employment, but also helps in empowering women at, at the grassroots level. So textile weaving in Riboy was said to have been practiced from the pre-colonial period. But however, in terms of, in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, resources, we saw that it was only in the earlier 20th century that PRT Garden first provides significant, uh, significant information about, about the association of the villages such as Kirwang, which is now at Karbi Anglong district, and then Nongtung at Rib of Riboy, with the production of Iri silk and Minso and Sutunga village with cotton, which is right now in Jaitya Hills. So to know the potential of textile weaving in Riboy, it is necessary for us to understand the various factors that led to the development Men of this craft in study. So number one, we have Riboy comprised of different subgroups, as we already know, which includes the Khasis, the Giantias, the Marnars, the Karbis or the Mikirs, the Tivas or the Lalungs, the Hajongs. The, the Karbis and Tivas are already known for their art of weaving. And this can be also seen from the finished products, the traditional costume, and you can see which consists of, uh, consists of intricate designs. The giantess was also said to have a favorable industry during the pre-colonial period. So the assimilation of these groups, the assimilation of this various group in Riboy led to the sharing of knowledge and skill within the uh, skill among the people in their region. Number two, Riboy being surrounded by the upland khasis in the south, and the plain of Assam in the North region. It occupied an important place in the trade and trading activities in the pre-colonial period. Therefore, easy access to the Bohoi area with neighboring areas has facilitated the exchange of ideas among the groups and in procuring raw materials and products, as we say, such as the Mukha from Assam, which is well known as the center of India. Number three, we have Riboy with its, with its warm climate conditions and fertile land make it possible for the people to practice uh, uh, sericulture, where cotton was planted in the region, although sometimes it grows wild. The availability of raw materials in Riboy played an important role in facilitating the emergence of craft-specific centers of weaving, such as Umtangam Nongtung, Umden Dibon, etc., which gradually spread to other villages located in the Bhoi area. Number four. In textile weaving, it has been pointed out that clothes were the handiwork of women alone. 
The boy's society followed a matrilineal system where the descendants and inheritance are traced through the mother's line and, pass it, and passes through the youngest daughter. Yes, we can say that there are only some families of Karbi, Tiwa, and Mangars who follow the tradition. So the transmission of craft knowledge that passes down from mother to daughter, such a tradition tended to encourage the organization and the stabilization of the craft along clan's line. So in recent years, with the government taking interest in preserving and reviving the traditional industry, took step along with the Department of Sericulture and Weaving, and Weaving in setting up centers of uh, weaving in different, in different villages to impart training to local artisans, such as weaving training centers and handloom production center. We also saw the formation of many self-help groups and weavers cooperative societies also started to form. They also saw the, part, uh, the, they also saw the participation of men, such as we have an example of, through my field studies, uh, there's an example from uh, Quen village where one man, he take as a full-time job in, in the weaving production. So, and also the emergence of textile weaving as a thriving industry in the region can be viewed when Omden D1 was declared as a state first resale village on the 12th Feb 2021. So Riboy with its geostrategic location, its climatic condition, and also the, the presence of the various ethnic groups who are known for their weaving, uh, for the knowledge of weaving, combined with the government supports, led to more and more women engage in the rearing of silk worm, in the spinning, and then in the weaving production. Men are also are already trying their hands in the weaving production. We also saw that example, we also have like Daniel E, who's well known for a uh, fashion designer, who start taking up this airy silk to the, to the platform in the fashion industry. So that's through this, above, uh, through this above development, we can say that textile weaving can provide a really alternate livelihood to the unemployed youth, especially for the people in the region as a whole. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, the Chanmi, for keeping the timing. So we have heard uh, five presentations this uh, morning, and now I open the, the, all the other uh, the presenters and even others who are uh, part of this uh, session to give their views and their comment, and uh, after which I will give my concluding remark. So the the, the discussion is open for for people to come forward. Yes, uh, and we make sure that it will be one by one, so that it will not uh, we will. <laughs> here and we will understand what the points that you all want to convey any clarification thought and so on yes. so i invite uh, others to please put in the presenters have presented Yes. Yes. Uh, anyone who, other than the presenters, who want to say something on what the um, presenters have uh, shared this uh, morning? So if there's no one, then uh, maybe from the presenters, I call the presenters, anyone who want to say something on what uh, you all have heard uh, that has been presented this morning? Any point, any clarification, any addition, any supplementation to what has been um, shared to us? Can you all hear me? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yes, yes. So, yes, once again, anyone wants to say something on what has been presented so far? Well, okay. I will take my time uh, to shed some light on whatever has been presented so far. Well, uh, to begin with, uh, from 
the presentation that uh, were made this uh, afternoon. One thing that uh, you know that I notice is that you know there has no doubt been a structural shift in the Indian economy, and I believe particularly I would say after the liberalisation with the opening up of the India's of India's economy in 1991, we have surely seen a shift in you know the um, way the things are being carried out in our country. And coming to the first presentation, what uh, the presenter has uh, shared with us is that informality has actually increased after liberalization, which um, I can say is clearly a, a, you know, a proof that India economy has really uh, shifted structurally, particularly after liberalization. And when we hear that uh, there has been a concentration in the rural um, uh, sector, particularly when you talk about the informal uh, sector, the informal manufacturing sector, this is again uh, you know, something that uh, can, you know that gives us a lot that we can take a positivity from it because when we see that uh, uh, there is a shift. You know, from the predominant uh, agricultural sector, which if you go back to 1947, where more than 40% of India's GDP came from the agricultural sector, uh, it's just around about 16% or less, um, you know, where uh, there is a, a contribution of the agricultural sector. So clearly we are seeing that uh, even in the rural area, this sectoral shift you know, has been seen even in the rural area, which I'm sure that I believe that, uh, you know, together with agriculture, and I believe that there has been other agro allied uh, um, industry or industrial activity that has been taking place even in the rural area, which is something which can really improve, as we know, uh, the, you know, the economic uh, condition of people in the rural area. Then coming to the second um, second presentation, when we talk about the when the presenter talk about the uh, uh, corporate governance and he talks about the how to develop an index for co corporate governance, particularly in the um, in a few um, central public sector undertaking. Well, uh, if you look at this uh, work, uh, rather if you look at the corporate uh, governance in India, there is no doubt that India has uh, achieved a good rank when it to corporate governance, particularly in the regulation uh, aspect. But there is still a lot of room for improvement. And from the remark made by the presenter, he says that the Indian oil, um, you know, the Indian oil corporation is one such, uh, you know, public sector which has really achieved tremendously on this particular front, but uh, um, he also, if I, you know, if I'm not wrong, he also mentioned that uh, there are still some, you know, public sector organisation which have not really been able to comply with the corporate governments. So if those in the government they are not uh, really complying, then you can expect you cannot expect much from the private sector. So, but then. Uh, as many studies have uh, shown, that India has achieved a good rank in the corporate governance, particularly in the regulation aspect. But then, uh, what is more important is the execution, is the you know, is to put whatever has been uh, laid down in paper and to put into practice. I think that is something which uh, calls for all the, uh, the both the public as well as the private sector corporates to uh, be serious in this because if we got good governance surely will go a long way in helping the country to move forward and to achieve the desired goals and then coming to the third uh, presenter uh, that is by dr charlene on bank credit in india well we all know you know particularly in the state of meghalaya how um, and not in the state of meghalaya northeast as a whole 
where the CD ratio has uh, really, you know, leaves a lot to be desired. There is so much that can be done. And just, uh, you know, uh, Charlene, I just want to say this, that uh, since you're talking about the case study of Meghalaya, so I think it would be really good if, you know, your focus should be more on the case and the result that has come out with the case and maybe taking the reference um, or maybe comparing with few comparable states of uh, this of the country but there is no doubt you have uh, highlighted what really is the true picture of um, you know of bank credit in india particularly in some of these less developed states particularly in the northeast and meghalaya in particular so your finding i hope we have uh, uh, the policymakers will, um, you know, will take a clue from your findings and try to work something on how to improve our the bank credit in India and uh, particularly in some of these less developed states. And then coming to the fourth presentation, who talks about a case study of rural livelihood. Well, um, the uh, I like the you know the. Uh, number of uh, cases that she, you know, she uh, presented, because those are live cases, and from those live cases, I'm sure it will encourage others to, um, you know, to to come out of the shell and to um, take up economic activity besides their, you know, their uh, primary um, activity, which is mostly agriculture related, and. I I like the suggestions that she gave, um, where she talks about how you know when policy decisions are made. Um, the top-down approach is not always, I feel, the right uh, strategy to accomplish any goals and objective. But there are cases where the down-top approach, I believe, in some of the area like the area in which she. Uh, in which she was working um, is always, I believe, that you know the right and the best strategy to accomplish your goals and objective. It is not always the you know the people at the top who knows what is going, uh, what is happening at the ground level, but rather those at the ground level they know better. They know what they want, what they need, and so uh, I believe that the policymakers and we have here we are. Uh, it's an honor to have our MP also. I noticed that he's been, um, you know, listening uh, to this presentation, that he would take uh, some of the suggestion given by the presenters that uh, to remind the policymakers that it's not only the top-down approach that is the best approach, but actually the down going up to the top would be some of the best approach, the best strategy to accomplish any objective. And of course, lastly, uh, we wish to thank uh, the Chanmi, uh, his a student from history, and we all uh, we cannot uh, do away with history. And what she shared on the um, on her paper on um, crafts as an alternative livelihood, this is something that we should take it seriously, where traditional knowledge is something that we must preserve and uh, integrating it with technology, integrating it with some of the marketing uh, strategies, we can surely help the traditional sector or the rural sector to, you know, in adding value to whatever traditional knowledge that they have um, and to make it more commercially viable and to make it more competitive and thereby improve not only their, um, you know, their economic uh, uh, status uh, in particular, but then the um, the economic uh, condition of a state like us, which is so rich in traditional uh, knowledge and uh, traditional crafts. And I believe this will also go a long way in ensuring a sustainable uh, development of not only our state, but uh, which would be almost like a model for the other states of the country and even maybe for the rest of the world. 
that we cannot neglect our roots. So with uh, these few words, I once again wish to thank uh, all the presenters and those who have been who are part of this uh, session, who have, who have been listening uh, patiently to all the five presenters. And once again, I wish to thank the organizer for doing a commendable job. The one point which, in fact, I shared with one of the open, with the organizer, where which I've seen it, you know, there's something which is missing in all the session, and something which we have to maybe maybe it's a another uh, you know a topic of uh, another seminal topic, and that is the role of the civil society or the role of NGOs and the non-profit organization, which is what we call today the third sector, which I see, you know, none have come up, you know, 75 years in their progress. And it has progressed not only because of the public sector, nor the private sector, but it's also the role, the, you know, the, uh, mm, the support by the third sector, that is the NGOs and the non-profit organization. So I hope this would be a topic uh, of uh, a seminar topic, maybe in as part of the 75 years of India's, uh, you know, freedom. So um, with these few words, thank you, organizers, and thank you all the presenters, and may you continue to um, work more and contribute more to the benefit of one and all. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Welcome, well, welcome, welcome. Have a good day ahead. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, at the very outset, I express my sincere gratitude to the uh, Synod College for inviting me to chair this uh, uh, virtual uh, on, uh, yes, the 75th uh, uh, day of our great country. And um, we, we are gathering now in this very important uh, time when we are uh, facing this uh, pandemic. So I'm glad that uh, Synod College is going ahead with this uh, seminar, although, although on a virtual mood. And uh, it's also important that the session that uh, we are having now is uh, on environment. And uh, although I'm not an expert in environment, uh, any of the environment, uh, anything about environment, but I'm a, a keen observer of what is going on, you know, uh, with regard to the uh, environmental development, especially in the state of Meghalaya. So, we are glad that uh, today we are having four papers, four papers to be presented by uh, very important uh, scholars. So we also welcome you all to this uh, uh, conference. And most of all, uh, we thank you for uh, preparing the papers. And we hope that uh, we'll be enlightened by the studies that you have been done and which will be presented to the uh, in the seminar today so like uh, the saying goes the show must go on so now i or oh, the other information that i received from the organizer is that uh, we'll be only having uh, the three party papers instead of four so we are unfortunately dr dt nengnong will not be able to join us uh, and present his paper in this uh, session. So that means we'll be having only three papers. So we have 10 minutes 
free time. So I don't know how 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 uh, 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 what we will do with this ten minutes uh, free time. Uh, so you can just you can do this. You can give them fifteen fifteen minutes presentation. Okay. So so I, I was thinking maybe we'll give more time to the you know opening session. Oh, oh, yeah. okay. Question and answer. Q and A. Yeah. Okay. So anyway, I mean, this is just to inform you that we have uh, ten minutes uh, extra time. So uh, the more we leave time for question and answer session, the, the better it is, in my opinion. So now, with no further ado, I would uh, invite the first paper, which will be presented by Willy Nongrum, Associate Prof Professor and Head. Yeah. I understand this is a very, very long subject and very, very complicated one. So uh, to start it off, uh, about seven, five years of independence have truly brought in a massive and beneficial for the entire nation. The culture, the IT, the industrial, the transport, the health sector, along with many others, have developed immensely since 1940. However, in closer examination, the vital sectors such as health, livelihoods, and many others are still too many, too inadequate and unevenly distributed, causing tremendous anxiety and insecurity all across the rural, this rural agrarian based nation of ours. The pre uh, prevailing senseless abuses and destruction. Scientific wasteful extraction and utilization of the natural resources for to the growth and develop, the economic development of the nation as a whole. So, uh, the, uh, the 2020 HDI or Human Development Index ranking of India was a poor 131st position of uh, 189 nations, which with a, a mere one or zero point six four five points. The average monthly income difference, for example, between the United States of America and India in 2020 in terms of rupees 2.5 lakhs and 16,000 uh, respectively. These are very telling pictures of nation weaknesses and no less than 21.9% of the 289 million Indians today are living below poverty line. That is, earning average monthly about uh, rupees 1059 in the rural and rupees 1286 rupees in the urban areas hence after seven five years or uh, after seven five years it appears that even with the best advances that the nation has achieved in many fronts still the foremost aspirations of the majority of the citizen for for simple basic amenities and security is yet to be realized. Uh, coming to Meghalaya, and we see also this is also a very, very uh, same scenario. And uh, though we have a lot of possibility with the immense resources, be it in minerals or in forest resources, but because of other human uh, uh, short uh, lacunas, we are the state has, uh, is also facing the same situation till date, after, even after 50 years. And our, the, the, uh, the percentage of our, the people of our state living below, below poverty line is 12.5%. And we are very, very, very poor in all type of, uh, in each and every aspect of growth and development. I'm not going to speak so much about Meghalaya at the moment because I because these are the statistics that are very very uh, common that you see in your regular statistical handbooks. But these there are certain points that we need to cover that you see about coming to the health sector. Only 42.3, 42.3, a big chunk of it of the state population is still uncovered by health, and. 32.62% of the total population are engaged in economic activities. So therefore, we can understand that the state of Meghalaya is heavily pressurized by a two-third dependency ratio supported by a large but weak agricultural sector. And most of the 
our infrastructure, infrastructure like uh, power, electricity, transport, and so on. So they are, we are still in in a very uh, weak position. So I'm not straight to the point that we are going to speak here about the sustainable uh, living and equal that without compromise. Definition sustainable development is a development maximizing the ability of a future generation to meet their own needs. In short, it in short, it means development that has many scholars have identified three broad issues that the concept of sustainability uh, intends cause that is economic, environmental, and social. So some of the key concepts for sustainability prior some are conversion ecosystem, development of sustainable societies. Conservation of biodiversity, uh, control of population or development of human resources and public participation. Hence, sustainability also aims to address the interrelated societal issues such as poverty, inequality, hunger, and of course, to advocate an eco friendly lifestyle. Eco friendly lifestyle means not, according to Merriam Webster dictionary, means not environmentally harmful. And now we come to another concept. We are, the, the full papers have been already uh, uh, given to the uh, convener. So they, and the another idea which I want to bring in is off the grid or off grid living, a lifestyle without reliance on any public utility. Uh, such a lifestyle involves the supply of own energy, portable water, management of own food and waste. Uh, the lifestyle in many rural area, rural and remote areas of Magalaya, which are devoid of almost all basic amenities, such as electricity, water supply, accessibility, connectivity, health, education, etc., perhaps are very similar to this of grid living concept, which is close to nature. nature. So, on a down-to-earth realistic note, it is understood now that even after 75 years of independence, amidst all achievements we should all be proud of, the struggle is still far from realizing most of the, the aspirations that the nation had anticipated from way back in 1947. Similarly, here in the state, the situation is no better even after 50 years of statehood. So the seemingly unsurmountable task to push ahead the much needed growth and development at the same time maintaining a sustainable multifold conservation and preservation effort is too mind boggling to juggle with. In such a situation, it is understood that everything is stretched to the point of breakdown for governing authorities to provide the countless needful societal deliveries effectively. Thus, perhaps the best alternative at this juncture is to systematize the pace of development on a sustainable, economical need capacity infrastructure infrastructural and capital based mode in sync with the societal, societal status and living standard especially that what we see in the rural uh, rural areas of Megalaya. it is a fact that due to limited accessibility and exposure of proper education and capacity building the majority of the rural population as of now are left ignorant poor, unskilled for any occupation outside the primary avenues they are familiar with. This has left most of them without any possibility to be absorbed in any kind of secondary activities with better earning opportunities or in other or other more formal tertiary activities, let alone the so-called white collar job in established institution, which is totally beyond their expectation because of poor qualification and lack of formal training apparent that the general rural population of Meghalaya is still destined to earn the livelihood as agriculturalists and to supplement the daily requirement from resources extracted from extracted from the uh, already depleted environment for how long for how much long we don't know so some suggestion it is important that each and every citizen of the nation of rich or poor in urban or rural should be ensured of a meaningful and dignified living with assured basic requirements. Having said that, without the, uh, being any commitment for the rural areas, especially education and health facilities, perhaps inculcating or advocating the concept 
of sustainable, eco-friendly, and probably a partial of the grid living or mindset amongst them can surely ease the life or majority of the rural inhabitants of the of Malaya, who are destined to uh, live the life they know best, that is as agriculturists. This is an, uh, this can be very important as it will ensure the commitment within them of the right action towards judicious and sustainable utilization of uh, resources. The lifestyle can also uh, perhaps can also be important mean, means to mitigate wastage, pollution, and all kind of environmental degradation resulting from ignorant activities, for example, like forest fire and so on and so forth. Hence, awareness initiatives related to this subject matter should regularly be made available to the rural communities of Malaya. All government and local authorities should uphold, strengthen, and enforce the rule of law to sustain these natural entities for the survival of the rural population of Malaya. With these inputs and sincere effort from both, both villages and the various stakeholders who are committed to uplift the rural life and protect the environment of Malaya amidst all constraints, surely a pace, a slow pace, sustainable, eco-friendly lifestyle that have learned and understood the art and science to live in harmony with the natural environment would definitely go a long way in pursuing a meaningful uh, uh, limited stress-free uh, living. Uh, I think this will be one of the priorities that the the state and the country as a whole should look forward in the next say, five or fifty years from now. Uh, because as it as it uh, appears now that with all these um, poverty, that uh, 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 low scale development that is happening or going on in the state. I'm, I'm I'm not pessimistic or rather I'm a little bit realistic that I think that this is going to take some some time for the state to see to compare ourselves with other uh, let's say states we are actually now uh, in 2020 we are the 26 ranked 26 states uh, amongst all the states in the in the country and therefore and uh, each and every economic growth and our um, gross domestic uh, gross GDP is also very poor. It could uh, to contribute to the state um, economy and so on and so forth. So I hope that I uh, I don't have any intention to um, to belittle or to say anything with relates to um, poor cold water on our enthusiasm related to this. Um, to to the 75 years that we have uh, enjoyed as an independent country and also for Megalia, this 50 years of statehood. But I hope that with these inputs, we know who we are and where are our directions and what are our aspirations for the future uh, development and future, um, uh, what I mean, growth of the state as a whole. Thank you so much. Uh, can you hear me? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you, uh, thank you Banangram, for that very beautiful presentation. And uh, like I said, the, the question and answer hour has, has, has been uh, set up in the program. It will be at the, the last part of the program. So we'll have the uh, question and answer session at the last part of the uh, program. So yes. now, uh, uh, now I would... Uh, the next paper is going to be jointly uh, presented by two uh, uh, important scholars. They are Master Banshai Kupar Lingdo Maulong and Master Jonister Lingdo uh, El Nonglang. Uh, the title of the paper is Environment Governance in India, an overview of the initiatives since 1947. So may I request the two scholars to kindly uh, present your paper, please. 
Thank you so much uh, for <laughs> your time. Uh, at the outset, I would like to you know, extend my sincere um, gratitude and should I say congratulations to the organizing committee of Sinat College for organizing this uh, important webinar on the celebration of 75 years of uh, our country's independence. <laughs> um, as you have been uh, you know, informed by the uh, chair, um, the title of our presentation will be on environmental governance uh, in India, an overview of the initiative that has been undertaken since 1947. Uh, basically, uh, I would start with, you know, I mean, uh, the introduction of uh, the concept of environmental governance uh, as it is. Now, uh, as the concept itself uh, suggests, the concept of environmental governance is a combination of two uh, uh, words. One is environment and the other part is governance. Now, here, first, I would like to, you know, stress on the concept of governance. Now, usually when we talk of governance, you know, there can be uh, a confusion with the concept of government. Okay. Now, when we talk of government, you know, we usually uh, refer to it in the form of a state mechanism. Or in other words, we can say a single entity, a single institution. Now, when we talk of government, let's say the government of India, we mean the government of India at the central level. That is the legal mechanism which was enshrined in the constitution. Um, yeah. So when we talk of uh, again uh, governance, you know, we means the mechanism which involves you know a lot of entities, a lot of factors. You know, it is uh, should I say a shared responsibility within different actors, both from the uh, constitutional government side and also from the non-formal. Uh, institutions, you know, in the form of it can be uh, a local institution at a traditional level, at the local level, or it can be a non-governmental organization in the form of a pressure group, in the form of an NGOs, or it can be also an individual. So when we talk of governance, you know, we mean the responsibility and the functions, you know, performed by different actors right from the formal institution to the informal institution. And how do they take these decisions? How do they manage, you know, the issues at the ground level? <clears throat> now, coming to environment, when we talk of environment, it goes uh, well saying that, you know, we usually refer to the physical uh, element of uh, the system in which we live in, you know, right from the water, the soil, the air, and the all the organisms, right, from the top level to the microorganisms living in that system. How do these different, <coughs> excuse me, how do these different subsystems cooperate? How do they relate to one another? So now combining these two concepts of environment and uh, governance, uh, governance, you know, when we talk of environmental governance, uh, basically, we would mean how do we humans, you know, how do we manage the environment? How do we control the natural environment? And who make these decisions? Who make decisions? Is it only the government at the uh, constitutional level? Does it involve other actors at the local level? Does it involve uh, non-government organization? And does it involve individuals? Okay. So now before I go into the initiative that has been undertaken in the country since 1947, first I would like to uh, give a brief um, of the concept of the development and the evolution of environmental governance at the international level. Okay. Uh, now, when we're talking of environmental governance at the national level, most of the time, you know, the first um, that came to our mind is the mechanism that is available at the United Nations level. Okay. Now, um, no one can deny that the United Nations, since its inception, you know, has taken a commendable role, you know, in leading the way in regards to how we manage the environment, how we govern the environment. Now, especially now we're living a, in a world, we're living at a period in our civilization that environment has become a crucial issue. Yeah. Now, we have um, um, uh, various environmental issues that is, you know, plaguing our planet at the moment. You can name any, right, from environmental degradation to what 
uh, climate change to global warming and so on and so forth. Now, when we're talking of in Bharat governments at international level, of course, the United Nations, it goes without saying that it is one of the foremost uh, mechanism which is leading the way. But we cannot deny also that apart from the uh, formal institutions of the United Nations, we also have, you know, hundreds of non-governmental organizations who are playing a key role who are playing a key role in how do we manage and how do we govern our environment. Okay. Now, when we talk of the United Nations, of course, um, we can see that the starting point of the um, UN system with regards to environmental governance, maybe um, a lot of scholars um, have agreed that, you know, the United Nations summit, Earth Summit, which was held in Rio de Janeiro in 1992, can be counted as a starting point with when it comes to environmental governance at international level. And since then, we have many institutions, many specialized agencies created as a result of the Earth Summit, specifically de dedicated to environmental governance. Now, for example, we have the UNFCC, which uh, almost everyone of us knows, the United Nations Framework on Climate Change. And we have the United Nations Nation Commission on Sustainable Development. And of course, we have, should I say, the, one of the most recent is the United Nations Environment Program. And we also have, you know, the coming together of different governments at the United Nations levels in the form of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. So these are the few examples of, you know, the various agencies and convention available at the United Nations level how to manage how do we govern the environment at the international level now coming to the role of the non-governmental organization now uh, no one can deny that apart from the formal uh, institutions of the un we have again just repeat myself various institutions who have performed who have performed a very commendable role when it comes to environmental governance yeah for example we have the greenpeace then we have the green cross international then we have the World Wildlife, Worldwide Fund for Nature. And we have the Friends of the Earth. Now, we can name uh, hundreds and thousands of these non-governmental organizations you know, who are pushing the United Nations, who are pushing uh, sovereign states to take environmental governance, to take how we manage the environment at, you know, more seriously. Because as it is, you know, uh, we shall come to the, to the end of my presentation that, you know, uh, in spite of the increasing rate of environmental governance, of environmental degradation and destruction of the environment, the extraction of resources, you know, the concept, I mean, this issue of environmental governance has more than often been left to the periphery. It has not, uh, it has yet to assume, you know, uh, the main significance when it comes to pol policy and decision making. Now, with that uh, introduction, I would like to, you know, uh, go to the uh, main um, part of uh, our presentation. That is the concept. I mean, the issue of environmental governance in our country. Okay. Now, um, when we're talking of environmental governance in India, you know, I would like to categorize the, you know, the role of the different actors into two different categories. Okay. First one is the role of the state actors. And secondly is the role of the non-state actors. Now, when we talk of, uh, firstly, state actors, you know, we usually refer to the legal, the constitutional, or we can say the formal mechanism available with the state uh, machinery. Now, it can be in the form of uh, uh, ministries of the government, for example, the Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, or it can be in the form of uh, departments at the state uh, level, or it can be in the form of, you know, a legislation passed by the either the state legislature or the central legislature. Yeah. And also, we may add to the uh, state actors in the form of judgments given by the uh, Courts from time to time. Now, for example, we have no dirt of judgments uh, given by the uh, High Courts and the Supreme Court in relation to environment. Okay. Now, we are all aware of that, you know, banning of uh, timber in Meghalaya is the result of the um, P 
PIL, which is filed in the Supreme Court and the judgment which followed uh, thereafter. And the same case can be said about the banning of uh, coal uh, mining in Meghalaya. Now, the government of India uh, has, you know, over the years, instituted a number of legislation when it comes to protection of the environment. Okay. We can name more than 100 of these um, uh, legislation which is passed from time to time to govern and to manage the environment. Okay, now, for example, we have the uh, National uh, uh, Action Plan on Climate Change, which was passed in 2008. Then we have the National uh, Green Tribunal Act of 2010. Then we have the National Environment uh, Policy of 2006. And also we have the Environment Conservation Act of 1956. These are uh, um, some of the major legislation which was passed by the government of India. Now, beside these, we have many other legislation. We have many a uh, large number of rules and regulation which were framed from time to time. Yeah. So as to guide the policy makers, how do we manage, how do we govern, how do we use our natural resources? And uh, like I said earlier, we also have these uh, state legislation. You know, different states of the country have passed different legislation. They have different forest act, they have different environment acts, and also some states have come up with uh, action plan on climate change, uh, which uh, uh, the government of Megara has also done recently. Okay. Now, apart from these legislation, like I mentioned earlier, we also have court rulings, you know, which are passed from time to time, you know, to give a sense of direction to the executive branch and legislative branch, how do we manage the environment? Now, coming to the second part of the um, uh, actors which are involved in environmental governance, is the role of the non-state actors. Now, we cannot deny that these non-state actors, they have played a very important role when it comes to environmental governance in the countries. Now, I have categorized these non state actors into three different categories. Now, first of all, I would talk of indigenous or we can say traditional societies. Some might prefer the word tribal societies. Uh, secondly, we have the non-governmental organization. And thirdly, we have, you know, uh, environmentalists who are working sometimes at the individual level. <laughs> now, uh, Firstly, when we talk of indigenous or tribe or uh, traditional societies, now the role of these indigenous or traditional societies, you know, has been recognized even at the international level, at the United Nations level. Now, the United Nations has recognized, in fact, it has affirmed that these traditional societies, they were once the keepers of the environments. Okay? Now, what happened along the way, that is, you know, uh, a point of debate for us uh, here today. Now, when we talk of traditional societies of, mega, of uh, India, we can find across the country in different states, right, from uh, Maharashtra in the um, west to Manipur in the east, from uh, Tamil Nadu in the south to Kashmir in the north, we'll find hundreds of these traditional societies, you know, who have been preserving the environment in their traditional methods. Now, one of such methods, which you know was commonly known to all of us, is in the form of conservation of forests, in the form of sacred growth or protected growth, which you know uh, our state of Meghalaya is known for. Now, these traditional societies they have been using their indigenous wisdom to conserve the environment since, uh, should I say, time immemorial, but. However, along the way, there we have witnessed, we have seen you know, the erosion of these uh, traditional values, the erosion of these environmental ethics of these traditional societies. And of course, it's a challenge. Okay? Now, for example, in Megalia today, of course, uh, officially we have 101, uh, you know, sacred or grove, but, you know, uh, most of these, they are on the verge of degrading or are degrading. Now, uh, secondly, when we talk of non-governmental organization, again here we have uh, numerous uh, organization, right, from the national level to the state level and to the local level, you know, who have, who are still, you know, performing 
a very important role, not only how to manage the environment, but also you know, to exert mm, pressure on the government to take this issue more seriously. And lastly, we also have these individuals, you know, and uh, should I say environmentalists, you know, who are performing a very commendable role on environmental governance. Now we have numerous examples of different individuals in different states of the country, you know, who are taking up a very, very um, uh, a commendable role in preserving the environment at their individual level. Now, basically, this is what, uh, you know, um, I propose that the you know the structure of environmental governance in India has been uh, since 1947. We have the state actors on the one side, and we have the non-state actors on the other side. Now I'll come to the final part of my presentation. You know, now what are the issues and challenges which uh, uh, environmental governance in India is facing? Now we have seen that we have numerous laws. We have different actors performing at different levels. Now. One can see that we have 200 plus, plus laws. We have different uh, institutions, different agencies, you know, trying to manage and trying to protect the environment at different levels. But somehow the state of the environment in India is not improving. In fact, one can say that, you know, we are degrading day by day. Now, according to the uh, report of uh, the government of India, still the forest report, our forest cover is decreasing day by day. So something must be wrong somewhere. Okay. Now, uh, I have identified, you know, a few issues and challenges which, you know, uh, we are facing as a country at the moment. Now, firstly, I would like to mention that the first is, you know, the unrestricted and the unabated use of uh, non-renewable source of energy now we are a country you know we are second uh, i mean um, uh, in the world in a form of you know emission of uh, greenhouse gases now why is it so because we mostly use non-renewable source of energy okay now uh, in our country the major part of the energy requirements come from fossil fuels and we all know that fossil fuels are one of the uh, factors you know contributing to the increasingly you know deterring state of the environment and especially in terms of greenhouse effect now uh, secondly uh we in the country you know should i say we are following the model of development which is unsustainable now for uh, i can uh, give for example the issue of uh, mining in the state of megalia now, now, we all know that our m model of mining, you know, is obsolete and outdated. Okay. And uh, up now, apart from these mining issues, we also have urbanization and we have land use in the form of agriculture, again, which is unscientific, again, which is unsustainable. Now, thirdly, we have loopholes in this different legislation passed by the center and state. I think I'm running out of time. I just finish it up. Uh, that, that's what I meant to say. Yeah, 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 yeah. And we have, you know, uh, the lack of political will from, I mean, from those who are in power. Yeah, more often than not, perpetrators of environmental, you know, destruction are being protected. Now, also we have, you know, an implementation mechanism which is uh, most of the time toothless or ineffective. Uh, and lastly, I must say that, you know, there is, you know, a lack of coordination between the different actors from the center, the state level and the local level. So uh, these are, uh, in my opinion, the issues which we are facing as a country right now when it comes to environmental governance. Now, my time is running out, so I would leave the uh, um, rest of the uh, presentation, uh, you know, in, in the form of Q&A. Thank you so much uh, for your time. And I, uh, thank you so much. I'll leave the time back. Hand back, then back to you, sir. Thank you so much. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Banshai, for long. Thank you for that very beautiful presentation. Um, uh, the next paper is uh, on a theme called the ecological blueprint of India and its uh, choreography. So, and uh, this paper is going to be presented by Mr. Ivan Kar. Even care, Khairim Random. Uh, so may I may I request uh, Mr. Even care, Khairim, to present his paper, and you have ten minutes. 
Thank you. Do we have Ivanka Kairim? Uh, Rundem? Hello. Oh, yes, yes. Hello. Yes. Please, sir, can please, you hear please. me? Yes, definitely. Okay. Sure, sure. All right. Uh, a please, very good please, afternoon please. to our chairperson, my fellow participants, and everyone present. I would like to extend my gratitude to CNOT College for organizing this uh, webinar. And uh, my topic, actually, my title for today's uh, webinar is The Ecological Blueprint of India and Its Choreography. So without further ado, let me get started. Um, India gained its independence at a grave price, not only in the form of bloodshed, but at the expense of partition. Apart from the segregation of political boundaries, India was heralded into an atmosphere that now had a strained relationship with its forests and wildlife, owing to the laxity of the governing bodies and a disposition to garner foreign investments and trade. Subsequent to its liberation from colonial rule, strategies and designs were formulated for strengthening the bonds of the people with their government, as independent India was born under a socialist regime. The goal was to exercise frugality and draw upon the spirit of nationalism by erecting the pillars of a modern nation. While India was known for its surplus exports, the land and its people which produced them had been under strain for quite some time. Now, following independence, the plans which were drawn up to strengthen the nation were to the extent possible supposed to be through means of self-sufficiency. With this in mind, the multifaceted hydropower projects were proposed, which would be capable of reducing the occurrence of floods while also having the cap capacity and capability to generate electricity and provide irrigation in the lean seasons. Now, conversely, the issue of irrigation took on a new facade, one in which the rivers of the country would be interlinked, thereby reducing the disparages of floods and droughts that plagued the country as a whole. It was a Herculean task which garnered support from all the respective states, but one which was also short-lived as fervor dissipated and differences began to settle in. The treasure cove of forests and wildlife had also been suffering for quite some time by the onset of independence, bringing down the populations and even leading to the extinction of certain animals such as the Indian cheetah. Further, an expansion of anthropogenic activities for agriculture and industry had led to the considerable denudation of vast areas of jungles. With time, the valuation of biodiversity was highlighted and a more intensive kind of agriculture was put forth rather than an extensive one. Now, although strides were made in terms of policies and laws, not forgetting the magnanimous Project Tiger, precarious conservation efforts show that the country has the capacity to improve by leaps and bounds, if it can channel its resources and public opinion astutely. Now, this has warranted Conservation International to delineate four biodiversity hotspots spanning across India till date. As of December 2020, India has a total area of 1,71,921 square kilometers that fall under its protected areas network. Now, moving on, when we talk about the term revolution, in India, it has been largely linked with the phenomena of definitive transformation in the sphere of food and agriculture. While the Green Revolution introduced the use of genetically modified seeds and boosted production, the White Revolution, or Operation Flood, ensued a healthy supply of dairy products. The Gru Revolution, an active revolution in the fishery sector, is exploring the country's capacity for aquaculture. All in all, various plans and missions of illustrious grandeur have been pitched and paraded across the decades from the time of independence. 
For instance, it is only now, in the first few decades of this century, that all villages have been connected to the power grid and where pipe connections to every household will be realized in the next few years. Albeit, the surface water supply is not sufficient for the entire population. Even groundwater sources are either being depleted or rendered unfit for consumption at an alarming rate. However, efforts have been made to strengthen the water basins in the country, and some desalination plants are also being commissioned around the coastal areas. Now, when we talk about desalination plants, the big ecological concern surrounding it is the production and discharge of highly concentrated brine. A mitigative approach to this issue is the integrated process of desalination and salt production. That being said, it has now been over nine decades since the Dundee March, and India presently ranks as the third largest producer of salt globally. However, the industry is now facing a challenge with the ongoing climate change. Perhaps the integrated desalination and salt production plants are the need of the hour, which may also strengthen a much needed water revolution in the country. Nonetheless, another major milestone for India is the widespread extent and apparent success of the Swachh Bharat Abhiyan, an initiative which, is, which has long been professed and embodied by M.K. Gandhi. Now, for those of us who feel that our environment is under strain or that we are not doing enough to conserve it, the bigger question is the underlying cause of the strain. Though India has faced extreme drought and famine over the past few centuries, its population has, on average, grown exponentially. A healthy population requires a healthy amount of space and other resources to function properly. While the responsibility of keeping this balance is often mounted on the government, it is plain to see that this requires a more decentralized approach, one which requires the active participation of its citizens. The ascension of the Kaira District Cooperative Milk Producers Union Limited to the globally renowned Anand Milk Union Limited, or AMUL, is a perfect example of how communities can lead by example to showcase a sustainable model of living. At the individual level, having some home gardens can go a long way, not only in providing sustenance, but also in helping the drawdown of greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. The Ashok Patika, a precursor of the home gardens, even finds mention and is illustrated in the Ramayana and the Mahabharata. In the spirit of cohesion that our forefathers believed in, if we were to come together to resolve our differences, our country would excel on all fronts. The modest dream of building dams across rivers or the interlinking of rivers would help in securing water and electricity for all the citizens of the country without having to rely solely on non-renewable sources. Perhaps in places where feasible, hybrid projects could be set up, which can tap into other forms of renewable energy, such as a solar-powered water harvester. Yes, it is understandable that the fabric of the lives of people in the immediate vicinity of such projects would be eroded. However, under the terms of the environmental clearances, there are provisions for the rehabilitation and compensation of such people, which, if followed to the letter, safeguard the interests of such people and the environment in that particular area. Now, the Environmental Impact Assessment 2020 draft rules have come under public outcry for their boldness. But when we consider the industrial and economic progress which the country is in dire need of, they seem necessary. Let us not forget that when Lord Dalhousie came to India as the Governor General and first proposed his grand plan for the railways, the Indian nationalists had slandered it for the excessive use of public funds and even deemed it unnecessary as the same amount could rather be used for developing the irrigation network, which would increase the output of Indian agriculture. Then again, the first meeting in 1885 of the Indian National Congress in Bombay would have been very cumbersome if its delegates had not been ushered in record time by the railway. Even the presses, which heralded and played such an important and crucial role in the freedom struggle, would not have been so widespread had it not been for the railways 
a legacy which lives on till today. India has come a long way since its independence. And while some may argue that its people have lost faith in the system, it is to be garnered that no system or plan is perfect. Despite the variables and vagaries, what makes them work is not intention alone, but the ability of their caretakers to adapt to changes while being backed by the support and functional movement involvement of the people to whom they owe their allegiance to. With that, I conclude my paper. Thank you. Thank you, thank you for the, the paper. Thank you, Bhavinder. Um, um, uh, may I ask the organizer how many, uh, much time do we have for Q and A? I think we have another ten minutes. Sir. So let us not, uh, let us devote this very limited time to you know uh, spend this time on the question and answer on the three papers that have been presented. And kindly make your question brief or your uh, comment also very brief so that uh, uh, many of us can participate. Thank you. open for Q&A and then comments, please. I invite everybody to join in. I have one question. Please to that the future generation will not get into trouble. That's not audible. It's not audible. Very well, sir. Okay, so okay. May I, may I request questions and comments on the three papers that have been presented today? on the chat box. Organizer, can you share the question, please? Hello? I said I, I thought there's some question on the chat box, but I could not uh, access it. So may I, may I request the organizer, yeah. the organizer to to read the question okay, for us? Let, let, let me share a question here. Uh, this is a question come from Rilumlang Chukam. I think it's an open question. Uh, uh, the question is, how can we manage that the future generation will not get into, into trouble? Uh, this question was quite abrupt, but I think it's talking about environment. How do, how do we manage the environment? That the future generation which uh, will not get into trouble because the other papers presented in this session related to ecosystem and eco
Okay, okay. So thank you, thank you, Pierre. So may I request any of the, you know, the present, you know, the people who present the paper to answer the question, please. So can you hear me? Hello. Yes, yes, we can hear you, sir. So we're related to the question, how can we manage that the future generation will not get into trouble? And I think judicious use of the environmental resources, I think that is the one of the most... I think that's one last question, Mr. Rum. Uh, was a cornerstone that will uh, uh, ensure that our future generation will not get into trouble. It should go in line with that, the, the Brundtland uh, definition of uh, sustainable development. A development that does not that uh, that does not jeopardize the ability of the future generation to do the to 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 sustain them and on and on. Uh, kind of sustainable development means something that lasts forever. In fact, I think that is what is the uh, Mr. Rilum Lang Kiutam is uh, want to be answered. Thank you, thank you, Mr. Nongrum. May I ask Maulong and Rendem if they want to add anything on that? Sir, in addition to Sir Nongrum's um, statement just now, I agree with the judicious use of resources. I would also like to point out that in the natural systems, there is something called a closed loop system, wherein the input and output is, I mean, there's a feedback mechanism in which there is no wastage. So, and this is what we've been trying to do in the past few years, even in architecture, in our energy sector. For example, in architecture, we're trying to use um, biophilic designs. And in, for example, in the energy sector, we're now moving towards renewables. So these will help us conserve resources. The key point here being the conservation and judicious use. Thank you. Thank you, Barandam. So do we have any more questions or anybody want to add to that? Uh, any question? Can we have more question, please? This is a very interesting. Okay, that we just have this one. The paper have been, have been well presented, so thank you, thank you for that. Uh, may I request people to make uh, comments or uh, you know just ask questions? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. I hear some some sound, but it, it's not audible. Okay, so if uh, Nobody is uh, having any more questions, or they, nobody would like to ask. I mean, to make any comment. Uh, okay. So now uh, to conclude this session, uh, I um, I'm very. Uh, Grateful to the organization, uh, the organizer of this uh, webinar, uh, Synod College. Uh, like I said at the in the introduction, I was not, and you know, I was informed about this uh, seminar. Uh, okay, there's one question. I I think, Kerli, uh, uh, if you like to read that question, I'm open to ask questions. So please, if we still have time, I think. We still have time. Yeah, yeah, yes, sir. 
uh, is a comment uh, from Soma Gupta. Let me read it. A man's relationship with environment, if giving and taking, one must ensure that we give back to the environment as much as we take from it. It's a comment, sir. It's a comment okay. from Soma Gupta. Okay. okay. One Thank must you. ensure that we what that what we give to the environment as much as we take from it. Yeah, it's all it's a comment, sir. Okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mr. Nangrum. Thank you, Mr. Maulong and uh, Mr. Nandam for this uh, paper. I personally have been, uh, I have learned so much from the papers. Uh, and, uh, and I hope uh, all the suggestion that has been uh, made on your papers, I think uh, uh, we will be uh, Having the opportunity to make use of those, uh, myself as uh, a writer, I would like to, I, I, maybe at some point of time, I would use all of those uh, suggestions that has been uh, made. And as you know, environment is very deep, uh, very close to my heart. So uh, thank you for all these uh, beautiful papers and all the uh, information and the suggestion that you have been given through this paper. Uh, I hope, uh, uh, as I mean, I, I would, as a country, we still have a long way to go. We have been, you know, journeyed 75 years still today, and we still have a long way to go, especially with regard to, you know, environmental protection. So I hope seminar like this, which, uh, you know, especially, uh, concentrated on the sustainable development and how we deal with the environment is are very important. So I'm, I'm very grateful to Synod College for organizing this seminar. And uh, I hope uh, we will be having many more of this kind of seminar. So thank you for joining us in the session. Thank you, everybody. And thank you, especially to the uh, paper presenter. Thank you very much. And the session is over. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. May, may I request everybody to on your camera at least at the end of the session <laughs> so we can see each other. <laughs> okay, so. Okay, thank you. Okay. <laughs> thank you. Okay. Actually, if thank we can you. have a screenshot of that, if the organizer can have a screenshot of that, maybe that will be. They will just. David, you can uh, do it. Yes, sir. It's uh, done. It's done, sir. Okay, sir. So, okay. Okay. Done. So please do this good challenge. Sir. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, I think we are on schedule as far as the time is concerned in the fitness of the preparations uh, for this particular session. We should start at the outset. I would like to welcome Professor Srikant Kondapalli, uh, Professor in Chinese Studies in the Jawaharlal Nehru University. So on behalf of the organizing committee of this webinar and on behalf of Sina College, we warmly welcome you uh, to this special talk that you are going to deliver to you. And I thank Ms. Emerald thank you for having connected with you and convinced you to join us today. We are very privileged to have you in our midst. Sir. And I would like to just say a few words with regard to the immense uh, contribution that Professor Kondapalli has made to his area of studies, particularly Chinese studies. 
Uh, professor Srikant Mandapalli is a professor in Chinese studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University. He was also the chairman of the Center for East Asian Studies at the School of International Studies at JNU in different periods of time, beginning from 2008 till 2020. Of course, there were gaps in between, but then we see from the immense work that he has done, he was never really free, but has been very busy, particularly uh, in various universities in China. Uh, he has been a visiting fellow at various universities, a visiting professor, and also an honorary professor. The list of universities is in fact very long, and pro probably I should uh, keep the time for Sir to share uh, his personal academic uh, journey in this. Uh, Professor Monopoli has also uh, contributed and authored two books on China's military, LA in Transition in 1999, and another book on China's naval power in 2001. He has also authored two monographs and edited six volumes, not to mention the, the, the uh, vast number of uh, papers that he would have authored and contributed in various journals as well as edited volumes. So this speaks much about the immense contribution that Sir has made as a teacher, uh, as an academician, particularly in this area of interest. And to conclude, I would also like to share uh, with the audience today, especially our students, that uh, Sir Kondapalli has also received the prestigious Kills uh, Ramanian Award uh, in the year 2010 for excellence in research in strategic and security studies. And this was presented to him by none other than the Minister of Defense himself, the A.K. Anthony, if I'm not mistaken, sir. Uh, with these few words, I feel that I've taken quite a bit of time, uh, but I would hand over this time now to Professor Kondopali to share with us his presentation on the India-China relations since independence. Sir. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Lindo. Uh, and uh, let me also thank the uh, Synod College uh, for this wonderful organization of 75 years of India's independence. Uh, what it means in uh, economy, politics, foreign policy, society, last one and a half days, so you have been discussing this with uh, experts. Uh, and this is a major contribution by the Synod College. Uh, let me congratulate you once again, you, your colleagues, students, and others uh, who have been uh, able to put together all these things. So this is a very important contribution because uh, as you mentioned in the uh, concept note, uh, it is necessary for us to uh, look at the past, but also look at the present and what it means for the future. Um, what steps need to be taken in order to uh, better the future? Uh, so the, uh, this is a very grand uh, subject uh, that you have, 75 years of independence, uh, absolutely uh, first rate uh, in terms of conceiving uh, such a topic. And while my focus is always been uh, on China, uh, let me just reflect on a few points on uh, Indian foreign policy in the past uh, 75 years. Uh, look at the past so that we can look at the present and then the uh, the future possibilities. So uh, uh, let me thank the Synod College, uh, colleagues, students, friends. Um, a very good afternoon to you all. So when India has achieved significant progress uh, compared to several post-colonial societies, in terms of governance, continuing democratic experiments, inclusivity, economic development. We are today sixth largest economy in the world. Uh, it's no uh, easy uh, thing to become the sixth largest. Uh, we also have a huge national security uh, establishment. Uh, and in the recent times, we have taken undertaken several national security initiatives. Uh, foreign policy as well has become much more complex and professional in the past seven decades. 
Uh, so as the sixth largest economy, we have the supply chain resilience. Uh, we have also focused in our foreign policy on equity and justice. Uh, for instance, we have donated 66 million doses of vaccine um, prior to the second surge uh, in April to very poor countries who have no R&D in the vaccine development, no wherewithal to reach out to the vaccine. So we have also given these act grants or even at commercial prices, these are given at $4, $5, while major companies like Pfizer, Moderna, AstraZeneca, or Sinopharma, the Chinese vaccines, they're all being sold at $70 or $80. So there is that equity and justice that India had in uh, as its one of the core visions in foreign policy. Uh, this is also reflected in the G77 countries that India is close with, especially in debates related to the WTO, World Trade Organization, in terms of the subsidies uh, and other, because agriculture, other aspects are very crucial for India, but also for other developing countries. So India's focus in WTO is a major uh, uh, stance that is very important for us to understand in this part of equity and justice. Uh, there is also the Indian interaction in G20 and other multilateral institutions like uh, United Nations, where India crafted the post-colonial discourse in terms of non-alignment, but also in terms of development of the underdeveloped areas. Uh, so there has been a lot of focus that India had in these seven decades. On climate change issues, we have with the basic countries, Brazil, South Africa, India, China, we have also crafted the idea of equal but differentiated responsibilities. This is in the background of the developed countries whose manufacturing sector came about from the industrial revolution some three centuries ago. They have been building up the stock of emissions while we just began industrialization. So equal, we are willing to reduce our emissions. In fact, we are meeting the deadlines and other criteria in emission control. Uh, equal but differentiated responsibility. Differentiated for those less developed countries, they need to do the manufacturing sector because that creates a lot of jobs. So in other words, this is one crucial area. Uh, in India's experience in the last seven decades, we also focused on national security in protecting our sovereignty and territorial integrity, uh, as well as in the areas of uh, 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 the national security discourse. We have done uh, relatively well compared to many developing countries. There are certain blocks, but nevertheless, we have done relatively very well by crafting away from this, the then superpowers Cold War politics, we had the non-alignment movement. Uh, today, it has less relevance, more focus on counter-terrorism. Nevertheless, we have had huge initiative along with Egypt, Yugoslavia, and Burma, Indonesia. We have crafted the Afro-Asian unity, non-alignment movement, and others. So away from the East-West confrontation and protected the national sovereignty and territorial integrity. Today, we have, with the disintegration of the Soviet Union in 1991, we have shifted from look East policy of the 90s to the act East policy, as Prime Minister Modi announced in Nyapidov in Myanmar in 2015. The broad features of Indian foreign policy uh, are focused on, of course, protecting our own borders. Uh, that is related to the Kashmir-related aspects, as well as the dispute with Pakistan or dispute with China, while amicably resolving several disputes with Sri Lanka, Myanmar, 
with Indonesia, with Thailand in the maritime domain, uh, with Nepal, with Bangladesh, or with other countries. So we have been able to uh, do focus on the sovereignty and territorial integrity aspects. However, the major challenge for Indian foreign policy came from China, which is also my focus in this interaction with you today. Um, uh, China is a big country in Asia with population, territory, military, uh, economy today, uh, and others. While we started almost uh, at the same level in the 1940s, nevertheless, today China is the second largest economy in the world. It is also a Security Council member and has been at the, uh, at the cusp of becoming a major power in the world with its Belt and Road Initiative and other aspects. Uh, it has now been very forthcoming on several initiatives. However, China's assertiveness and aggressiveness is also impacting several neighboring countries uh, and also India in particular. For instance, the South China Sea dispute or the Senkaku Islands dispute with Japan and with the South China Sea, with Vietnam, Philippines, Malaysia, Brunei, and other countries, China has been very assertive in these places. So as a reflection of this, we have seen the territorial dispute with China hotting up, both in the late 1950s and currently. In the 50s, since it began with the Chipchap Valley in the Western sector in 1959, that led to armed skirmishes in 1962. It was a brief uh, uh, military engagement, not a complete war um, in terms of the casualties or the extent. Nevertheless, what is important is that left an indelible mark on the bilateral relations. Today, we have lost 20 Indian soldiers on June 15, 2020, last year. And the last one and a half year, this has become a major issue. When Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi visited China in 1988, we cobbled up in the joint statement a provision that unless until peace and tranquility prevail, we will not be able to focus on the other aspects of the bilateral relations, like economy, people-to-people -people contacts, or on other fronts. Um, so. This has become a stumbling block today in terms of the India-China relations. But India-China relations also have acquired a lot of depth uh, as civilizational states. They also supported each other in the national, post-colonial national movements in 1930s and 40s. Chiang Kai-shek, representing the Republic of China, visited the Mahatma Gandhi uh, and others uh, there is also the Asian Relations Conference, which the Tibetans and the Republic of China participated in in 1947, when Jawaharlal Nehru was crafting the Asian countries' unity, Afro-Asian countries' unity, and so on. Uh, today, we have joined in several multilateral institutions, like the United Nations, like the BRICS, like Russia, India, China, like the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We also coordinate between uh, India and China in the WTO or in G20 or on climate change that I just alluded to. So the interaction has been very intense, so much so when the International Monetary Fund was reorganized since 2010, India and China's voting rights in the IMF have been increased uh, relatively uh, uh, higher in proportion. So today, China has over 6% voting rights, while India has over 3% voting rights in the IMF. Uh, and this is conducive for the reorganization of the Bretton Woods institutions, where we are co coordinating with the Chinese in this process. Uh, of course, the territorial dispute has been a major stumbling block in the bilateral relations. Although China doesn't want to resolve the problem and wants to 
uh, create constituencies in economy, trade, investments, the apps, or others, and at the moment is unwilling to resolve the problem despite 36 years of discussions at various levels of joint working group meetings or currently the 22 special representative meetings on the territorial dispute. So these have gone relatively slow and that is a major concern. Uh, also, the countries, the third country's role has become a major problematic in the bilateral relations. China cites the Quad, the Quadrilateral Security Dialogue, and the other military sales from US to India as concerns. Although at one, one time in 1980s, China did import weapons from the United States. In 1986, they have imported several avionics head up display systems, or including Black Hawk helicopters, which are now located in Tibet. Um, with the Tiananmen Square incident, the Americans imposed a trade embargo on arms. And this also includes the European Union, which also had banned arms sales to the Chinese. Uh, since India has been um, approaching several countries, in order to enhance its security uh, architecture. China has expressed concerns on this, although previously China itself had good relations with all those countries. The other third party here is Pakistan, with which China has an all-weather friendship and has uh, also exchanged the sensitive data related to the nuclear weapons and the ballistic missile technologies, in addition to conventional weapons, and today is involved in the CPEC projects passing through the disputed Kashmir region, uh, and hence. So the concerns of India are expressed, and this is the reason why India did not join the Belt and Road Initiative, uh, citing the sovereignty concerns on Kashmir. Nevertheless, we have followed an engagement policy with China. Uh, we have over 30 uh, arrangements with China at various levels. For example, the Prime Minister's office has the special representative mechanism. Uh, as I just alluded to, some 22 meetings have taken place. Then we have also the two informal summit meetings in Wuhan and in Chennai in 2018 and 2019 as a new form of resolving issues. Uh, and then we also have the foreign ministry strategic dialogues between the two countries. The HRD ministry, the Ministry of Education fellowships, the cultural exchange programs have been initiated after Prime Minister Rajiv Gandhi's visit um, since the early 1990s. As a result, many Indians have gone to China to study and acquire skills. Uh, I'm myself a beneficiary of the cultural exchange program between the HRD ministries of India and China. Uh, there is also the people-to-people -people contacts. Uh, we have had tourism, although less number of Chinese tourists, while more number of Indian tourists to China, around three to four lakh Indian tourists compared to about one lakh Chinese tourists to India. So this explains to the lack of enthusiasm on the part of China, which had seen 160 million tourists going abroad from China. Nevertheless, we just had about 100,000 coming to India. Although India has launched the Incredible India campaign and has a lot of diversity uh, and places to visit, Nevertheless, not many Chinese tourists have made it to India. Uh, we, nevertheless, we still have other engagement policies like the financial dialogue, the steel dialogue. Uh, we also have the Reserve Bank of India uh, thinking of having the regional currencies uh, being exchanged, the rupee and renminbi exchange program. Uh, we also have the annual defense dialogues between China and India. 
Um, some of these have not happened, but uh, annual dialogues have been relatively the norm in India-China relations, which included the hand-in-hand -hand, uh, joint operations in countering terrorism. Uh, the home ministries also have some collaboration in counter-terrorism efforts. Uh, so these 30 different dialogue aspects have been able to create uh, engagement between the two. Although we do have policy options related to balance of power, status quo, or even containment, China's arms transfer to Pakistan is generally seen in India as containment of India. Uh, nevertheless, India had so far not articulated a policy of containment of China. Uh, in fact, when Dr. Manmohan Singh uh, visited China in 2009, he told the then Chinese President Hu Jintao that India is not part of the containment of China. Prime Minister Modi, addressing the Shangri-La Dialogue uh, some three years ago, uh, he stated that the Quad is going to be inclusive and India is not targeting any specific country uh, as part of its Indo-Pacific idea. In fact, Prime Minister Modi mentioned about the inclusivity and ASEAN centrality of the Indo-Pacific idea as visualized by the Indian side. Um, nevertheless, the Chinese side has been, been very critical of the Quad without providing conditions for security in the uh, border areas. As we speak, there are roughly about 60,000 Chinese troops located in the western sector of the India-China border in Ladakh, opposite to Ladakh. Uh, and the entire line of actual control also has some sporadic transgressions and deployment of forces here and there that suggests to the securitization of the border areas currently as we are witnessing. India had mobilized 90,000 troops, but obviously China has the technical superiority, more important, the missile superiority. Uh, having said that, India had stood the ground um, and in the past several months since June last year, there is the hard mobilization of both uh, personal as well as material in the border areas. So as a result of this, there is a specific uh, concern that has been expressed in terms of the LAC becoming LOC, line of control as it exists between India and Pakistan. So in this background, I would like to highlight a few points. India and China trace their um, development and increase prior to the Industrial Revolution, where they used to control roughly about 70 to 80 percent of the GDP of the world. India was at a very higher level contributing to roughly about 34% of GDP during, the, uh, during the, the first century AD. It declined with, with the Industrial Revolution and, of course, British colonial practices in India. In the case of China, it used to be 26% of global GDP during the times of Jesus. Uh, it increased substantially during the 1800s, during the Qing dynasty, but drastically reduced to becoming an underdeveloped country. And since the reforms in 1978, today they have become the second largest economy in the world. So both India and China trace civilizational states status, but also that their GDP has been very high. The gross domestic product till roughly 19th century has been very high. So this has been a major discussion format uh, between the two sides. How to re-rise in the international system. So they coordinated in several multilateral institutions. 
but today are at loggerheads in the bordering areas. Now that there is COVID-19, last one and a half years, the globe has been impacted upon with the virus originating in Wuhan. In October, November 2019, and January 23rd last year, Chinese have imposed a lockdown on Wuhan. Uh, however, by this time, 5 million tourists from Wuhan have fanned out into different parts of the world, and that resulted in the global pandemic. For instance, three students from Wuhan, Indian students, went back home. So they flew from Wuhan to Kunming, Kunming to Kolkata, because that's the cheapest way. From Kolkata, they took a train and went to Kerala, their hometown. And on the way, they had several other probably infections. We also received infections from the Italian travelers, from others from Qom in Iran or from Mecca, who landed in Mumbai airport. So today we have nearly two to three lakh infections and several, uh, nearly three lakh people dead. So with COVID-19, this is an extraordinary situation. While we coordinate with China on this issue, there is still a problematic on the border aspects. So broadly, we have areas of engagement. We also have areas of balance of power or even status quo. For example, India did not join the RCEP, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, by citing the original document of the RCEP, which has the provisions related to equity, related to justice. Uh, India has an unfavorable balance of trade with many countries which it had signed FTAs, free trade areas, or SEPA agreements, comprehensive economic partnership agreements. For instance, India has something like $60 billion of trade deficit in favor of China. Cumulatively, in the last 12 years, India lost nearly $950 billion in terms of trade deficits. So since Wuhan meeting between Prime Minister Modi and President Xi Jinping, there was a provision to import more Indian products. However, still, China does not allow the Indian pharmaceuticals nor the Indian software companies to do business in China. So as a result, the trade deficits have been increasing uh, substantially. And this has been one major concern for not joining the RCEP. New Zealand, other countries also were cited as part of the RCEP uh, issue. So, India followed a status quo policy in regard to this. In addition, India did not join the Belt and Road Initiative, citing the CPEC China Pakistan Economic Corridor projects passing through Kashmir in Gilgit, Pakistan, and POK areas, Pakistan occupied Kashmir regions. So, in this background, India also followed several status quo uh, areas. Now, most of the audience, I'm sure, would be interested more on what happened in Galwan. Uh, and since this has been a major uh, turning point in India-China relations, let me briefly touch upon the Galwan-related incident. Of course, we have had previously, in 1962, a border clash. We also had the, uh, the uh, 1967 um, uh, Natula Jelakla incident. We also had the Tulungla incident in Arunachal Pradesh in 1975, where four Assam rifles soldiers were killed by Chinese soldiers. And then last year in June, where we lost 20 Indian soldiers. 
The Russian news agency TASS said 45 Chinese soldiers were killed, while China acknowledged only four deaths in this skirmish in Galwan. So why did this happen? Dr. Jay Shankar, the external affairs minister, mentioned that there is the problem in understanding China because we have had several confidence building measures signed between both sides since 1978, but the 93-96-2005-2013 provided for substantial input in terms of the CBMs, confidence building measures. Now, regardless of this, because these have provisions for not mobilizing forces across the border, China mobilized two divisions in March last year, and that aggravated the situation, even when India is seized of the COVID-19 related cases, there is also a situation on the border. So China stated that it is trying to protect its sovereignty. Previously, China stated that this is a disputed territory between India and China. But they have now increased the intensity by saying this is their sovereign territory. Secondly, China also argued the formation of Ladakh Union territory as illegal. Although this is a domestic affair, and the parliament, both the Lok Sabha and the Rajya Sabha, had passed the, in August 2019, the law abrogating the 370 article and creating JNK Union Territory and Ladakh Union Territory. The Chinese termed this as illegal in nature. And they also raised issues in the Security Council on Kashmir three times. Of course, the other Security Council members did not allow for any discussion. So as a result, the Chinese got exposed themselves by raising issues of Kashmir. Although India did not raise issues of Tibet, Taiwan, South China Sea, or on other areas, Xinjiang, for instance, uh, China had elevated the conflict situation by raising Kashmir issue in the Security Council. Although informally, nevertheless, they crossed the Rubicon. Uh, they also mentioned several other reasons, especially the Daulat Begoldi Darbukshiok Road that was constructed, by the way, after 20 years of construction effort. That road was constructed, is just about 200 kilometers uh, road. And this runs parallel to the far away from the line of actual control. So the DBO Darbuk Shiok Road has been mentioned as the reason for China's mobilization. Although China created 1,20,000 kilometers of roads in Tibet in the border areas, including connecting to the line of actual control areas. So China's argument is, I will construct a road up to the LAC, but you don't construct a road up to the LAC. So this has been the double standard of China in regard to. The other Chinese reasons mentioned was that the Indian side could go up to the Karakoram ranges from petrol point one to petrol point 60. These areas could be, uh, could be patrolled by the Indian side. These are close to the Chinese construction activity, the CPEC projects. And hence, China is trying to deny the Indian access to these roads by mobilizing forces in the, Gal in the Galwan Valley, as well as in the Debsan Plains. Uh, so that has been the major. Uh, there are also other reasons. The, the Quad meeting, the US-India 2 plus 2 meetings between Defense Ministry and Foreign Ministries, there is also the asymmetry in power relations that they thought is in their favor. Uh, then the teaching India a lesson, as the Global Times and others have argued. There are also individual ambitions of generals like Chao Chunchi, 
who was heading the Western Theater Command in Chengdu, opposite to the Arunachal Pradesh areas. Uh, there are also the resources that are available in Galwan Valley, water resources, and some predicted uranium as well. Uh, and then nationalism. Uh, today, nationalism is a big factor in China, uh, and many countries are concerned about it. For example, a Chinese said Vladivostok belongs to that of China, and the Russians were very unhappy with the Chinese position on that. They one scholar also mentioned Kazakhstan belongs to that of China, uh, and that created a problem. The Kazakhstan government had to uh, call the ambassador, Chinese ambassador, and give him a dressing down. For, there are also others. For instance, they said Manipur belongs to that of China. So there are all kinds of weird statements coming up from China and creating uncertainties uh, about the fallout of nationalism. So China's expansionism, assertiveness created concerns and the final clash on June 15th night, 2020. So in this, there is the, the concerns expressed, both sides mobilized. We do not know what the way out is uh, in future, but at the moment there are CBMs that are being followed there is a disengagement process that has been announced on February 10th this year. Um, Chinese have vacated the Pan Kung So Lake from finger eight to finger four area and went up to Sirija, which is where they came from. Uh, then there is also the other uh, options that India has in addition to mobilization of the forces. So put, to, put together all of these, what is the way ahead for us? In 75 years of independence, we have been able to protect our sovereignty and territorial integrity. The 1962 border clashes as an aberration, but we also began the Wuri surgical strikes, the Balakot strikes, the Doklam crisis, uh, and then recently we stood up to China in, in uh, Dalwan. So what are the way out for the future? Uh, I think in terms of the strategies that India could follow, I would enlist at least five. Uh, one is in the economic field. India needs to maintain a higher growth rate to catch up with China. And predictions are that India would become from sixth to the third largest economy in the world if we maintain the growth rates. COVID-19 has brought in some decline. This is a passing phase with vaccination for all Indians. It is quite possible this year we would regain our economic strength. We have been approaching Japan, South Korea, Singapore, European Union, and United States for free trade area agreements. We also have several initiatives like the BIMSTEC, the Bay of Bengal multimodal uh, initiative uh, that connects the Northeast with high growth areas in Southeast Asia. There is already some road construction. The railway construction projects are being um, put up uh, and other multimodal projects in the maritime domain. These are being discussed. There is also the Indian involvement in Chabahar project in Iran and Subang project, port project in Indonesia. So a number of initiatives that India had undertaken in addition to AAGC, Asia-Africa Growth Corridor, along with Indonesia and Japan, or our own Indian Ocean Initiative, both at the Navy level and the commercial level, these are being projected. 
A second initiative we could do, and we are doing part of it, is in the diplomatic strategy. We have these concentric circles across India, and the watchword in Indian foreign policy is neighborhood first. So we are trying to, despite the Chinese inroads in Nepal and Sri Lanka and Myanmar, as part of the recent military junta's rule, surpassing the parliament and other elections and so on in Myanmar, while China's role has increased substantially in Nepal, Myanmar, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and Sri Lanka, neighborhood first policies are to integrate further between India and these South Asian countries. As a result of this, we have also flexed our muscles in Uri, Doklam, Balakot, and in Galwan. We, in diplomatic parlance, we are now initiating a controlled engagement process with China. So possibly, as Dr. Jaishankar mentioned, unless until China withdraws troops and follows the CBM's approach, we will not lift the ban on the apps, the, the nearly 218 apps that we banned last year or restrictions on Chinese investments in the infrastructure projects. Of course, Chinese investments in India are very, very small. For a $14 trillion economy, China invested $8 billion in India so far in the past 20 years. While China's investment in Pakistan as part of the CPEC is $62 billion in Sri Lanka, they plan to invest $54 billion, while in India, it is $8 billion. So there is a huge disparity in terms of the investments, while we keep losing in terms of the, the trade deficits. This is where the decoupling process has begun, and that is where the diplomatic assertiveness, as Dr. Jaishankar mentioned. At political level, India is today explicitly supporting democracies abroad. You have seen that Pempa Sering has become the Sikyong. And for the past three times, the Tibetans have been electing their Sikyong, the prime minister in exile, with substantial majority. 88% of people are voting in the Tibetan elections, in the trans Himalayan belt, in Nepal, Bhutan, India. So in other words, India had indirectly encouraged democracy, not just in Nepal, Bangladesh, Afghanistan, Sri Lanka, Maldives, but also in Tibetan areas. So this is seen as a political strategy by India. India's contribution to the United Nations Fund on Democracy has also increased. In fact, it is more than the US contribution. At the strategic level, we have launched the ACTIST policy. We have launched the quadrilateral. We joined the quadrilateral in March this year with a summit level meeting between the four countries, US, Australia, Japan, India. They've identified at the moment vaccine development. That is, Americans will produce the technology with the Johnson & Johnson, the Japanese finance, the Australians distribute, while India produce in Pune and other places 1 billion vaccines this year. So that should address the vaccine deficiency we are witnessing now in the vaccination drive. So at the strategic level, joining the Quad is seen as one way of addressing the China challenge. At military level, we are also focusing on conventional and nuclear deterrence. Agni-5 has been successful. Uh, it is 
said by the DRDO, Defense Research and Development Organization, that they have already canisterized the Agni series of missiles, which means that they can be launched at any time, 24 by 7, from the Assam planes. So we also have the nuclear deterrence coming up. Then we signed several agreements with the US, the Lemova agreement, the Beka agreement, the Komkaza agreement. We also have the tri-services exercises with Russia. So in other words, with these five strategies in economy, diplomacy, politics, strategy, and military, it is suggested that we will probably overcome the China challenge and assert ourselves in the light of the situation in Galwan or in other areas of the border. At a larger level, there is the leadership in Asia that is becoming the focus of attention. So India is trying to at one level, preserving its independence and strategic autonomy, India is also trying to counter any challenge that may come up in Asia and beyond. So let me stop here. I thank you for your attention and the opportunity given for me to interact with you. I'm willing to take any questions from the audience. So, uh, thank you very much for that very uh, interesting and engaging address. Uh, while we understand that the issue that has been discussed this afternoon uh, is a very broad issue covering decades of interaction and engagement between uh, two neighbors. And we know that uh, all issues cannot be covered within uh, one single discussion. But we are very thankful to you, sir, for the uh, interesting presentation that you have put before us, uh, especially for the students who also have probably a paper on foreign policy. And the points that you have uh, mentioned will be very useful for them in their course of study. And as I has suggested, if there is anyone from our audience who would like to share their thoughts or also inquire from sir as to any of the issues to discuss, uh, you are most welcome to do so at this time. Um, good afternoon, sir. I would just like to pose one question. I was just wondering how the India-China relation or lack thereof, uh, how does it impact the security dynamics in Northeast India? A good question. Thank you very much. Uh, two, three things here. Uh, one is India joined the BCIM, Bangladesh China India Myanmar Initiative. It is now rechristened as BCIM EC. Uh, Bangladesh, China, India, Myanmar economic corridor. Uh, and uh, so India joined, but not very actively because India has security concerns. Uh, for instance, the, the Chinese have, according to various reports, Chinese have been supplying small arms and involved in smuggling uh, in the Northeast with drugs small arms and others. Uh, there is the case of uh, um, uh, Mr. Shimre uh, involved in this smuggling aspect of the small arms. So at one level, we have concerns on the uh, insurgency support by the Chinese. Uh, on the other hand, we joined the BCIMAC for economic reasons, for integration, transportation, and infrastructure development. Nevertheless, BCIM EC has taken a backseat, generally, not much development, because India's, India took a position that it is better to invite the Japanese or other countries uh, who are not supporting the insurgency or other aspects. 
So we see a lot of Japanese enthusiasm uh, in the projects in the Northeast. For example, in Arunachal Pradesh, uh, China had blocked the ADB loans, Asian Development Bank loans for infrastructure projects in Arunachal Pradesh by saying that this is a disputed territory. On the other hand, when Manmohan Singh went to China, went to Japan, uh, he signed an agreement for hydroelectricity projects in lower Subansari district, Lohit district, or in other areas of Arunachal Pradesh, uh, but also extensively in Mizoram, in Assam, in Nagaland, or other areas. So there is now the, the South Asia, Southeast Asia projects, uh, which were initiated by the United Nations in the 50s, but because of Cold War, that has not been pursued. So there is now the infrastructure connectivity with Myanmar and in the maritime domain with the rest of the Southeast Asians. So this is broadly the security concern that India had expressed. Uh, and so India diversified uh, towards the other countries like Japan or Singapore or even Malaysia, uh, which is showing interest in developing the infrastructure projects in these areas. So we do have security concerns, number one, in terms of small arms, number two, in terms of drugs, number three, in terms of smuggling of uh, the uh, goods uh, in areas here. Uh, there is a lot of informal smuggling that happens. 12,000 crore rupees of cattle um, smuggling takes place uh, between the two sides. So this is a humongous uh, proportion which they want to formalize by having cross-border trade. But since Arunachal Pradesh has a territorial dispute with China, that is not possible for us right now in terms of uh, having a cross-border trade or investment or infrastructure because of the territorial dispute problem. So we did approach in several ways, but these are the security concerns we have. Uh, share that thoughts. Yes, yes. Uh, yeah, sir, so if you could kindly look at the chat box, there is yes. a question. Yes, yes. Uh, Alan has asked, with the continuous confrontation, is it safe to say that the passive approach of India to military action has undermined the country's ability to stand against Chinese infiltration? Uh, I think India's approach has not been passive. After the all-party meeting last year in April, Prime Minister Modi made an announcement which includes a free hand to the military. Prime Minister Modi said, we are giving a free hand to the military, that is Indian Army and Indian Air Force, to take any action which they deem fit. So as a result, today we have 90,000 troops on the border, in addition to all the tanks and armored personnel carriers, missiles and Air Force assets, and so on and so forth. Now, I want to say this, that in mountain warfare, the warfare actually is very difficult. Uh, for any country which wants to wage a war in mountain warfare, it requires 80 to 1 ratio. That is, if China wants to win, China has to mobilize eight soldiers for every one Indian soldier. Today, Chinese have 60,000 troops, while India has 90,000 troops. So it is actually not eight is to one. It is probably um, uh, 0 0.5 is to one or some such 
configuration. So as a result, what we have is an armed stalemate between China and India. There is no gainer here. That situation looks very passive, but actually we mobilize so much that China cannot have an offensive victory, neither defensive, because as part of the February 10 disengagement process, China had demolished what they constructed between finger eight to finger four in Pankungso Lake. Now imagine China demolishing its reefs in South China Sea based on Vietnamese demand. China constructed several reefs in South China Sea, militarized, like they militarized in Pankungso Lake. But with the Indian insistence, they have destroyed their own built up area in Pankungso. So that is not passive position of India, but it is an active position. And India has something to show in terms of rolling back the Chinese troops. Of course, it is true that we have not completely resolved the problem. There is also a rumor that China is occupying something like 300 to 1,000 square kilometers territory in Ladakh in Debsan Plains, in other regions. Some they withdrew in Pankungso now, but others they are still controlling. But what happens is that this is actually a disputed territory. And so China is saying, this is my land. But geographical specificity of this region is such, you cannot stay there because it is minus 35 to minus 45 degrees centigrade. Secondly, the wind will be blowing in such a way that there is no way any human habitation is possible. So one day you have to withdraw, which, way, which day we do not know, because both sides have mobilized extensively. So I think India's position is not passive. India has been active. And you may have seen the army chief, General Narawane, has been going to several countries, which means he is very sure of defending the borders. The Indian Air Force chief mentioned that if India, if China is aggressive, India can also be aggressive. So Indian Air Force chief sent a message that the cost for China will be high if they move forward. So I think this is not passive. I think this is a very active way of engaging China at the military level. China knows that the cost will be high. In 1987, General Sundarji conducted the Operation Chakabor in Arunachal Pradesh. The kill ratio was 1 is to 10. That is, for every one Indian soldier, there are 10 Chinese soldiers killed. So Indian capability is not a wishwash. Indian capability today, China will have a big problem if they go ahead with the situation in Western sector or across the line of actual control. So it's not passive. I would say that it is a very active. Uh, and the cost for China will increase if they move forward. Oh, OK, sir. Thank you uh, for that, sir. And uh, actually, we have also exceeded the time that has been allotted for this uh, uh, address, but because the issues at hand are very interesting. So, sir, if you do not mind, if you could kindly take just one more question and then we will conclude. There is another question in the chat box. We'll take this as the last question. Yeah, this is uh, asked by Ferdi Lindo. Uh, Ferdi asked, considering that the Indian government is emphasizing on Atman Nirbharata, 
particularly after recent conflicts at the borders. How will this impact India-China trade? And a complete boycott of Chinese goods is really feasible. Uh, good question. Thank you, Buddy, uh, for asking that. Um, as I mentioned before, the India-China trade is in favor of China. And in the past decade, China had over $950 billion of surplus trade with China, India, uh, number one. Number two, there are 1,400 items that we import from China. Out of this, 366 items are high-value items. These 366 items cost you about 50 to $60 billion, while the rest of 1,100 items, nearly 1,000 items, cost you $20 billion. So what Indian government had done in the last one year is reducing the 1,000 items every year, step by step, and keep importing what we require. What we require is the essential products in the pharmaceuticals. While India is the pharmacy of the world, it, Im it imports ingredients from China. Because these are cheaper, India stopped production before it is importing. So these are basically yeast cells or others where in huge quantity we import from China. So while decoupling process has begun, we also import some of these. And alternatively, India is now producing those essential products, but it takes time, one to two years time. So as a result of this, the, the uh, we have a cascading way of um, uh, blocking the Chinese products. Uh, secondly, India is not banning all Chinese products at the moment because some of these are useful for us. These are cheaper, and so Indian consumer is importing them. Um, uh, for instance, the fan that you have uh, or an AC that you have is cheaper in China because they control the labor uh, and reduce the prices. So they produce in large quantities and sell it to you. So it is the price factor. Uh, if we have to produce in, China, in India, these are costly. And so we are importing from China. But with the Galwan incident, we are gradually reducing the products from China. So we are not actually banning the products, the, the call given by a RSS affiliate on the banning of Chinese goods is only affecting two to 3% of the products. Uh, these are including basically the statues that China manufactures like Ganesha or others, which are used in festivals in Mumbai. Uh, so these products does not really constitute a majority of the trade basket. So, so it is not true that we are banning all products. Uh, of course, we are decoupling, reducing the impact because China is weaponizing trade. China weaponized trade with Japan by banning rare earth metals. China is weaponizing trade with India by telling that, forget about Galwan, let us do business. So we are saying, let us first resolve Galwan or territorial dispute and then do business. So this is where we got stuck. And trade is one issue here. And I think this would be sorted out in two to three years time. Gradual reduction of dependence on China. Not banning, but reduction. OK, sir. Uh, thank you so much for your responses, sir. They have been very interesting. I wish we could continue, but uh, because of uh, time, it does not permit us. But that will not be my conclusion. Uh, first of all, I would like to say thank you to you, sir, once again, for having kindly accepted our invitation on behalf of the organizing committee and the college itself, you know, college. And
and for having agreed to deliver this special job. But you have taken it to such a level that we did not want this discussion to conclude. So probably I would request Ms. Emdor, with your permission, at another point of time, to have a discussion, especially for our master students. They are the ones who have been posting quite a few of the questions. So I think we should take it for them at maybe another discussion, subject to your convenience, sir. Thank you. So with these few words, uh, once again, I thank you, sir. I thank everyone in this particular, who, has, who have joined this particular talk, especially our faculty and our students. And at this time, I hand over the time to our joint convener, Mr. Kerry Buam. Uh, he will deliver the vote of thanks for the entire two-day webinar. Sir, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, Lindo. Uh, we have come to the end of the two-day webinar on Celebrating India Action 5, organized by Sina College in collaboration with the uh, Department of Arts and Culture, Government of Mechanica, held on the 27 and 28th of May 2021. It's my privilege to propose the Board of Time speech on behalf of the organizing committee of the you know, webinar and also on behalf of the Chinodian family. Uh, to start with, uh, I would like to thank Professor uh, Shrikan Kandapali, the professor, of, the professor in Chinese Studies at School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU, Italy. And the guest speaker to join us today, China, through a special talk on uh, India's relation, India China's relationship dependence, which will focus on. Indian foreign policy in the last 30 years. And, uh, thank you, sir, for enlightening us with a new insight on the developments made by India in foreign relations and as well as the strategies adopted by our country in foreign relations. Uh, I'm very uh, pretty sure, sir, as I shared said earlier, the previous knowledge that sir shared with us today definitely is beneficial. It will enrich us, it will help us as we, along with the country, prepare the celebration of 25 years of independence. Uh, once again, thank you so much, sir, and uh, thank you so much for delivering that special talk uh, this evening. Uh, a word of thanks also to Sir uh, uh, Dr. Charles Ruben McDock, Head Department of Political Science, PG Section of Krishna College. Thank you so much, sir, for presenting and introducing the speaker in today's lecture. Uh, going ahead, not to forget our keynote speaker, Professor David Ash Inde, former Shaman Union Public Service Commission, New Delhi, former Vice Chancellor Rajiv Gandhi University, Arashal Pradesh, for his uh, revitalizing speech, I would say, on the theme Living India as a five. Thank you, Sir David, for taking us back to the history of India's struggle for freedom, opening with the beginning of the struggle for freedom in the 19th century and the political development that takes place in any part of the 20th century to independence. Uh, the influence of personality like Raja Mishra is exciting. Yes, coming to the Nazis on the role and participation of different associations and individuals, especially in Islam and the history of participation. Once again, sir, thank you very much for the keynote address. Uh, we are very thankful to, sir, to Dr. Ponway Roy Arbuki, Member of Parliament Rajasthan, who is also the former head of the Department of History of College of Law. A colleague, a mentor, yes, a friend. Thank you, sir, for delivering a special talk on freedom struggle in China, reminding us that oh, that understanding the involvement of common people is very important in the study of freedom struggle in the context of Thank you, sir, for taking out time from the music channel and I'd like to ask you to record for the thing. Uh, we would like to thank the chairperson presiding in different uh, session in today's webinar, ensuring the first day the first time to stick to time. Uh, to all the chairperson, thank you for your available suggestions and concluding remarks at the close of every session. Once again, thank you for all of you for your time and response and content to share the session. We are very thankful to, for you all. 
Yes, we express our gratitude also to the Pepper Centers for your contribution to your presentation and your research. Pepper, which covers various aspects of the progress we find and development of those fields of our country in general and the state of the world. Thank you, you all, for your patience. Adhering to the instruction given by the chair for the presentations, once again, thank you to all the Pepper Center. Uh, we would like to express our gratitude also to all the invitees for being part of the webinar for the past patient. We are very thankful to our principal, Dr. R.M. Lindor. Thank you, sir, for your encouragement and support. To Dr. G. Lindor, Governor of Internal Quality Assurance Cell, IQ Assurance Cell. Dr. M. Rani and Sir S. Jeruma, Vice Principal of the College for the Guidance and Constant Health. A big thank you to all the members of the working committee of webinar and the faculty of the different departments of the college for their valuable inputs and contribution in the preparation of this program. Yes, a big thank you also to the technical team of the college under the leadership of uh, Sir Pankaj Doshi, head of BCA department, Sir College, for all the technical arrangements, making sure that make sure that everything is in place. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, and the team. Uh, a lot of thanks also goes to the students of the honor students of Sunak College Department of History, uh, and also the students from uh, the political science PG section of uh, the, the, the college for your presence and participation in this two-day seminar. Students, thank you all. Uh, in case I miss out anyone, I do apologize, but uh, I once again extend the happiest big thank you to all for being with us in this two-day webinar. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Yes. So, David, you still here? Yes, sir. <laughs> yeah, maybe a yeah. last uh, yeah, parting words from you for everyone. Okay, thank you so much, everyone, for, you know, participating in these uh, two days. It was overwhelming, and, uh, you know, the experience that we had, I've got so much of messages from the different uh, chairpersons, from the resource person, from paper presenters, that they have tremendously benefited from these two days. And thank you, Professor Shrikan, for sharing such a, you know, insightful, uh, you know, talk just now. We have learned so much from you, sir. And we will try to keep in contact so that in the near future also we can have more associations with you. Thank you, Sir Rubin, for sharing. And thank you, everyone. Thank you, Sir. Uh, bye, everyone. Take care. Yes. Yeah, bye. Bye. Bye, Sir. Thank you, Sir. Yeah. Bye, Dr. Chow.